and then he had to spend the entire day with me, so So he'll be back, I'm sure. And so we'll move on to uh, Dr. Richard James, and he's uh, at Loughborough University. He's going to talk to us about vibration, export performance, and what we what we really know. I think that's a really good title for this particular conversation because uh, or talk. A lot of us believe we know a lot about nutrition, and actually. Thanks Richard and thanks Hannah for the invite as well. Um, I'm going to stand here so I can see the screen. Um, so yeah, I was, I was asked to come and talk about hydration but given the, the kind of title of the conference I thought it was pertinent to perhaps discuss what we, what we actually know. Um, and I, I have to say at this point I'm, I'm really only going to talk about what we know about dehydration. Um, the, the length of the talk was cut down a little bit and um, so therefore maybe, maybe if Nick doesn't come back I might be able to you know, finish everything, um, but I'll try, I'll try my best. Okay, so to start off, for me, I, I consider water almost the, the, the forgotten nutrient, so it's the, it's the nutrient on our kind of table or plate, as it were, that we don't really think about. Um, I find that intriguing, given that it's a nutrient that we consume in the largest amount every day, so intakes of two to three liters or kilograms per day versus carbohydrate of perhaps a few hundred grams. Um, it's also the, the, the nutrient and the store that we lose on the largest amount every day, hence the essential requirement. Um, but it's also probably the only nutrient that a severe under or over intake of that nutrient can result in death within hours to days. That doesn't happen really for many other dietary nutrients. But it's not really thought of. If I were to ask you guys recommendations for nutritional intake, You'd probably be able to tell me what percentage of the diet should be carbohydrate or protein or fat, how many grams per kilo an, an athlete needs for protein or carbohydrate. Probably nobody could tell me how much somebody needs for water. I'll be honest, I've been researching water for probably 10, 15 years now. I couldn't tell you. Okay, so I think there's a real kind of you know, gap in our knowledge in this, in this area. But it's relevant for athletes, mainly because athletes sweat. Increased heat production through metabolic heat, Juiced with exercise produces pretty high sweat rates. Average individual probably needs somewhere around two liters a day. So three to four liters in a single hour when athletes train hours and hours a day is a significant challenge to our body water stores. However, we probably consider this, uh, this topic relatively benign. I think a lot of people think that we know everything about water. My, my view is that we don't. Um, so today I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of give you a bit of an introduction about water. I'm going to tell you what we think we know, i.e. what the current consensus is. I'll give you some of the controversy in, in that area, and I'll also overview the kind of recent literature that I believe has started to try and unpick some of the, the true effects of, of hydration. Okay, so athletes first of all, they dehydrate during exercise. And this is data from 20 separate foot races of at least 30 kilometers. The blue bar represents fluid intake, the red bar represents fluid loss. So the take home from this is, athletes that are running with access to fluid do not consume enough fluid to replace their sweat loss. That results in dehydration over the course of that exercise bout. If they start exercise hydrated, they end exercise dehydrated. And that happens in the vast majority of cases. This is running where you would perhaps say that you know, it's, it's not that comfortable to drink. Um, so this is some data that we collected quite a while ago now, actually, in 24-hour um, racing drivers. So they sit in a car for two hours and drive. There's no, well, very little GI motility, etc., etc. <coughs> However, what you can see is the same response. These are 10 individuals. Fluid loss, fluid intake. So fluid intake is well below the fluid loss. Now, actually, in a car, when you're racing, this is, um, you know, perhaps doesn't tell the whole story. So in a car, there's only limited water that can be stored. So these guys were allowed one litre. But of those 10 racing car drivers, none of them drank the entire litre. So this is something that we term voluntary dehydration, or involuntary dehydration. My belief is that the correct terminology is involuntary, because I don't think people are doing it on purpose. It just happens as a byproduct of, of exercise. So it's much like you know, the analogy of leading a horse to water. You can lead an athlete to water, in my opinion, you can't make them drink enough. 
to replace their sweat glands. Um, and that has a knock-on effect. So this is data from the start of an exercise session. These are university athletes, so they were an all right standard. It was when I was at Nottingham Trent, so you know you can argue about the quality of the athletes, but they were all athletes. They were starting a competitive fixture, and these are their urine osmolality data. High urine osmolality suggests that the kidney is trying to retain water. That doesn't mean someone's dehydrated, but it does mean that the kidney is doing pretty much everything it can to retain water and prevent any loss of water. About a third of the athletes were what we would say would be dehydrated. So everyone always says to me, well, that's university athletes, they're not even Trent University athletes, they're not even good ones. Um, so I always show people that data, which is the uh, England football first team before a training session. I can't really tell the difference between those two data sets. So irrespective of the level of athlete, they've seen raised urine osmolality before training sessions. That's indicative of dehydration. So, that's my introduction. What do we think we know? So I'll start with this, the ACS Air Position Stand um, on fluid and exercise and fluid replacement. This is the most recent one, 2007. And this is what they say. Dehydration of greater than 2% body mass degrades aerobic exercise and cognitive mental performance in temperate, warm, and hot environments. Okay? And that's a finding that has been seen in tens of studies. However, I'm going to say a relatively controversial statement at this point, and that is I don't think there is adequate data to support that statement. This represents probably 60 years worth of research to make that statement. I'm saying that I don't think that research is valid. Okay? Um, so I don't think at this time we knew enough scientifically to be able to make that statement. And I'll try and convince you guys of why. Um, I guess a shameless plug. Um, if you're interested in any of the stuff I say, we've recently published this review article that kind of covers all of the concepts and thoughts that I'm going to take you through today. Um, so what happens when you get dehydrated? So if you dehydrate through exercise, there's a well-defined and um, you know, described uh, physiological um, phenomenon that happens. That you decrease your plasma volume. That, as a proxy, results in an increase in plasma osmolality. That's because sweat is hypotonic, so you lose relatively more water than you do electrolytes. And the concentration of the body fluid and the, uh, the plasma increases. You also see um, increases in thirst that are probably related to the reduction in fluid intake and also, interestingly, reductions in mood. So there's a physiological and a psychological component to dehydration. Those two things are linked, so increasing plasma osmolality will increase thirst sensation, and then that results in a whole series of, of responses. So there's these physiological responses, so decreases in cardiovascular function, increases in body temperature, and also increases in muscle glycogen use. You also see changes in the perception of effort at any given workload. And this is probably the key driver for changes in performance in my mind. And that can come through either you know, psychological or perhaps perceptual effects, but also through physiology. And ultimately, all those things manifest in a potential reduction in performance. And that probably summarizes the, the main mechanistic routes by which dehydration might affect performance. However, there are contrasting views in the literature. Okay? And this is a really, really emotional research topic. There are different research groups that almost have shouting matches about this. You can see it at conferences, you can see it on Twitter, anywhere you go. One side almost won't listen to the other side. In my view, the answer, as always, probably lies somewhere in the middle. Okay? And I'll show you the, the data that I, I believe supports that. Where have these contrasting views come from? So they come from studies really like these. And this is uh, data on body weight change over the course of, course of a marathon. And what you see is a, granted a very weak, but still a significant correlation between the amount of weight loss and how quickly people actually finish the marathon. That's been interpreted by some as dehydration, i.e. weight loss during the marathon, increases performance. That's not a correct interpretation in my view. Causation and correlation are two very different things. And it, in my opinion, if you were to speculate on the direction of the relationship, it would be the other way around. Increased running speed leads to increased sweating. 
is to decrease fluid intake because it's less comfortable to drink. You've got less time available to drink, so it's almost inevitable that by the end of a marathon you become dehydrated. And you can see that the vast majority of individuals are dehydrated in some way. I'm not going to talk about these individuals over here, but there is an important consideration here. What is informative, I believe, is to look at the people that win these races or that are running fastest. So the, the winner out of this group lost about 6% of body weight. The second place, 4%. Third place, about 2.5%, 3%. So if the data from the lab and the consensus statement of 2% <coughs> dehydration in pairing performance <coughs> is accurate, how can these guys be performing best? What's even more informative is to look at people like Heidi Gabri Selassie, world record holder at the time. 2009 uh, Dubai Marathon. He's going for a world record in this one, but as you can see, absolutely hammered it down, which meant that his uh, world record was scuppered. But when we put him on this relationship, almost 10% of his body weight lost. That's a huge weight loss. So people say, well, why did he lose 10%? Did he not drink? No, he drank like one and a half litres an hour. Anyone drunk one and a half litres an hour for two hours? Go to the pub, drink six pints in two hours, and see how you feel. <laughs> okay, there's some effects of alcohol as well, but you know, the volume on its own is a, it's a big volume. Now do that while you're running 21 and a half K an hour. Okay, his sweat rate was something like 3.7 litres per hour. You cannot replace 3.7 litres per hour. Decent athletes will become dehydrated. The question is, what can we do about it? But this doesn't mean that dehydration doesn't affect performance, or does it? Okay, and that's really the question that springs from this. Does dehydration really have an effect on, on human performance? And, and today I'm going to talk about endurance performance. So for me, it's a definite yes. You only have to look in a textbook to see this type of figure. You lose 5% of your body weight, Difficulty concentrating, 10% muscle spasms and delirium, 15% circulatory failure, failure and death. So I'm not aware of any situations where these things would be positive effects for performance. Okay? So the question isn't whether dehydration affects performance. The question is when does dehydration affect performance? In what situation? At what level of, of weight loss? These are the questions that we should be asking. Are the sort of dehydration levels that we see with athletes, are they influencing performance? So I'm now going to kind of take you through why I think we perhaps don't know what we think we know, and, uh, and then give you some of the data that I think starts to answer this. So there are huge limitations with this body of literature. Like I said, 70 years worth of research. It's one of the most researched topics in sports nutrition. But fundamentally, if it works. Magic. Um, fundamentally, people doing these experiments aren't blinded from the intervention that's taking place. This would not be allowed in any other area of sports nutrition research. You know? If Steve Bailey tried to do a study looking at beetroot juice supplementation and didn't use a blinded, you know, nitrate depleted beetroot for a placebo, he probably wouldn't get it published. We tried to look at carbohydrate and performance, you know. Have you study that was done recently looking at, um, you know, breakfast or carbohydrate intake before or after endurance training. If that hadn't been a blinded intervention, it probably wouldn't have got published. But in water balance and hydration research, that's exactly what we do. We put someone on a bike, we give them water, they know they've had water. Me as the experimenter, I know they've had water. And then they perform better. They perform better because they know they have water or because they're hydrated. We can't separate those things out. Secondly, the methods that we use to induce dehydration are A, unfamiliar to subjects. Anyone ever taken a diuretic? Really strong loop diuretic? No? Anyone habitually not drink for 24 to 48 hours? As in nothing? Anyone do water uh, exercise in a really hot environment without drinking anything for two, three hours? You don't do it. So again, we're, we're producing situations where somebody is not comfortable with the method used to induce dehydration. So again, could that method on its own influence their performance? Quite possibly. And these two things, for me, mean that at least the performance literature that's out there, the physiology, the understanding of what dehydration does to the body, 
That literature is fine. But performance is not necessarily a physiological variable. I can choose to put extra effort in. I can override physiological stimuli. So it's not purely physiology, it's behaviour. And therefore these two things might mean that that literature is critically confounded. You can induce placebo and nocebo effects related to this, and that's what I'll cover now. Um, so we, uh, we actually started to do a few studies where we were trying to unpick some of the mechanisms. And then I realised this, and I thought, actually, this is bigger than trying to understand the mechanisms. What's the point of looking at a mechanism for something if we don't really know whether it affects performance? So we went back a couple of steps and started to do that. Um, the first one is to study blinding. Okay, so I, um, I looked at doing a, a blinded dehydration study, and on the day that I got ethical approval for that study, uh, this study was published, um, which was you know, a bit shocking at first and a bit disappointing. Um, then when I read the study and I looked at the methods they used, I, I had a few kind of questions about some of those. The second study, another nice, and they're both really nice studies. I 100% recommend you go and read these uh, uh, from Stephen Chung's lab. Um, have started to try and look at this. In the background, we were going on with our study. So, so what, what did this study from, um, from Paul Larson's group actually show? So what they did dehydration through 30 minutes exercise. They then had a rehydration phase where they introduced fluid into the peripheral circulation with IV fluids. Okay? Isotonic IV fluids, and that's an important consideration. They then, two hours later, had them do a 25 kilometer cycling time trial in a hot environment. They showed, which was actually my hypothesis as well, I thought that if we removed people's expectations around dehydration, we wouldn't see a negative performance effect. And they showed this. They showed that up to 3% dehydration didn't exert any effect on performance. The opposite from what the consensus is. Um, but when you start looking at the data in a little bit more detail, and if you understand fluid balance, and the regulation of fluid, fluid balance intricately, you can see that there are some perhaps anomalies with the data. So this is serum osmolality, the main regulated physiological variable for hydration, and perceived thirst, probably the main behavioral variable. And what I want you to look at is we've got new hydration and two to three percent dehydration. If we look at serum osmolality throughout this period, it is not different between the trials at any time point. Now that is because they produce dehydration in all the conditions, and then they rehydrate with isotonic fluids. So fluid that is around 150 millimoles per litre sodium. That never happens in, in, in physiology, sorry, in, 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 in practice. To drink something like that would be like drinking seawater. But what it does is it maintains this physiological stimulus of dehydration. It changes the distribution of water between the intra and extracellular fluid. So essentially, what the brain sees is dehydration in all conditions. Same with thirst. Because they didn't allow any drinking, thirst is identical between the, two condition, the three conditions. So we've got a situation where, whilst fluid balance is different, the regulation and the signals for fluid balance are identical between the trials. So I thought, great. We've learned something, perhaps, but, but this makes our, our study still justified. And so this is the study that we, we published a few years ago now. Um, what we did is we, we had a similar kind of protocol, but we manipulated fluid during the preload and then looked at performance in a 15-minute performance test. We had two trials, dehydrated and dehydrated. So how did we blind people to the intervention? We used a slightly different technique. So this is one of our subjects. Um, you can just about see Jody Moss's sh shoulder there in the back of the, uh, the audience. Um, and you can see this guy here exercising in the chamber. You can just about see this gastric feeding tube going down into his mouth. What we use is this type of technique. So again, nasally inserted here, tubes taped here. We can infuse fluids from behind the individual so they can't see it. And that allows us to blind them to their hydration. Importantly, we also add in a cover story. So they don't even know they're doing a hydration study. They think they're looking at differences in drink composition. And the drinks are so different that they would know what they were if they drank them. And that's our second thing, that layer, that's quite important. I actually thought about this when I saw Luke present his uh, overnight casein stuff. It was like he sneaks in and feeds people casein protein overnight while they're sleeping in a bed and wakes them up with a biopsy. I thought, 
We can do that. We can do that with hydration. We can do that with hydration. And he's not saying, look at my right arm. So what did we see? First of all, the physiology. So remember I said the IV infusion didn't replicate physiology or perception changes with hydration. So plasma volume reduced with dehydration. Serum osmolality increased with dehydration. So the physiological responses are replicated. What about perception? So thirst, and this is why it was really important to have that cover story. We did an exit interview, no one guessed it was a hydration experiment. If we'd have told them it was a hydration experiment, this stimulus would have led them to believe that. Increased thirst and increased half the year. <coughs> but what did we see for performance? Okay? And remember, I said earlier, we hypothesized that there wouldn't be a difference in performance between these two conditions. But there actually was. Okay? So they, they performed about 8% better when they were new hydrated. And that's 8% better without knowing that they were euhydrated and without knowing they were dehydrated. When we published this, we had a little bit of criticism because of the quality of the, the, the individuals in that study. They were BO2 max about 50. They were average kind of recreationally active individuals, so that the, um, the criticism was, was probably accurate. Um, but the idea of the study was to try and um, see whether we could actually blind people to hydration. So we followed up with this study, uh, one of our PhD students, uh, Mark Pennell, did. Um, I'm told this photo was taken because apparently his haircut looks the same as this dog that they found whilst at a bar once. Um, so I gave him the choice of two photos and that was the one he chose. Um, and he did a very similar thing. So we had, again, steady state exercise for two hours. We infused fluid or we didn't infuse fluid and then we took a load of other measurements as well. We then had a uh, approximately 20 minute time trial, so a workload based time trial, complete as much, complete the work as quickly as possible. Um, and in this study, instead of just one group, we recruited two. So we had a group that was blind, they had the tube in, everything went in through the tube, same cover story, they didn't know what was going on. We had a second group that was unblind. They either drank the drink or they didn't drink the drink. So we hoped that this would allow us to tease out any nocebo effects or any knowledge of what's going on um, in, that, in that intervention. We had two pretty well-trained, well-matched groups of cyclists. Um, and the physiology, I'm not going to go into detail here, the physiology responded in the way it should do, and it was not different <coughs> between the two trials, same as the perceptual responses. So at the time of the time trial, there was no difference between the trials. But what did we see from performance point of view? So we hypothesized that the blind group would impair their performance with dehydration, but that impairment would be less than the unblind group. The unblind group, group, we showed a decrease of about 10% performance. The blind group was exactly the same. We could throw a hat over them. So this is actually quite an important finding if you place it in the context of all the unblind studies that have been done before. This helps to validate some of those findings. So when I said that I, at the time of the ACSM position stand, I didn't think there was enough evidence to support the conclusion. I think now there probably is, and that means we can probably use that data. Um, all of this is what I showed you earlier. There are some people that believe that thirst is the main driver of performance. My view is that thirst is a really important, integral part of the performance response with dehydration. I think thirst is important, but I don't think it drives everything. And this study nicely shows that. So when I presented the, the first grinded study at ACSM, um, Stavros Gavoris saw my poster and said, that's brilliant, that's great. It's a real shame that thirst was, was different between the conditions. I said, why? He said, well, you know, it would have been really nice to say that dehydration impairs performance without thirst. I said, well, no, I disagree. I think that actually, the first blinded study, we need to replicate the entire situation for dehydration and see whether that influences performance. But I sent him our paper before we published it, and uh, J.D. Adams used the, the methods from our paper to then do this study, which makes a really nice contribution to the literature. So what they did is they had dehydrated or euhydrated conditions, but they gave them fluid every five minutes so that they weren't thirsty in either condition. So no thirst differences between conditions. And what they saw was that dehydration still impaired performance. So the take home from this isn't that thirst isn't important. The take home is that dehydration impairs performance in the absence of thirst. So thirst doesn't explain everything. 
I think it's part of the equation, but it's not. <coughs> Okay, um, the next four or five slides I just ask, please don't take photos and don't put them on, on, on social media. Reason being that we've still got people running through this study and there is a cover story and if you put it on social media and someone sees it, that will mess the whole thing up. So please don't, please don't do that. Um, so this was the, the first study of Jodie's um, PhD, which I believe she submitted yesterday. She put this on Twitter, I said, wow, you've you shrunk to your thesis is massive. <laughs> it looks like... I don't know, is that, is that A3? <laughs> so what we wanted to look at was um, perceived hydration. So what if, you know, the reverse. So we looked at whether dehydration has a true effect. What about if somebody thinking they're dehydrated influences that response? So we did basically the same. We, we manipulated fluid intake during this period. We used nasal gastric infusion. And we had three trials. The first one was really a familiarization, but it was a dummy hydrated trial. We told them that we had to tell them what the trials were, but we were testing differences between two rehydration drinks and comparing them to a controlled dehydrated condition. Um, and therefore, you know, we, we've been told we've got to tell them, uh, but we can't tell them which drink they're on. So they thought there were three trials. This one was a familiarization. We gauged, gauged their sweat rate, and then we either gave them fluid to, well, we, we gave them the same fluid in both of these conditions to produce dehydration of around one and a half percent. But we told them in one of them it was a hydrated trial, so they're receiving a rehydration drink, and we told them in the other one that they were dehydrated. The only difference was what we told them. We told them that at the beginning of the preload and at the beginning of the time chart. And what we've got so far, so eight people gone through, and I don't really like interpreting partial data, but I think it's informative in its own, in its own right, actually. So we've got eight people that have gone through. Five of those show a decrement in performance when they perceive dehydration was well outside the day-to-day -day variability of our test. This test has a day-to-day -day variability of less than 2%. These were all of a scale 7 to 17% reductions in performance. P-value is very close, but we can't really interpret it yet, yet until we've got the, the next few people through the study, and then when we've got that number, we'll interpret it. But I can tell you from this data, I think it's, it's quite convincing that some people, when they think they are dehydrated, their performance may be impaired. Okay, so that covers most of this, and that's some, some recent data that tries to unpick some of these effects. But what about this? There's a lot less data here, so it'll take me a lot less time. In fact, there's only one study uh, that's done this, um, and we published this a few years back. And to be honest, this study was the reason why I didn't think we'd see an effect once we blinded people to dehydration. Um, what we did is we did a standard hydration experiment, two conditions, fluid restriction for 24 hours plus a little bit of exercise with fluid restriction, or no fluid restriction for 24 hours and fluid consumed during exercise. We then did a 5K performance test on a treadmill, and we showed that when they were dehydrated, it took them 6% longer to complete that 5K. So this is nothing you know, outstanding. This is what all the literature has shown. However, the method that we used to induce dehydration was something that wasn't familiar to the subject. So we extended this. These were actually three trials. We then did four sessions where we familiarized them to that fluid restriction protocol and then put them back through this crossover experiment. And interestingly, what we saw was that this difference that we saw at baseline was almost entirely abolished after four familiarizations. There was still a trend for a difference. 0.064, I think, was the p-value. So it's still pretty close. So I always say attenuate, not abolish. But either way, their performance was much better when they were dehydrated. No difference between these two dehydrated conditions, but a 5% improvement in their dehydrated performance. And the quite nice thing from this experiment, and I really like individual data, it's why I always put it on slides for my, or figures for my main data, at least in the study. This, this tells a really strong story. Above this line, impairment with dehydration. You can see that the distance of the impairment for every single person got closer to new hydrated performance after those four familiarizations. So I think that this sheds a little bit of light on why endurance runners can finish a marathon 10% dehydrated and nearly break the world record. They've had a lifetime of running whilst dehydrated. I don't know whether that exerts a physiological adaptation, but certainly I think a psychological adaptation. And that's the thing we saw. 
So RPE mirrored the performance response. RPE always pretty much mirrors the performance response. It got significantly easier to run dehydrated after being familiarized with that process. Okay, so hopefully that's me about on time. Um, I've got two conclusions slide. First one is what we know. And if you read our review paper, you'll see that in there actually the conclusions match this. So I don't, I don't know if that was intended, but you know, in the review we've got conclusions, what we know, and, and conclusions, what we don't know. So it actually matched quite nicely to the conference. So the first thing I'll say is I think that dehydration of greater than 2% body mass definitely impairs endurance performance. But specifically, endurance cycling performance. It's the only type of performance we've looked at, and specifically in the heat. I will also say at 3% dehydration, there is no effect of an individual knowing whether they are dehydrated or not. This is important if you're interested in doing hydration experiments. If you want to look at performance and dehydration, induce 3% dehydration, and use this study to justify the fact that you didn't stick a nasogastric tube in somebody and infuse fluid from behind their back, it's not a comfortable procedure. Okay? I don't advise you to you know, necessarily go and start loads of research doing this because you, you won't make your subjects very happy and you'll struggle to find them. Okay? But you can use this study to justify not blinding people if you're using 3%. That's important to me. It's also important when interpreting all the literature that's gone before us. Second of all, um, repeatedly familiarizing someone with the type of dehydration and the root of dehydration that they might experience seems to, you know, seems to attenuate that performance detriment. Um, in with this as well, and I haven't really put it as a, a conclusion because I don't think we have got the strong enough data for it yet, but considering people's awareness of their hydration status and the influence on performance, one of the things, if any of you are practitioners working with athletes, really question how often and how you assess people's hydration status. Genuinely, I've seen football teams assess people's hydration status before they go onto the football pitch. There's no positive to that. That person produces a concentrated urine sample that over years you've drummed in means that they're dehydrated. You potentially negatively impact their performance. My opinion is I would only, I would only monitor hydration in the lead up, you know, so the days prior to, to any sort of match. Whenever I um, say that to a practitioner, they always say, well, you've got to measure. You've got to measure somebody's hydration status. You've got to. I say, why do you? They say, well, you know, we need to know that they're hydrated. I say, well, actually, for, let's take you know, football performance. You know, hydration probably isn't the most important nutritional consideration. Carbohydrate is probably far more important. Or if they have their caffeine at the right time. Those are more important considerations. How do you make sure that their glycogen stores are optimal before a football match? I say, do you biopsy them before they go onto the pitch? Quickly measure the muscle glycogen content? Of course you don't. What you do is you do your due diligence you provide enough carbohydrate in the days leading up to the football match. Same goes for fluid. Provide an appropriate amount of fluid. Um, this one here, and again, like I say, I think you know, this, this provides potentially um, a reason for why trained endurance athletes can perform well dehydrated. I don't see good endurance runners on their Sunday runs running around with drinks bottles all the time. You know, maybe ultra runners will. If you're half marathon, marathon distance, nobody carries drink. Every Sunday, they'll do 16, 20 miles without <laughs> drinking hardly anything. What about from a practical perspective? How can we get over this? So if you are working with athletes and you need to think about that, I would say, in terms of mitigating the effects of dehydration, know the athlete's sweat rate for that given activity and plan their fluid intake. There's a big argument in the literature and in the community about whether we should plan drinking, thirst driven drinking. For me, plan drinking is always going to be the best option because if you plan the drinking strategy, you can prevent them from over drinking. If you let them drink to thirst, they could still over drink. But in most situations, actually, drinking to thirst will be entirely adequate. 60, 90 minutes exercise, probably drinking to thirst will prevent 2% dehydration, which is the goal. What about this one? How can we use this information? So I say to people, train 
with competition drinking situations. So if you're a football player, for example, again, I'm taking it outside of the endurance um, setting. If you're a football player who plays a match on a Saturday and you start the match and you don't drink till half time and then you finish half time and you don't drink till full time, why would you train every single day drinking every 10 minutes? You're not preparing yourself for the competition setting. With some individuals, this might actually be taking that individual and trying to train them to drink a little bit more. So can we, if Gabri Selassie had not got to 9.8% dehydration and we've managed to get him to 7.8%, so he drank an extra litre over the two hours, would he have performed better? And that's the question that always sticks in my mind. If anyone manages to get an athlete like Gabri Selassie to do two you know, counterbalanced you know, marathon races with appropriate standardisation before, you know, hats off to you. So it's speculation at the moment. But you would speculate that if we can reduce that loss, maybe we might be able to improve performance. So maybe training drinking strategies might be an effective <coughs> Okay, what about what we don't know? So the main point here is that the only robust scientific data looking at dehydration and performance is, as I said, in endurance cycling, in the heat, in men. Any question outside of that sphere, in my opinion, at this time, we're guessing. So, what about other modes of exercise? What about running, where actually the weight loss that's induced through dehydration might be ergogenic? You're lighter, so perhaps your running economy improves. You know, football's the same. What about if you're jumping? Colin Jackson used to not drink for the entire day before his 110 metre hurdles races. Theorising that the lighter body mass means increased power to mass ratio, which means he breaks that world record, and he did break the world record. What about other types of, of performance? Okay. What about temperate environments, where the, the requirement for fluid to be diverted to the periphery isn't so high? The changes in blood volume and plasma volume that we see with dehydration won't be severe. What about females? In my view, these are, these are the questions that we, we don't know the answers to yet. And hopefully in, in the coming years, we will we'll start to unpick some of this. Um, I've got one slide left, so important practical messages for me. If you're advising athletes or you do anything with <coughs> athletes, these are the practical things to think about. So the first thing is that there are negative effects to drinking slightly too much as well. If you have to stop on the side of the road for whatever sort of toilet break you need, that is time that comes off of your performance. That's a negative effect on performance. If you're a recreational runner and you have to queue for the toilet that might take you five minutes, that's still recorded on your time. You can't say at the end of the race, you know, I had a five minute queue for the toilet. Um, you know, for cycling, maybe you make can hold the saddle whilst you go for a wee, so you don't lose so much time, but still, it's a, it's a detriment in performance, and you don't think about that. What about the other end? That is definitely a 6% isotonic sports drink. <laughs> the only thing in the world that is that colour. You know, over drinking at the other end can again lead to discomfort that could on its own impair performance. Um, and then final thing, if you're involved in you know, any marathon racing, a practical consideration for fluid intake is being able to pick the bottle up. Remember Mo's first London Marathon? number of drink stations that he took out everybody's bottles at, and then eventually had to come backwards to get his actual bottle. Try picking a bottle up at 21k an hour. Try drinking at that rate. It's a really difficult thing to do. Okay, so practicing those things are limitations to actually achieving hydration goals. Um, and with that, just thanks to everybody that's contributed to this work. Um, and yeah, any questions?
certainly that, that's something we're really interested in at the moment, how those <coughs> things overlap and um, whether changes in hydration influence the, what you do from a carbohydrate and what effect it has during exercise. Um, for me, I, I often separate those things out. So having a carbohydrate in perhaps you know, gel form, having a fluid in a form that is perhaps more, more palatable, unless you really like the kind of liquid carbohydrate intake, many athletes that I kind of interact with don't really. They almost have two systems. Um, but yeah, you, you can integrate them. Um, and I think obviously, I mean, Nick said in one of his opening slides, you know, trying to reduce the reductionist approach to, to um, nutrition, and that's a really, really valid point. You know, in this, we are reducing it just to water. Um, but we see those effects if we feed people, if we feed people carbohydrate. So even when we give people optimal carbohydrate intake, dehydration still seems to improve performance. Um, so I think they probably act separately and probably additive, additively. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there are studies that have shown that actually the utilization of carbohydrate, and our studies show this as well, the utilization of carbohydrate is higher when you're dehydrated. You know, a reduced cell volume seems to increase glycogenolysis. Um, and that's, a, that's an interesting um, finding from the point of view of carbohydrate utilization. I think the, 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 the change in carbohydrate utilization with dehydration is a really interesting one. And if you read the reviews, it, they often just say, you know, change in skeletal muscle, carbohydrate use. But when you actually start to unpick the data, um, so for example, our blinded study where we had two hours of exercise with or without fluid intake, we took gas samples at 10, 60, and 120 minutes of exercise. Effects on carbohydrate metabolism, fat metabolism, inversely. Because of 10 minutes, there's no difference in hydration at that point. Similarly, one of the recent studies that's looked at um, muscle glycogen use with, um, with uh, changes in hydration from uh, Lawrence Speed's lab, they, um, they looked at changes in glycogen use over a two hour exercise bout, biopsying every 40 minutes. So the change in muscle glycogen use was entirely explained by the change in the first 40 minutes. So at that point, there is virtually no change in hydration. So answering that question is difficult because if you look at the kind of basic science approach, you know, if we change the cell volume of, of, of you know, muscle or liver or whatever, it changes the use of, of glucose. So theoretically, that would be the mechanism. But the data from athletes actually exercising suggests that it happens well in advance of when those changes, changes occur. Now it's really difficult to um, pick that because we can't measure cell volume during exercise. At least I'm not aware of a way to do it. Uh, not well anyway. Um, but yeah, this is, for me, it's fascinating. There are also other effects as well because dehydration changes the delivery of fluid from the GI tract and the delivery of carbohydrate. If we change gastric emptying rate or intestinal absorption, that again could lead to a limitation in carbohydrate supply. So, yeah. Time for one more. never looked at swimmers, no, so I couldn't answer that directly. Um, we did do a study with swimmers once where we, we tried to feed them carbohydrate fluids during a tough swimming session. Uh, we saw that carbohydrate improved performance, but there was no kind of fluid question there. The interesting thing with, with swimming, from my perspective anyway, is that <coughs> you're immersed in, a, in water, and that hydrostatic pressure changes the distribution of fluid within the body, um, and also will increase urine output. It's one of the reasons swimmers always pee in the pool. Say they don't. You know, my four-year-old admits to it, but most elite swimmers don't. Um, but they do, definitely. So yeah, you see changes in the, the fluid balance regulation. The one thing I will say is that in, in most kind of swimming settings, the, the water temperature isn't high enough to induce significant sweating. You know, perhaps 
when we go to Tokyo next, next year and we've got you know open water swimming, triathlon, etc., there will be some kind of federal Victorian effects and you'll see increased stuff from there, but it doesn't seem to have so much of an effect. I'm not aware of any Right. Can you all hear me? Brilliant. Um, so before I get stuck into my presentation, which is going to be probably a little bit different from most of what's going to happen today, just uh, give me an idea how many people in the room are uh, or aspiring to be practitioners, not just researchers or, or whatever, but actually want to be practitioners. Okay, so that's lucky for me then. I'm trying to fit this, I'm not actually uh, fidgeting. Um, quite good at various things, but not this particular. Yeah. Okie dokie. So, um, a bit like Lewis, I'm a, I'm a walk around a fidgeter type of presenter, so I'm going to stand over here and move around a bit. Um, so when I was asked to come and talk to you guys today, um, it was on a topic that I'm particularly fascinated by, which I'm going to address in several different ways. Um, but I should tell you that um, there are many different ways of looking at this, this concept of, of what is knowledge, what is evidence, um, you know, the quality of it, the relevance of it and whether or not it's actually something you're, you're going to use in practice. There's a lot of different things you're going to have to wrestle with and struggle with as, as practitioners. So my aim today is to open that up for you and also for practitioners and researchers that are looking to uh, provide information that is of use to those of us that are in practice um, is also something that I'm, I'm hoping will, will happen. Um, so I have basically two jobs, um, or two, two things that I do. First and foremost, um, I'm a practitioner. Um, I make my living, I pay my bills, I support my family as a practitioner. Um, I have dabbled in academia, I've had roles here and there, full time, part time, but essentially what I do is I practice, um, and I practice in what I will refer throughout the rest of my presentation is the real world. Um, but also I established uh, an institute, um, which is the Institute of Performance Nutrition, where my team and I are dedicated to um, the training and development of practitioners, um, which is something I'm particularly excited and happy about, having been a practitioner for a very long time, um, nearly 30 years actually, in one way, or another. Um, so to go from where I started, which was actually as a personal trainer, uh, and through my evolution uh, for the first 15 odd years of this time frame, uh, to being a strength conditioning coach and just constantly going onwards and upwards from working with people who just wanted to lose weight to where I am now, where I might be dubbed as an elite sports nutritionist. Um, I don't tend to refer to myself as an elite sports nutritionist, but you already have because I've put it up there of course, um, and the word elite is, is more to do with the fact that I work with elite athletes, elite teams, and elite scenarios, 
But that doesn't mean that that's the only area that I'm aware of or have worked in because I've pretty much worked in every area, as you might imagine. Um, in terms of education, I've got quite a diverse education. My doctorate was in sport and exercise nutrition, but I also did one of my masters in exercise science. I also did strength and conditioning. Um, and uh, from that, I've got uh, a nice angle as well to look at, not just at nutrition, but also the, the needs and mechanisms, if you like, that underpin um, what my athletes are trying to, to do through their training, uh, you know, the adaptations that they're hoping to get and ultimately the medals they're trying to win has quite a lot of angles there. And um, I always advise people, if you want to be a practitioner um, as a sports nutritionist, don't only study sports nutrition because that will limit you and your abilities um, for reasons that hopefully I'll explore uh, today. In fact, this particular topic of <coughs> science and practice and bridging the gap between science and practice was what I concentrated my, my research on over the four years that I was doing my, my professional doctorate. And for those of you that aren't aware of the different types of doctorates that exist out there, um, a, a professional doctorate is more practice focused, it's more interdisciplinary, um, it has a broader uh, view on things um, as opposed to a more, a more uh, focused and one could say a narrow view um, and allows you to look at yourself as part of the practice experience. Um, it's not just information, you as a practitioner are involved in that interesting dynamic between um, the athlete or your client and the information and the recommendations you're trying to give that person in whatever environment that is. Um, is quite a complex area. Um, and the result of that process was I developed um, a model for evidence-based practice. Um, amazingly, no one uh, had or has yet still done this at the doctoral level, researching evidence-based practice in sport and exercise nutrition. Um, and um, I, I've got all sorts of publications that are about to come out on this, so I'm not going to hang around on that particular one. But um, actually, just to go back on there, is um, the reason why this is of particular interest is because there is a significant gap between science and practice, which I'm going to delve into um, right now. Um, but I'm not going to focus too much on that and academia and so on. I also want to leave you with a case study that we published, which is a demonstration of evidence-based practice, just to give you a bit more of an applied uh, angle. Um, and there's lots of, of topics we, we can get into, um, and um, rather than just publishing papers and so on, I've been lucky to interact on a few, not a lot, but a few, mainly consensus statements and uh, case studies, that sort of thing. But I also do a podcast where I talk to a lot of, of practitioners, like Lewis, for example, I've uh, spoken to on my podcast, where we talk about um, evidence within their realm that they've done research on and have published, but we unpack that evidence into an applied context, which always makes for a very interesting conversation. So I encourage you to, to listen to that. So anyway, I said I was a, a, a practitioner um, and have been now for um, a decade or so in this particular area of elite sport. Um, and I've had very diverse areas of practice that I've been very, very lucky to get into. Um, a lot of it's been in professional football and professional rugby. In fact, for those of you that, that know about me, last year I was at the um, FIFA World Cup in Russia, working with the Egyptian uh, national football team, because I'm a mercenary, obviously, um, where actually I was working with them primarily, uh, well, for a number of reasons, one of which was they had the issue of Ramadan, which um, is an area where we were definitely interested in uh, hydration, uh, practices, and I used a lot of Lewis's um, work to influence my practice there. Um, and also we had a, a particularly famous football player who managed to get injured just before um, our uh, 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 campaign, so to speak. So I had to work closely with him specifically to bring him um, back into the game, which um, we might, if we have time, we might get a chance to. Oh, and. Um, I worked in tennis, boxing, and so on, but probably the area that I've been most interested in working was where I worked with the British Special Forces and was attached to an operational unit um, 
helping the athletes with performance nutrition uh, approaches for these soldiers who are going to be operating in rather bizarre uh, environments, which is a nice way of illustrating that performance nutrition is not just about people who are you know, running very fast for a few seconds or, or on a football or rugby pitch. There are many different areas that you can apply performance nutrition, which is why I prefer that term than sport and exercise nutrition, which tends to sort of limit um, what you see in your head when you, when you hear those words. Um, but anyway, a key thing that I want to mention is we're, as practitioners, we're not working with subjects. We're not working with students necessarily. They might happen to be a student. What we're working with is real people, human beings. So yes, they're athletes, but athletes are also human beings. And with that comes a great deal of factors that you need to bear in mind. And these are going to be much more qualitative issues, uh, including race, religion, personal preference, um, just being fussy. I can tell you, any, any of you have a chance to work in professional football, Fussy is an area of interest, and these are core things in evidence-based practice. It's not, it's not just about using top quality evidence, you've also got to contextualize everything into the unique set of circumstances that you find yourself with. And this is an area that I want to explore a bit further. The other thing you've got to remember is for all the obsession that we have as researchers or practitioners in sports nutrition, it's not the only thing that exists in the world, sadly. When you're working with athletes, particularly elite athletes, there's a lot of things going on that they are focused on, that their coaches, that their, um, that their, 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 their training plans, there are many different angles. And there's also many different bodies of knowledge that will coincide and in many ways collide um, to form what, what is that bigger picture. So as a practitioner, it is particularly important that you are aware of the bigger picture and also of all the nuances that are occurring in all these different areas, which includes the information that you're acquiring and wanting to apply into practice. So this is where my interests are as, as a researcher or a practitioner researcher, um, is the question of well, what is evidence? And what actually constitutes as evidence that's relevant to practice? So there are words like context, and there are words like relevance that you'll hear me talking about all the time. Today, um, in my upcoming publications on this topic, uh, on my podcast, and so on. And it is really important that you learn how to contextualize things, but also you learn how to determine the relevance. <coughs> um, because you can do something but it doesn't mean you should do something. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that there are many different angles in the practice of sport and exercise nutrition, but first and foremost, the thing that you're going to be focused on the most is not their sport or their performance, but it's actually the health and welfare of your athlete. Because remember, they're not just athletes, they're also human beings. And that is going to be one of your primary things that you need to focus on. But at the same time, you also have your mind on other areas. But it is always, being, always important to be mindful um, that as a practitioner, you're not in the classroom. You might learn information within the lecture room, but that is not where you're practicing. You might also be acquiring your information from the lab, but that doesn't mean that that's where you're going to apply that information, because I don't work um, in a lab. Where you work as a practitioner is in the trenches of daily practice. And unlike the classroom, and unlike, especially unlike the lab, where it's nice and clean and very controlled environments, which is necessary for science, in practice, which is um, going to involve science, it's a, it's a lot of complex stuff, a lot of chaos, some good things, some bad things. And you have to be able to deal with these things as they happen. So that requires you need to understand that theory rarely articulates itself into practice. It is important, yes, that you learn how to identify quality information, which we'll get into in a minute, that you can use to apply into practice. But it isn't 
something whereby you read something in a book and then just do that in practice because there is a process that's going to be required in order for that information to actually bring about a potentially beneficial or effective outcome. So my first point here really is that we're talking about practice. And if we were to look at the dictionary term, which is quite useful, is that practice is the actual application or use of an idea, belief, or method as opposed to theories relating to it. So this is where the first gap starts to open, is, is this understanding that science and practice are two distinct things. They are related, absolutely, but they are different. This may seem obvious, but it isn't to a lot of people, particularly when they start their life in practice. So the first area here that I want to open up for you is, is this idea that there is a gap between science and practice. And by that we mean there's a big difference between knowing something and actually doing something. And ultimately you may come up with the best evidence-based, highest quality, idea or plan, but there's still going to be a gap, potentially, between that and success. So ultimately, the sweet spot is learning how to narrow that gap as much as possible. Now, one of the most exciting things for all of us in this room today is just how sexy sports nutrition is becoming. It's awesome. You can spend all day long reading up on this stuff. You can spend half your day listening to my podcast if you want, and you can spend the other half of your day reading James's papers. And you could keep doing this every day <coughs> for the entire year. And there still would be thousands more opportunities for you to learn and read up. But this is an important point, because just because all this information exists, it doesn't mean that you should use it all. You need to understand how much of this stuff is useful and how much of this stuff is not so useful. So that's why I like the phraseology of a practitioner's toolbox, because information is a tool that you use and apply in practice. But like any tool that you're going to use to get a job done, you need to know which tools to use, or ideally in your toolbox, which is going to be the best tool to use. You also need to know the strengths and limitations of the tools that are in your toolbox. And perhaps, probably, the most important thing that you can achieve as a really good practitioner is when to know not to use a tool. Because that's a massive problem in practice, is where people start doing things that they shouldn't do or needn't do, which effectively is the same thing as using a, slab, a sledgehammer to knock in a little pin. So this is why I like to refer to the term relevant. Is it actually relevant? Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, you can use it. Yes, it probably should be somewhere in your toolbox. And that toolbox is something that we grow and develop as we learn, as we practice. We attend seminars. We attend training courses. We add tools and devices uh, for assessing maybe body composition. There are tools to assess Hydration in the lab, there's potentially tools that might assess hydration um, in practice. But you still need to know their strengths and limitations and contextualize the value of their use at that, t at that point in time is a little bit more complicated. So in practice, when you're coming up with a strategy or an intervention, it's always going to depend on what you're actually trying to do. And it might be on what you're trying to do right now, this evening, tomorrow, next Olympic cycle. But you've always got to ask yourself, what actually am I trying to do with this idea or intervention? Now, a recent paper came out, which is um, a, an essential tool I would recommend for every practitioner to put in there toolbox, which is Professor Graham Close and Professor James Morton and um, Andy Casper um, produced this paper, Paper to Podium, which is a really lovely um, 
tool that's going to help you learn how to determine the translational potential of information that you're reading in the scientific literature, textbooks, and so on. And a particular message will come out of that, is even if the science is great, and believe me, there's lots of not great science out there, and you have to be pretty good at understanding and reading papers and looking at data and various other things sometimes to even determine whether that paper is good quality or, or bad science. Um, but sometimes, and often, you will come across amazingly good science, but it's still not necessarily relevant to your practice. Therefore, it's a distraction, which can be a major problem to you and your practice. So make sure you read that, that paper and you start practicing um, that process. So this is an area that I also looked at in my, in my research. Um, and here's more of a brain fart, really, than anything. Just to give you some of the areas that go from starting the process of taking information like science, learning how to recognize and differentiate the quality of that science, um, and then going through a process where ultimately you're trying to decide whether it's relevant or irrelevant so that um, you can then take that to the next level and learn how to apply it in the practice. The application process in itself is a highly complex process. Because remember, your athlete or your client is a human being, you are a human being, and with that comes the weird and wacky real world that throws in a lot of interesting uh, potential hurdles that are in your way. So what I'm saying really is a lot of this is going to come down to you being a decision maker as a practitioner. So all of these tools end up being used in your decision making process. Um, And in order to do that effectively, you're going to learn how to combine the science, the theory, the knowledge, with your practical skills and abilities, which might be consulting skills, um, body composition testing skills, communication skills, um, along with um, also the actual correct tools, um, whether it's DEXA or body composition uh, methodologies where you'll find that there's a great deal of uh, uh, complexity there too, which I haven't got time to, to get into. But also your practitioner um, thinking skills need to be thinking at the past, the present and the future, which of course makes much of this really quite complicated. Um, so what I thought I would do here is give you an example of how this process might work, rather than bang on about practice theory um, and exploring my ideas about evidence-based practice. I'm a practitioner, so most of you want to be practitioners. Well, here's um, how we go through some of this process in practice. And um, I based this off um, uh, a case study that we published a couple of years ago now um, with uh, Dr. Mayor Anchuris and Dr. Scott Robinson, uh, Scott when he was still working with me. Um, and this is freely available, and you can get this on uh, ResearchGate or just email me, and I'll happily provide this to you. So, the background to this study comes from professional football, where, as you know, I work a lot. Professional football players are uh, interesting in many different ways, um, but some of the things you need to know about a football player when you're trying to determine how you can help them and what sort of strategies you can practically uh, give them is, for example, that an elite professional football player might play, um, sorry, might train four times a week and he might also play one to two games per week, which is, which is a fair amount. So that's going to equate to a, roughly 150 training sessions and up, to, and up to 50 games per season, particularly <coughs> those that are or international duties. But they don't just play in one location, they can travel all over the world. So there's a lot of traveling on airplanes, um, they travel on coaches, um, there's a lot of press attention, particularly on the elite players. Um, there's a lot of media attention from the television people, there's a lot of stuff going on. Between their training, between their playing and between 
them just being human beings that are celebrities, if you like. There is a great deal of life stress that they undertake. And by life stress, we mean uh, physiological stress and psychological stress. <coughs> so the impact of all of this stress is that it will increase the risk of illness and infection. And, and the reason why this is important to you as a, as a sports nutritionist working with your athletes is because they're not much use if they're sick or they're ill. And that is why I said the first thing you need to be concerned with is the health of your athletes. Because no amount of training or technical skills is going to go anywhere if they are in that situation. So some of the uh, negative effects of illness um, and infection is reduced player health and well-being. That's a bit more obvious. Reduced player availability for training and competition. So if they don't turn up to training as often, they're not going to be um, as fit, as fast, etc., as conditioned as maybe they should be, which is going to reduce performance um, and performance on the pitch. Um, they're also not going to be there to play with their teammates, so there's a negative impact that that will have um, on the team as a whole. And it's very interesting to see how much impact that, that can have on a team that's been hit with illness and injury. The outcome can be uh, quite devastating. And there's also an increased risk of illness and infection amongst um, other players and staff because a lot of these things spread like wildfire. So there's a lot of reasons why you want to take an interest in this. So this case study that I'm showing you here is a real-world applied example, not on a student, not on a college athlete, but on a real Premier League international football player. So the actual background of this player is it's a 25-year-old male. He's arguably the most important player for his Premier League club, and he's also an English international um, player. He was illness-prone. Um, we got involved um, partly because they called us in as practitioners um, rather than as researchers. And the reason was, was this, this player was having three upper respiratory tract infections um, in the three months prior to when we came in. Um, and that resulted in him missing a bunch of games and uh, it was actually over two weeks of, of training, which was devastating. So something needed to be done about this. So as practitioners, you're going to do tests and assessments on your athlete. It's going to differ from what you would do potentially in a lab because you're using the tools in your toolbox that are available at your club or in your own traveling toolbox, which will be different than some of the studies that you will read. That you will read. So in our case, um, we were able to assess daily diet. That's using things like food diaries, taking pictures, um, actually interviewing the athlete and then using that information to get a good understanding of what their diet actually looked like. We would do uh, body <coughs> composition testing using the ISAC methodology, which is a, fanta a fantastic um, field method or, or private practice method of assessing body composition. We did a few um, lab tests as well where we looked at salivary IgA, which is a uh, a questionable tool for that, but it, it was um, at the time something that we thought might give us an idea about the immune response. We also did a full um, set of blood tests, um, and we also analysed the player's sleep. So those are the things that we had a look at. So once we looked at all this information, knowing about the problem, we needed to try and understand in what this person, in what they were doing, what was going on going on. So there were some red flags. So the first thing that we noticed when we looked at the diet is that this player was skipping breakfast and they followed a low carb uh, diet. Um, and I'll explain why in a minute. So this guy is an elite football player. Elite international football player and he's doing a low carb diet. The result of that, were, amongst other things, is that he was suffering from low energy availability, but also poor nutrient intake, just by virtue of skipping meals. 
You didn't consume any carbs after um, or during exercise. So that's a double red flag on that. He was averaging four hours of sleep per night. And um, one of the key findings from his blood test showed that his vitamin D levels was pretty low for an athlete at 53 nanomoles per liter. So, like you, we were like, what the hell is going on here? It wasn't the uh, club's policy for them to go on low carbs, um, but this player was doing it nonetheless. And this is one of these scenarios where it's good to sit down and have a conversation with the athlete in confidence, which I'll talk about in a minute, and actually try and figure out what is going on. Not just look at the test results, not just look at the, the outcomes, the illness, the missing of injuries, but actually try and find out what's going on. Why? Because you need to try and fix the problem. The reason why is because he was obsessed with what he looked like without his shirt on. Classic Premier League football player. And of course, one of the most popular things that you'll see on social media is people banging on about going on low-carb diets to uh, manipulate body composition and all the other social media vomit that you can find um, out there. And it's a real thing. There are loads of Premier League players that are in, into this. And one of the things I love about attending conferences where there are other practitioners is you start talking to all the other practitioners working at league clubs, and they're like, oh, God, it's not, I mean, they all have the same issue. Because one issue here is the, uh, although the clubs will provide a nutritionist, most of them, ironically, some Premier League clubs still don't have nutritionists. They may only be there one day a week, maybe two days a week. Only a few clubs have full-time nutritionists. But even then, the players are seeking information elsewhere, which might include social media. One of the big issues you have to deal with as a practitioner that I'll talk about in a minute. But the key issue here is we're not talking about aesthetics nutrition. We're talking about performance nutrition. So again, we go back into the dictionary and we look at, well, well, what do we need out of this? And we go, well, we need them to be functional. At the end of the day, they're an athlete. They need to perform. In order to perform, they need to be functional. What does functional mean? Designed to be practical and useful rather than attractive. So this guy was manipulating his body composition for the purposes of an aesthetic effect. But when you start to look at the impact of body composition on health and performance and how you arrived at that status of body composition, whether it's getting too lean or too fat, the implications go beyond just the, aesthet beyond the aesthetics, obviously. And this is a more complex look at it that we don't have time to get into. But we could simplify it into three main areas that you as a performance nutritionist need to bear in mind. Yes, there's the health side of things, but there needs to be a performance side, and there also needs to be an injury risk. And there's a fair bit of juggling you need to do as a practitioner in order to hit the sweet spot in that area. But it doesn't matter how you look at this, it's way more than just the aesthetics or a body fat percentage or, or whatever. So how did we deal with this situation? So by far and above, the most important part of this performance nutrition intervention was to develop a relationship with the player so that he could start to believe in what we had to say and not what social media or his mate in the locker room had to say. It doesn't matter how many degrees you've got, they don't care about the letters after your name. Ultimately, what they're going to say, if you start speaking rocket science at them, they're either just going to nod and walk off and they wouldn't have got anything, or, as I have had when I was working in rugby clubs, they would say, shut up, geek, just tell me what to do. Okay? If you don't get their buy-in, they're not going to do what you ask them to do. And sports nutrition or nutrition is one of those things that you're not doing for them particularly. They have to go away and do it for themselves. And that comes down to compliance. And the only way you can get compliance is if your person actually wants to do it and they believe in what they're doing. So the most important thing you need to do is that first, before you start worrying about the science that you're going to apply into practice. So this was fundamental to the process. The next thing we did, of course, was address the problems with the diet. Um, 
which meant that we needed to correct, obviously, the missing of the meals. We needed to increase the carbohydrate intake, but we did this by also explaining to the athlete that what we're doing is giving you enough carbohydrate to refuel the fuel tanks, but not enough to refuel the fat tanks, for example. Um, and I'm just simply using that as an example of how you have to convert the science into practice speak in order to get your message across. But the point was, once, once he understood what I, or what our team, we ultimately translated as things like um, energy availability, uh, carbohydrate periodization, and all that stuff, but once you enable the athlete to understand what they're doing, but still bear in mind that he still wants to look good with his shirt off, and <coughs> ultimately, and metaphorically speaking, he can have his cake and eat it, you can really start to get somewhere. So in this case, this is when we then started to make sure that the food was on point. This is the stuff that you're all going to be or are experts in, so I won't labor that. Um, a particularly key point here was actually integrating with the chefs. Again, you may be good at talking about macros and calories and how many grams per kilogram of whatever, but the athlete won't understand that. The chef, particularly this new era of performance chefs, will probably help you or will help you translate that science into what's on the plate. Remember what I said, football players are pretty fussy. They've got a fair amount of money in the bank. They're not going to eat something that looks pretty nasty. They want it to look good, look like a Michelin prepared meal. In fact, many Premier League clubs now have Michelin or Michelin standard chefs for you to integrate with, which is great when you work at these clubs because the staff meals can be pretty awesome. Um, we believe in a food first approach. Um, this athlete actually didn't like taking supplements, ironically, um, for reasons that largely related to he had sort of a choke reflex. Um, but we, we, we had to determine uh, that there are a number of things that we needed to do because we were already in the season to speed up the process, vitamin D being the priority. Um, we also recommended quercetin. Part of the rationale there was because it was a little sort of pea-sized gel containing something that had evidence behind it, which in this case I've referenced was the journal we took the recommendations from, um, because the athlete actually could swallow quercetin tablets, not big chunky horse pills. Um, and we also advised uh, probiotics, partly because of the nature of his uh, symptoms and travel plans and so on. We also look at lifestyle as a practitioner. It's not just about macros and calories. We're looking at other factors, um, and the key areas that we also advised on was things like hygiene in the form of washing hands. A lot of athletes, so when I'm out there doing the Dr. Lewis James inspired and informed nutrition protocols, there are uh, issues uh, beyond that where players will share bottles, they have a swig, drop them on the ground, they're doing whatever. Uh, they might swim by the pitch and pick up a bottle and if someone else drank from it who's got a nasty cold, for example. There's all sorts of problems there. So giving them a bottle that's got their name written on it. I mean, there's all, I haven't got time to get into it, but there's all sorts of ways you can manage that process. Get them to walk around with little gels to keep in their pocket. Um, when they're going to sneeze, sneeze into your elbow rather than into your hand because you blah, 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 and then shake hands or touch a bottle, whereas at least into the elbow you can minimize that risk. Um, and also, in his case, he was consuming a lot of coffee. Why? Because he was only getting four hours of sleep, so naturally he was hooked on coffee, so we would limit his caffeine intake, particularly in the afternoon. Um, and we had the real fight of trying to limit his use of social media. Why? Because he's constantly on Instagram, um, posting selfies of himself without a shirt on, or um, enjoying the millions of likes by um, the uh, men and ladies that like that sort of stuff. So that's something else that we did. The other thing is, is we didn't just have a nice chat at the beginning, we had to maintain that relationship by having, in this case, weekly consultations. Even if it's just a five minute chat, you're maintaining that relationship, you're maintaining that buy-in, but also it's an opportunity for you to go, hey, how you doing, how you feeling, how's your plan going to pick up any problems that you can then use to troubleshoot and tweak your intervention. 
Because the great thing about practice is you don't have to stick with the plan. Um, you can adjust and adapt accordingly. So what happened as a result of this intervention? Most importantly, of course, what we achieved was excellent compliance. Without compliance, your intervention almost certainly is not going to work. So that was the first thing. You have to monitor compliance. His blood test showed that his vitamin T D levels improved, and um, um, that was a great achievement. Um, whether or not it's truly meaningful, I'm not sure, but his salivary IgA increased. Um, and a really big win for us was his sleep increase from four to seven hours. Uh, it's a really fascinating area if you look into what's going on in sleep research and the impact that that has on health and recovery. Uh, there's even a, a little pinch of information on potentially how that might affect things like uh, carbohydrate uh, metabolism maybe, certainly the impact on appetite like leptin and ghrelin regulation, which of course is going to affect uh, uh, nutritional behaviours. But that's all very nice, but did it actually do what we wanted it to do? And yes, it did. What happened was his upper respiratory, upper respiratory tract infection symptoms significantly declined. Um, the player completed in all the following training sessions uh, and matches over the, the next three month period to the end of the season. Um, and to him in particular, and to the Great Britain, the England football team, as he still managed to maintain his position in the squad. So that's a result for us as a practitioner. So thank you very much. Um, that's my team at the IOPN, and I uh, hope you found that with some benefit. so much for the invitation to uh, speak here today. It's been wonderful engaging with everyone. Yesterday I was jet lagged the whole, all day and I enjoyed meeting everybody and uh, it's been really nice to uh, sort of uh, get a little bit more familiar with uh, the group here uh, today. Uh, it's also great that you've eaten lunch now. So you're in, uh, you know, I was going to speak right before lunch and you know, that, I was going to make a joke about how every speaker right before they speak lunch, you know, lunch time, they always make that joke about you know, having, you know, standing between lunch um, and now I don't have to eat it. So my work is a, uh, a little different. Uh, I'm just going to switch gears a little bit from the morning uh, conversations. Uh, my work focuses broadly on health factors, uh, which I consider health behaviors and some physiological measures. Uh, so looking at diet, uh, physical activity and exercise, uh, and obesity and implications for cognitive function. Uh, and uh, now I have to confess, I don't have interactive data here to show you in terms of intervention work. Uh, much of this work is really in its infancy, and we're sort of really developing nice building blocks to get us to a place where I think hopefully you'll see the potential of doing these synergistic trials to leverage both nutrition and, uh, and physical activity to improve uh, cognitive function. So this is my laboratory group. I do want to acknowledge their work. Uh, this is, I work in the same building as uh, Nick Bird, so this is just a photograph on the other side of that same building. Uh, every semester I drag my students out to take this awkward photograph. I don't know if Richard does the same thing with these students around this building, but uh, I usually do that to my students, and uh, this is what you know we look like in the summer months. Uh, that's right, yeah. Uh, but it's a big group. We have uh, it's an interdisciplinary laboratory. We have graduate students who do neuroscience, uh, nutrition, and uh, kinesiology, uh, and the undergraduate students are just as as diverse in their research interests. Uh, I also want to acknowledge our uh, sponsors. So much of the work I'll present today was generated through a large NIH grant that we have collaboratively. Uh, uh, obtained, and then also uh, some uh, work that we've done uh, funded by Abbott Nutrition. So as I mentioned uh, just a few moments ago, 
uh, you know, we, we have a generally good understanding of how nutrition, physical activity, and exercise, uh, and obesity are interrelated. Uh, there have been systematic reviews of meta-analyses on these topics for several decades now. In fact, some, but there have been enough of them, they counteract each other at times. However, what we don't really understand uh, is whether these factors in health really impact uh, measures of cognitive health. We've typically studied nutrition and exercise really in the context of health uh, metabolic impairment and obesity risk and really factors of weight regulation. That makes sense, especially in the United States, given our you know, uh, recent challenges with uh, you know, obesity in childhood, but also in adulthood. Uh, but increasingly, what we're learning is that these, these, these health factors are also important uh, for access to cognitive health. And we don't know a lot uh, about this, uh, this of these interactions. But before I talk to you about cognitive health, I wanted to just quickly uh, just you know, define how we study cognitive health, which particular markers we're interested in uh, examining or outcomes we study. Uh, cognition is a broad term. It means different things to different people. Uh, we're interested in really two sets of uh, outcomes. Uh, one category is called cognitive control. Uh, these are also called executive functions. Uh, these are essentially top-down neurocognitive processes that are involved in goal-directed behavior. Uh, that means essentially any actions that you take that are deliberate, volitional, uh, you know, these, these processes are involved. Uh, these include working memory, inhibition, and cognitive flexibility. Together, these processes are thought to support more complex uh, you know, uh, processes such as reasoning, uh, planning, really the building blocks of what eventually becomes you know, scholastic success or vocational success in everyday life. So in the laboratory setting, what we're usually doing is we're trying to deconstruct some of these more complex, uh, complex uh, behaviors into something more specific that we can study uh, using paradigms. We also know that executive functions are important because they, uh, are, from a scientific perspective, because they depend on the prefrontal cortex, uh, part of the brain that we know takes a little bit longer to develop relative to most other um, you know, brain substrates. In addition to looking at cognitive control, uh, we're also interested in studying hippocampal function. Uh, the hippocampus, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is a, uh, is, a, is a tiny but mighty structure that sits at the base uh, of the human brain. It's involved in virtually all matter of memory processes. But what also makes the hippocampus really interesting to study uh, in the context of exercise and nutrition is that it's one of the two parts of the brain that actually exhibits neurogenesis throughout life. Uh, this is something that we didn't know for a very long time. It turns out the, the adult human brain also makes new neurons. And one of those sites is the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. The other site, uh, interesting if you're interested, is the olf olfactory bulb. But we know that the, uh, the, the, the hippocampus is involved in different types of memory systems. And we know, depending on the type of memory you're studying, so relational memory is the ability to bind information uh, together in memory and then flexibly remember it later on. Uh, this is something that's very important. Like, for example, in a day from now, if you're recalling this event, uh, if the elements of this scene, uh, into including where your position is relative to other people in the room, uh, the sequence of events in terms of time. All this information is encoded by the hippocampus that you later on uh, have to effectively recollect. And that's relational memory. Uh, that's different from remembering just something, whether you've seen something or not, but just a familiarity task. And we can tell this from neuroimaging studies that actually show you that the hippocampus in particular is involved when you're conducting uh, relational memory type paradigms uh, in the uh, in, in, in imagining. Uh, and we know, you know from the perspective of relational memory theory that the hippocampus itself may be particularly susceptible uh, to health factors, and we know this from animal studies. The first what I'll do is lay the groundwork in the area of um, uh, cognitive function, really from the literature that we have in the area of obesity and adulthood, and metabolic impairment, and what we know, and then quickly get into nutrition and uh, aerobic fitness and activity. So the way I look at you know, where our work sits in the broader scheme of things, uh, you really have to just start with the adult uh, and older adult literature. And one of the perhaps you know, greatest challenges we face really across, across the globe is the increased prevalence of uh, dementia. And that includes Alzheimer's disease. In fact, it's anticipated that uh, dementia by 2050 will be double uh, in proportion relative to in, in most countries. And that rate is supposed to be higher in countries that are developing, uh, or recently become developed because of the nutrition transition going on over there. And you know, traditionally, we, we of course don't really know the causes of dementia, but increasingly uh, what we're learning is that uh, type 2 diabetes and uh, comorbidities associated with obesity increase risk for diagnosis of dementia. Uh, this is a, just, a, just one of the uh, meta-analyses that have been done with longitudinal studies that, sh that show consistently that individuals in midlife who have metabolic impairment, whether in the form of type 2 diabetes or elevated waist circumference or, or central adiposity, typically by mid-60s to mid-70s encounter a risk for uh, you know, the diagnosis of dementia that could be up to twofold greater. Uh, that, of course, doesn't mean that type 2 diabetes or obesity causes dementia. That's not causal data. But, that do, does, but if you put that information in context, what we already know, uh, based on other neuroimaging studies, is that what we think is going on is that obesity and metabolic impairment 
essentially precipitate what the normal aging process, in which we do see uh, more atrophy in the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex, where we see some of the executive functions sort of uh, diminish uh, as a function of some of the newer inflammation that we think uh, is that you have in the case of obesity and type 2 diabetes. So we have done some work even with middle-aged or younger adults, uh, and you don't have to really work, wait till older age to see some of these relationships between uh, you know, glucose tolerance, for example, and cognitive function. This is the data we collected in collaboration with Nick, Bird, Nick Bird's laboratory at the University of Illinois. And we examined uh, you know, attentional control in adults um, who had overweight or obesity. Uh, we, took, and it, we did a glucose tolerance test uh, to determine uh, you know, pseudo index for insulin sensitivity. Uh, we took fasted blood measures to also get uh, insulin resistance or HOMA IR. The cognitive task we used uh, allowed us to gauge, it's a two stimulus uh, visual oddball task. It allows us to measure really how well somebody pays attention to on their computer screen to a particular stimulus that's less probable. But in addition to getting accuracy measures or reaction time, our laboratory is also interested in getting uh, some neural function measures. So we also collect EEG while subject to doing these computerized tasks. Specifically focusing on uh, ERP components, or event related brain potential component known as a P3. Uh, this is a positive deflection in the EEG waveform that occurs uh, during attentional processes in particular. Uh, and the larger that peak, uh, it tells us about the attentional resources somebody's dedicating to a particular uh, you know, stimulus evaluation, and how early that peak uh, occurs in any uh, on a, on a waveform tells us how fast somebody's brain is processing that information. So from these data, what we learn is that during this two stimulus oddball task, while participants are doing it, we can see that uh, individuals who actually have better sensitivity, even, when, even though they overweight or obese, uh, tend, those with high, greater sensitivity in terms of pseudo index tend to do this in a faster fashion. They have faster uh, response times, but also faster uh, latency. And this is neural data, so we actually think that their brains are performing uh, adequately, you know, accurately, but also in a fashion that's more efficient. Uh, we don't see that same sort of relationship with the resistance measures. We see it slightly to the trend level relationship there. So we think that you know, pseudo index being more sensitive perhaps taps into some of the you know, those smaller effects that you'd expect in this population. But just to highlight that you know, these, these, these my laboratory has really been focused on asking these questions earlier in life uh, and really focusing a lot more on children. Uh, but we see these, also, these also findings also in adults. I'm particularly interested in uh, children because of the increased prevalence of childhood obesity in the United States. Uh, this used to be really what people categorize as a problem in the Americas, but really it's a global issue now. I haven't looked at the statistics in the UK, but I still think it's about 20% uh, of children with elevated weight status, which is about 10% less than American children still historically high and still a major concern for public health. Uh, and we know that, of course, earlier emergence of childhood obesity tracks into adulthood leads to all sorts of uh, you know, endocrine issues, but also it oftentimes gets underestimated. Uh, the psychosocial issues uh, associated with obesity, uh, bullying, teasing, uh, this distress and depression that's also associated with early emergence of obesity. And childhood is a very complicated process anyway, but then you layer on this uh, sort of perceived obesity or actual obesity in children's lives and really does create a lot of challenges for them. So what we've been interested in really examining is whether we can you know, understand what the differences that we're seeing in adults as a function of weight status uh, can be observed in uh, earlier childhood. So this was one of the earliest studies we did in this area uh, that looked at just differences between children with obesity and children with healthy weight, uh, comparing their performance on an oddball, and a no, uh, sorry, a, no, a go no go task uh, that assesses inhibitory control. Uh, and what we learned is that after you match these children, very important markers like socioeconomic status, uh, IQ, uh, also aerobic fitness, age, and sex, uh, you can see that in, the, in what we call the no-go task, which is the, uh, the actual inhibitory control task, we can actually see uh, detriments occur where children who with obesity tend to perform more poorly in the inhibitory task and not the intentional task. Uh, in addition to that, we also collected EEG data so we can get, get, a, get a better sense of how the children's brains were actually utilizing resources while they're doing these tasks. And what we notice, and this, what you're seeing here is that deep red, is really a different topographic map uh, showing the P3 component that I previously just talked about, uh, of the difference between the no-go and the go condition. Uh, and what we see is that essentially in healthy weight children, we see this neural modulation that occurs between the go and no-go. Uh, so as children are asked to do more inhibitory, de inhibitorily demanding tasks, they actually modulate their intentional resources more adequately or more efficiently uh, but we don't see that sort of modulation in uh, children with obesity. So what we're seeing here is not just differences in their performance uh, on these computerized tasks, but also the way their brain is operating while they're doing this very control task. And when you think of inventory control, you can see how it may apply, apply directly uh, to important markers like eating behavior in the real world. So in addition to you know, looking at cognitive control using the, using the EEG tasks, 
Uh, we've also looked at relational memory, uh, and uh, my doctoral work entirely focused on uh, radiographic approaches of studying body composition on children. So in my laboratory, we have access to a DEXA, and we utilize it for virtually all our studies because we want, really want to get a good sense of uh, the implications of uh, body fat, uh, the overall percentage, but also fat distribution and its implications. So we did a study several years ago looking at uh, relational memory performance, the so hippocampal function in kids with overweight or obesity. And we noticed the BMI percentile cutoff for obesity is not very useful in distinguishing performance on hippocampal memory tasks. Uh, but when you actually specifically focus on central adiposity, uh, this was assessed using DEXA, so we were able to do our region of interest. Um, and that, that is where you actually see the, the, the effects occur, especially in children who are already overweight or obese. Uh, and we see this negative relationship. In fact, about, you know, visceral adiposity tends to predict about 20% of the variance in relational memory task performance, which is significant uh, when you look at most uh, you know, memory paradigms or even look at attentional paradigms, that's a significant proportion of variance explained by uh, you know, the body composition variable, which tells us something a little about their, the role of perhaps uh, metabolic risk and cognitive function in children particularly those that already uh, have all the other weight status. So what I'm going to do next, uh, I'm going to share with you some work uh, that I've done in collaboration with some colleagues in the area of uh, aerobic fitness and interventions in that area, also the, the targeted cognitive function, relational memory, and attentional control. Uh, the area of exercise and brain is actually very interesting. Um, it is probably one of the, the areas of uh, science in this area that has really good uh, mechanistic work done in the background to really explain to us how exercise affects the brain. And this is an area of work that's been done in, uh, in rodent models. Uh, you know, this is the first figure up there on the left. Uh, shows you some data for, uh, for Henry Ron Clark's laboratory at the NIH, where it's clear that, and this has been shown over and over again, that when you provide mice with a running wheel, uh, you can actually see really, uh, sort of spatial memory improvement in Morris Watermate's task uh, you know, relative to not having that exercise uh, opportunity. We also know that exercise actually, so actually increases neurogenesis in mice. Uh, you can actually image these and see this. Uh, we also know that when you have this, you know, the wheel, and, and, and you give the mice the wheel, you can see the neurogenesis occur. Uh, that, near, that degree of neurons form actually corresponds to the benefit they have in spatial memory uh, assessment using Morris Watermate's task. And we know that this effect is really driven quite a bit by uh, brain-derived neurofactor and other neurotropins that are involved in sustenance of you know, new neurons into adult neurons that then actually have implications for function. However, in the air, we really don't have a lot of data in humans, and much of the data in humans has really been in the older adult literature, and oftentimes that's really too late when you think about prevention strategies. Uh, so we've been focused quite a bit on children, and it makes sense when you think about uh, the degree to which you might, uh, children in the United States, for example, don't meet uh, physical activity guidelines. Uh, this number, that percentage of children that meet physical activity guidelines is never robust. It's uh, about 50% uh, you know, in early, uh, sort of later childhood, about 6 to 11 years of age. But that number drastically declines to the point it gets about 10% by the time children reach adolescence. So they get to adult levels of sedentary behavior for physical activity very quickly. Uh, and we've been curious, interested in uh, really examining what this means. And the, you know, the causes of the reduced physical activity participation in the United States in particular, it's ironic and it's really sad is that Oftentimes, even though physical education in schools is mandated across all 50 states, uh, more than 30 of states can actually get an exemption from that if they can prove that, uh, or they can say that you know, they, this, their grades are struggling or they're trying to focus on academics, they can take physical education away. And yet, when you really, hopefully when you see some of the data I'll show you, it's actually, we think it might be counterproductive or it's actually hurting the kids uh, to do that. But schools are often put in this position where they think they have to choose. So some of the earliest work that was done in this area was done by Art Kramer and Chuck Hillman of the University of Illinois. And what they did was ask a very basic question, but they wanted to know whether you know, aerobic fitness uh, can predict uh, hippocampal volume uh, and hippocampal function. So they used the VO2 max test, separated kids into high fit, low fit children, uh, and they looked at hippocampal volume. Uh, and it turns out children who have a higher fit tend to have larger hippocampal volumes. They also perform better, specifically on relational memory tasks, the type of memory tasks that's, that really elicit uh, hippocampal uh, activation uh, during performance, not the item memory tasks. Uh, and they also did a mediation model to demonstrate that these effects were driven by you know, the relationship between fitness and hippocampal volume in these children. So this was the first study of, of, of the time that showed us that you can actually see the relationship between both brain function and structure uh, in children. These are eight to nine years of age, so they're relatively young children, um, and you know, established really what became sort of the, the foundational knowledge that led to a series of studies. And one of the studies, this is, these are data from uh, Chuck uh, Hillman's laboratory. He was my postdoc mentor. Uh, before I joined the laboratory, he had done one of the seminal studies that asked a very, uh, a very important question whether a single bout of physical activity uh, provision or exercise provision can improve 
uh, cognitive function in children. Uh, so what he did is just a rest versus a, he did a kind of balanced design, but the rest versus a uh, treadmill walking exercise, where he had children walk on a treadmill for 20 minutes uh, at 60% uh, of max heart rate. After the heart rate was within 10% of baseline, he looked at cognitive function assessed using the flanker task, and also looking at the same event related brain potentials that I previously mentioned. And what the study demonstrated was that even a single bout of physical activity uh, or an exercise uh, it tends to improve uh, attentional control, selective attention assessed using the flanker task, and you can see the greater P3 component emerge for children uh, you know, during the exercise session uh, relative to the rest condition. And that difference in P3 amplitude actually corresponds to their uh, benefits that they have in their task performance. So really the first study to establish that, and that's, since then, Chuck has done several studies that have really expanded this to not just attentional control, but working memory, uh, and also he's done all kinds of different uh, acute interventions to, to target this, and we see this pretty consistently. The other question we had to address, uh, and this is work that I did along with Chuck when I was a postdoctoral research associate in his lab, was the question of whether, you, if you actually gave children the opportunity to be physically active, active and to meet the recommendation of being active at least one hour a day, uh, would that actually impact uh, their cognitive function over the course of a school year? So this was a, the first randomized control study that had been done to address that question. It wasn't, wasn't published uh, really until uh, 2014, so that tells you a lot about how early you know, we are in our understanding of these implications. Uh, but this study definitely looked at uh, a control and intervention group where the intervention group received a daily physical activity program that was not a very high intensity exercise program, it was just really a, an, an unstructured play for an hour uh, that utilized the CASH curriculum that's been validated for children, and really just giving the children the opportunity to be active for an hour a day. Um, and compared to a condition where there's a no contact control group, that was a control group. Then they were a weightless control group, so they received the intervention after the nine month period. And they took measures of attentional control, cognitive flexibility, and some of the EEG markers that we have, have talked about. And what we, result, what we observed was that the intervention group exhibits a greater benefit for attentional control, also cognitive flexibility, uh, and both groups get improved, you expect that. As children get older, they're supposed to do better on these same tasks to administer nine months later. But you can see that the intervention group exhibits a greater benefit uh, over those nine months. And we actually see this benefit also in event related brain potentials where they're dedicating potential resources in a manner that is uh, efficient and actually uh, helps them do better on these tasks. Since the uh, Fit Kids study, uh, my interests have been a little different. I've really focused a lot more on younger children. Uh, this is a case where you know I didn't listen to the advice of my postdoc mentor. He didn't really. Uh, he, four year old to five year olds, for example, is where I've really focused quite my more of my work in recent years. Uh, and he always said that that's really a, you know it's a very difficult thing to do, and I agree. And that's been uh, you know really the fun, but also the challenge part of, of our work is that you know when you talk about cognitive paradigms. Uh, doing this work in younger children creates more challenges because suddenly you, know, you, you inherit very different sort of issues. You know, how, how are you going to design your tasks? Are the children really going to comply in the way you want them to? So the age categories you study a child would really, really make a difference. Even if it's four years of a difference, you're really dealing with uh, a lot of different uh, scenarios. But it's a lot of fun working with younger children. Uh, and what you know, we wanted, we're, we're interested in is really understanding whether the same effects that we see in older children are evident even earlier. Um, and uh, that involves modifying our cognitive tasks and our methodology a little bit. But this is unpublished data uh, under review right now, looking at the you know, relationship between submaximal testing using a six minute walking test, number of walk, lapsed walks, for example, uh, in children who are four years of age, uh, and their performance on a cognitive flexibility task, uh, assessing uh, using uh, Hawks and Flowers task. A cognitive flexibility task essentially asks children to be multitask or use different rule sets based on the, power, on the stimuli on the screen. It's very difficult to do. It involves certain amounts of working memory and inventory control. And what we learned is that this is very consistent with older children, where the night effect size of 0.3 is actually pretty large compared to what we see in older children. And that's sort of a consistent theme that's emerging, is that some of these effects, I think, are larger when you're dealing with younger children. We also observed that these, this benefit um, is also observed for the P3 component of ERP in four-year-olds, uh, which is, uh, you know, this is the data illustrating that. And that effect size is about 0 0.5, you know, 0 0.59, uh, which is a pretty large effect size for, you know, for when you think about some of these uh, effects compared to older children. And this is the first study to our knowledge that's been done looking at electrophysiological measures of attentional control in children this young and relating them to, uh, you know, to aerobic, to, even if it's sub, sub maximal aerobic fitness, which you know, we can see this benefit uh, is, uh, is this effect in younger children. Suggesting that maybe perhaps we need to start considering having interventions and uh, maybe even policies targeting uh, preschool and not just elementary schools uh, in terms of, uh, you know, improving physical activity. And what's really also great 
that a lot of this work in physical activity and exercise has resulted in, uh, you know, in the second edition of the physical activity guidelines for Americans. It actually acknowledged that the, you know, the exercise and physical activity benefits are there for brain and cognition in children as well as adults, and it's one of the factors they list uh, on the table here. And, and this is an exact, exact you know, cutout from the, uh, from the document. You'll notice a, little bit, a few slides later that this is not the case with nutrition. We're still a little behind in, in terms of our ad in adapting some of, the, some of the guidelines related to cognitive function. But we can see that there's some, there's some compelling evidence for the importance of uh, physical activity and exercise for cognitive health in childhood. So I'm going to shift now to the third leg of the, of the talk, which is really focused on nutrition. Um, and this is in the area of, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, nutrition's a really broad uh, discipline. I know we've talked a lot about even just within proteins, we're talking about foods. You know, you're really talking about a cocktail of nutrients when you're providing sort of intervention that's at the food level. Uh, and when you try to parse that out, uh, you're always, the fundamental challenge we all face when we study nutritional interventions is really thinking about targeted approaches. Uh, and especially those when it comes to the brain. Uh, because the brain is really a, it's a metabolic and very, hung, very hungry organ. It takes about 20% of our energy expenditure. It's constantly about 20% of energy expenditure. Uh, but nutrition plays a fundamental role in brain structure and function like all other tissues. You know, the brain is made of nutrition, the way it communicates, uh, how synapses compute, you know, communicate or neurotransmitters, then nutrients themselves, or uh, you know, neurotransmitters are you know, made from nutrients. So the pre nutrients serve as precursors for, for neurotransmitters. They, they form the, the, the membranes and the fluidity that's important in the, in the brain for maintaining adequate brain function. So we know nutrition is an integral part of brain function and structure, and in the cases of deficiencies, you see these stark effects. Uh, but what we don't really understand is whether there's a certain optimal uh, nutritional you know, diet or, or a particular nutrient that, uh, that's important for cognitive health uh, and brain function. And when you look at the American diet, so this is the Healthy Eating Index, which is a marker of overall adherence in the American population to the American guidelines. Uh, what you see here over the last, since 1999, you know, we've sort of hovered at 50 to 60 percent, slightly increasing in terms of total you know, diet quality. What this means is that, uh, at best, most Americans are maybe meeting half of the recommended guidelines in, in the context of meeting the guidelines for all the different food groups that are recommended to consume, in adequacy or in terms of moderation. So this, is go this just goes to show you that the predominant American diet is of lower quality uh, and not very, uh, not very healthy. And what that results in, uh, what we call shortfall nutrients, so the Americans typically don't get uh, an adequate amount of certain nutrients, and we've been focused on some nutrients that we think are particularly important uh, for brain and cognitive function. Uh, we, we've really been excited about a category of nutrients called uh, carotenoids. Uh, these are uh, some of the perhaps most beautiful uh, compounds in nature. Uh, these are plant compounds with antioxidant properties that have pigments, pigments in them, so they're plant pigments. Uh, plants in you know, have them in their fall class to protect them from photooxidative uh, you know, damage. Uh, they serve similar functions in different tissues in the human body as well. Uh, what's also interesting about carotenoids, so you know, flamingos, for example, are born gray. Uh, and I grew up in Uganda, uh, right next to Kenya, we have beautiful flamingos, and I didn't know this growing up, uh, but you know, flamingos are born gray, and then depending on the sort of diet they have, they incorporate these pigments into their feathers. Uh, and we, earlier we talked about eggs, for example. Eggs, have, egg yolks are yellow because of, of the carotenoid that's fed to them called lutein, uh, the, the hens. In different parts of the world, you can feed uh, different kinds of carotenoids, like beta carotene, which is found in uh, carrots and in pumpkin. Uh, you can get more orange or reddish sort of egg yolks. So you can see that that really varies depending on the, the diet of the animal. And also avocado toast. I haven't seen anyone, any avocado toast here yet. Maybe that's not a thing in England. But uh, in the United States, the hipsters have given us uh, avocado toast. Uh, it's a rich, you know, carotenoid uh, you know, blend. You have egg yolk, you have avocado, which is also rich. And tomatoes, which have carotenoids. But the reason why we're interested in studying this in the context of uh, cognitive function is that we know that carotenoids, even though there are hundreds in nature, we consume about 50 of these in our diet, really only a handful accumulate in, in our tissue. And what's interesting about carotenoids too is that because they're entirely uh, you know, from plant sourced, you have to eat them to consume them to, for them to accumulate in the body. We don't endogenously make any of them. It makes them a, an attractive uh, nutrient to study from just that perspective alone, that you can actually manage them through diet. <coughs> they accumulate in different uh, tissues, predominantly they end up in, the adipo in adipose tissue. But what we're really focused on is a specific pattern that emerges in the retina, so especially the macula of the human eye. It's actually yellow because of a particular uh, carotenoid called lutein. It's so dense that it changes the color of the macula. Lutein is also in blood, but obviously it doesn't change the color of blood. But it's so dense in the eye, it changes the color of the macula, yellow. And in the macula, we know that uh, lutein specifically, you know, is a really good blue light filter, protects the actual photoexidative damage as well. And what the recent research has also shown 
is that lutein, in particular, uh, accumulates in brain tissue. So what you have here are two pie charts on the left, the pie chart showing you what the American sort of pattern of uh, carotenoid consumption is. So among all the carotenoids that we consume, uh, beta carotene and lycopene and other carotenoids are a bigger feature of our diets. Lutein, on the other hand, is about the fourth or fifth largest you know, carotenoid among the carotenoids we consume. And yet, when you look at brain tissue, uh, lutein in particular accounts for up to 60% of the carotenoids you find in brain. So there's a very selective accumulation of this particular carotenoid that's taking place in the human brain. And then when you look at infant brain tissue, uh, we can see that lutein, relative to other carotenoids, is, in, is, is accumulated uh, to up to two to three-fold greater amounts. Uh, and this is in, in, in the region of the brain that we've already talked about a little bit, the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. So we think that lutein in particular could be playing an important role uh, in the function of these structures. I would just like to point out that this bar graph is perhaps one of the saddest slides you may ever see too, because this, these data are actually human infants that died uh, before 18 months of life, and their parents of these families, of course, devastated donated their brains to science. And we wouldn't have known uh, that the, of the nutritional composition of these, uh, of these brain tissues in humans, in these infants, if that happened. So I just want to highlight that uh, it's, it's actually really important, meaningful data that's emerged from really rich, an unfortunate uh, you know, occurrence in life. What's the, but from perspective of understanding lutein's implications for cognitive health, one of the innovative <coughs> advantages we have is that lutein, because it accumulates in the eye, has been shown to strongly correlate with what's in brain tissue. Uh, and that's been done using non-human primate brains, that's been done using human geriatric brain tissue after death. Uh, so we know that what's in the eye predicts what's in the brain. Uh, and we can non-invasively assess lutein uh, in the eye. So we've been uh, using a technique called uh, op uh, hyperchromatic cryptophotometry. It's a 20 minute assessment. It's used by optometrists, optometrists all over the world, especially looking at studying age-related macular degeneration. Uh, so what we've been doing is looking at assessing lutein in the eye as a proxy for lutein in the brain and then really understanding what are the implications for cognition and brain in childhood. So the first study we did really just established the reliability of this approach over two sessions in children and we learned that it was a reliable approach. After doing that, we looked at you know, the, the macular pigment optical density, which is a measure of lutein in the eye in relation to relational memory performance and cognitive function. So this is a relational memory task that we conduct in our laboratory. This is developed by Neil Cohen's lab at the University of Illinois. It's a relational memory task, in, in which case the participants are asked to look at a computer screen. They see these friendly monsters or creatures on the screen, uh, sort of arranged different, in different patterns on the screen. Uh, and they're basically asked to study the location of these different creatures for 10 seconds. After that, the creatures go back to the top of the screen, and then the participants are asked to recreate the spatial layout. In the process of doing this, participants make a variety of different errors, uh, or spatial memory errors, uh, in terms of distance, uh, but also in terms of angles. Uh, so radiant differences, and we also know they make certain mistakes in terms of the way they swap the different creatures. And the, you can get the different error metrics from this task, and they, that tells us about hippocampal function, uh, because all these errors are because of errors in relational ability. So the ability of children to associate the spatial location with the creature, but also the relationships to the screen items. And what we learned was that children who have greater MPOD, or greater lutein status in the eye, essentially, regardless of which error metric we're studying, tend to do better on these uh, in, in terms of relational memory uh, even after we've adjusted for important factors like central adiposity, aerobic fitness, IQ, socioeconomic status. Uh, so this was very interesting to us and one of the first data sets that really again got us going in terms of you know, pursuing this further with other uh, cognitive tasks. Uh, in addition to the relational memory task, we've also seen this for uh, the attentional control task that I mentioned earlier, the Erickson Planker task, where children with higher MP MPOD do, do better in, relation, in, in the attentional control task especially in a condition that, has, that requires more uh, cognitive demand. Uh, we, but what's interesting when you merge the EEG data that we collected along with it is that you learn that they're, they're actually doing this in a very efficient way. They're, the children with higher MPOD are not only doing better in terms of accuracy, but they're doing this while dedicating lower attentional resources. You can see a lower P3 amplitude uh, in these children. So they have essentially less engagement uh, in terms of neural resources, but they perform more, you know, more accurately, suggesting that they're more, becoming more, they're more ne uh, neurally efficient when they do this task if they have higher MPOD. But of course, I guess the, the question that we really want to address, because all the data I've shown you so far is correlational, that data set, those data sets, you know, however novel, have their limitations. Uh, we really wanted to understand is whether you can actually change MPOD in children's uh, maculas over, you know, with an intervention approach. <coughs> it's been shown in adults over and over again, but nobody had done this in children before. Uh, so it took us five years, but we finally did a randomized control trial that you know, supplemented uh, lutein 
uh, and along the DHA in his children over the course of a nine month period. And we looked at MPOD in the eye in his kids and we had a control group uh, that was receiving a non-caloric placebo. And what we did, what we observed was that you can change lutein status in the eye in the intervention control, in the intervention children. You can see that over the course of a nine month period. In addition to that, um, you can actually see benefits also for relational memory performance and also uh, as performance during an Eric D. Flanker task, uh, showing that it, essentially the children in the intervention group uh, are likely to preserve their you know, reaction time as they go from easier trials to more difficult trials. Like, so they essentially have less interference. Uh, so we see benefits of lutein supplementation not only in the eye, but also for the cognitive function uh, related to it. And we have related those two together where you can see that the children who gain of greater gains in MPOD tend to do better uh, on these tasks. And this is, a, this is a currently in preparation. Uh, hopefully we can get this off my desk uh, in the spring. So this is my last slide. I'm just gonna mention that earlier I talked about policy for physical activity guidelines. And this is a dietary guidelines for Americans. Uh, and uh, currently the committee's meeting uh, for, the re for the current guidelines. Uh, and as you can see, the nutritional guidelines for Americans, we're not recognizing uh, any, you know, brain health and cognitive health is really not on the radar. This is a serious concern you consider the proportion of our population that is going to encounter dementia or cognitive impairment uh, as we have an aging population. And re really from a public health standpoint, a public policy standpoint, we don't really have good information to share uh, with, our, uh, with our public. So thank you so much for listening to me. I'm happy to take questions if we have time. Afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much to Hannah for that introduction. And I'd also like to thank Hannah and Richard for inviting me along to, to speak with you all this afternoon. And also, as the Physiological Society rep at Loughborough University, I'd also like to thank them for, for advertising uh, today's session to you all. So, what I'd like to speak to you today about is before giving a little bit of a brief overview of nitrate supplementation, which really has emerged over the last decade as, as a commonly used supplement to try and boost athletic performance. But what I really want to focus on today in terms of developing our understanding of the exercise settings or conditions in which nitrate supplementation might be more or less effective at boosting performance, because like many supplements, it doesn't work in, in all situations. And also to provide a little bit of an overview of the potential mechanisms by which nitrate supplementation might be at the beginning. So the reason that we administer nitrate in dietary sources, we're ultimately interested in increasing the synthesis and bioavailability of nitric oxide gas. And so the way that we commonly do this is by feeding people nitrate-rich foods. And so beetroot juice has become the most commonly used uh, food source of inorganic nitrate. But nitrate is present in green leafy vegetables also, like spinach, rocket is a particularly high source, lettuce, celery, cress, and so on. You can also administer nitrate in the form of, of nitrate salts, and there have been some studies which have used this approach. But when you compare a food source of nitrate versus a, a, a sodium or potassium nitrate salt on the same equal molar basis, it seems that the food source is more effective at improving cardiovascular responses and also exercise responses. So in keeping with the message that we've heard a bit in today's session, the, the food first approach appears to be best in this respect. So to provide a little bit of background to my talk, I'm firstly going to take you for a little bit of a walk along this so-called nitrate nitrite NO pathway. And so after we ingest nitrates, we'll use beetroot as, as the example in, in this figure, it'll obviously pass down into the stomach and then eventually into the systemic circulation. When this nitrate-rich blood then passes into the salivary glands, the salivary glands actively uptake and concentrate nitrate. And there's a, a transporter on the <coughs> salivary glands called sialin, which does this process for us. This nitrate-rich saliva then passes into the oral cavity 
wherein we have oral bacteria on the surface of our tongue which reduce the nitrate down into nitrite. And this really is a critical step in this whole metabolic pathway because as humans we have quite a limited ability to metabolize nitrate. So we really do depend on this symbiotic relationship we, that we share with the oral microflora. So for anyone who is interested in using nitrate as an intervention to boost either cardiovascular function or exercise responses, which I'm going to focus on in today's talk, it really is integral that you avoid the use of antibacterial mouthwashes with any participants you might want to use, because that will largely abolish any effect. So once the bacteria have done their job for us and produced nitrite, this is then ingested and can undergo second pass metabolism. And so we know that a large fraction of the nitrite that is ingested then is reduced into nitric oxide and other in reactive nitrogen intermediates within the acidic environment in the stomach. But it's also clear now that a portion of this nitrite will pass into the systemic circulation and will also be concentrated in skeletal muscle tissues as well. So why are we interested in trying to boost nitric oxide through nutritional in interventions? Well, nitric oxide is now recognized as being implicated in a whole array of physiological processes. So classically, it was shown that nitric oxide could promote vasodilation, allowing an increase in tissue perfusion. That was what it was first recognized as doing. But it's now recognized that nitric oxide has positive impact on a variety of physiological processes. So from a metabolic standpoint, it's known to have a positive influence on mitochondrial restoration responses. It's also implicated, for example, in the insulin independent uptake of glucose into tissue. And nitric oxide can also have a positive influence on the contractile apparatus within the skeletal muscle as well. So it can interact with actin, myosin, the calcium release channels, and also the calcium T ATPase pump, which I'm going to talk about a little bit in today's session as well. And so all of these uh, physiological enhancements after nitrate supplementation have led to two real uh, big observations after nitrate supplementation that this is most recognized for in an exercise context. The, the first one being an improvement, particularly in endurance exercise performance. So this is what classically nitrate supplementation has been shown to enhance. It's also been shown to improve exercise economy. So studies have shown that nitrate supplementation can lower the oxygen and by extension the energy cost of cycling or running at a given sub-maximal work intensity. So that provides a little bit of background to, to nitrate supplementation and it, it's been shown to boost exercise economy and performance. So after those initial studies were conducted, the, the real focus in this field then started to turn towards resolving the potential underlying mechanisms by which nitrate supplementation might be ergogenic. And one of the first studies in this respect was, was this paper published back in 2011 by Larson and colleagues. And what they did in this study is they supplemented the diet of individuals for a few days with, with sodium nitrate. They obtained skeletal muscle biopsies and they isolated the mitochondrial pellet to assess mitochondrial respiration. And what they observed is that after nitrate supplementation, there was an increase in this mitochondrial P2O ratio. And the mitochondrial P2O ratio is an indicator of mitochondrial respiratory fit efficiency. So it's telling us how much oxygen is it costing us to resynthesize ADP back into ATP. So essentially, the higher this is, the less oxygen it's costing us to resynthesize ATP in the mitochondria. And as you can see quite clearly in this study, this was elevated after nitrate supplementation. So mitochondrial respiratory efficiency was effectively enhanced after nitrate supplementation. And interestingly, what these authors observed in this study was that the, the improvement in the mitochondrial P2O ratio was correlated with a reduction in exercise economy. So those individuals who had the biggest improvement in mitochondrial respiratory efficiency seemed to present with the greatest improvement in exercise economy. So these preliminary data suggested that the mitochondria might be a key site uh, of the mechanism by which nitrate supplementation might be improving exercise economy and, and exercise performance. However, in the years that have followed uh, from this uh, work of Larson, there's been a few papers that have actually challenged this notion. And this is one of the, the most important in this respect. This was published by Whitfield back in 2016 in Journal of Physiology. So the first thing I'd like to draw your attention to is this figure on the left. This is where they measured pulmonary oxygen uptake in individual cycling at an intensity corresponding to 70% of the VO2 peak. 
And you can see in the nitrate conditions, or in the, in the black bar, that the oxygen cost of exercise was indeed lower after nitrate supplementation. However, when these authors looked at mitochondrial respiratory efficiency, you can see that there was no difference between the nitrate condition uh, compared to the placebo condition. And this was also evident in the subsarcolemma mit mitochondrial uh, populations, as well as the intermyofibrillar mitochondrial populations as well. So these data actually challenge the notion that nitrate supplementation is improving exercise economy and exercise performance through a mitochondrial mechanism. And so at a similar time to the Larson paper, we were also interested in trying to explore what might be the mechanism. Is it to do with the mitochondria or is it to do with other aspects within the skeletal muscle that might be underpinning this? And so we used uh, 31 phosphorus magnetic resonance spectroscopy to delve a little bit further into muscle metabolism. And this technique allows you to measure the turnover of intramuscular phosphorus metabolites during muscle contraction. So essentially the individual will lie prone on an MR scanner bed, they're then shifted into the bore of the MRI scanner, and they perform some knee extensor exercise by lifting non-magnetic weights. And using this technique, what you can do is you can estimate ATP turnover through oxidative metabolism, through phosphocreatine hydrolysis, and through anaerobic glycolysis. And then if you sum these three up, it gives you an insight then into the total ATP turnover rate in human skeletal muscle contraction. And what we observed in this study is if you look at the the white bars which show the nitrate response, the ATP turnover through oxidative metabolism and phosphocreatine hydrolysis uh, was lower. There wasn't a significant change in glycolysis, but nonetheless, when you added all these three up, the total ATP turnover rate was actually lower after nitrate supplementation. And this is doing constant work rate exercise. So this is telling us it's costing us less ATP turnover and therefore less um, energy to contract the muscle at the same power output. So essentially, muscle contractile efficiency has been enhanced. And so the question then becomes, and this is something I became very interested in after our study uh, using the MRI uh, technique, is to try and probe what might be the mechanism by which nitrate supplementation is lowering the ATP turnover rate in the contracting skeletal muscle. And if you consider the things that consume ATP when the muscle is contracting, there's really three candidates in that respect. <coughs> you have the sodium potassium ATPs, we have the acromyosin ATPase, which is involved in cross-bridge cycling, and we have the calcium ATPase, which actively pumps calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum after we've performed the contraction. So we can essentially rule the sodium potassium ATPase out as being a large contributor to this, because it's known that it's only around about 7% of the total ATP turnover that's consumed by the sodium potassium ATPase. So that really narrows this down into two large candidate mechanisms. And the one that's received the most attention in the research to date, and what I'm going to focus on in, in the next few slides, is, is calcium handling with, within the uh, skeletal muscle tissue. And so the first study that looked at the role of, of nitrate supplementation on, on calcium handling was conducted by Hernandez and colleagues back in, in 2012, published in Journal of Physiology. And they used an animal model here where they supplemented the diet of, of mice for, for seven days with, with sodium nitrate. They then injected the single muscle fibers, isolated from an FDB muscle, with a calcium fluorescent indicator. And then they evoked contractions at a variety of different contraction frequencies. And what you can see on the figure there on the top left, the nitrate responses are shown in, in the white circles here, is that across the, the range of contraction frequencies that they evoked, there was an increase in cytosolic calcium <coughs> concentration after nitrate supplementation. And this then translated into an increase in both twitch and tetanic force production up to 50 hertz of stimulation. And while there wasn't an increase in force production at the higher contraction frequencies, what the authors did observe was a more rapid rate of force development at these higher contraction frequencies. But while these data offered a lot of insight into nitrate and its potential mechanism within the skeletal muscle, there were some limitations with this, this work that needed some follow-up investigation. So the principal limitation of these experiments were, was that the experiments were conducted <coughs> at an extracellular PO2 of 95% oxygen. So to help put that into context for you, the air around us now is having around about 21% oxygen. 
in human skeletal muscle performing intense muscular contractions, that's going to drop down to around about 2% oxygen. Okay, so the, these experiments were conducted at ex extremely high oxygen levels, which are clearly unphysiological. It's also unclear whether these improvements in single evoked force production and calcium release within the skeletal muscle would also be manifested in repeated muscle contractions and would actually lead to an improvement in skeletal muscle fatigue resistance. And so to address some of these important and outstanding research questions, I, I was lucky enough to spend some time with Professor Mike Holden's lab in the University of California, San Diego, and I, I went and, and spent the summer out there with Mike and his team, and so I, I owe a lot of gratitude to Professor Mike Hogan, Dr. Leah Noviera, Paul Gandra, and Amy Siha, who, who helped with a lot of these experiments that, are, that I'm about to show you now. And this is a really nice model. Again, we used the, the mouse model where we isolated the FDD muscle from the foot. We then obtained single intact myocytes and we were able to micro-inject these with a calcium fluorescent indicator. So specifically we used Pura 2 in this. And this model then allows you to simultaneously measure evoked isometric tension and intracellular calcium concentration, both during contractions and in the intervening recovery period. So we're really able then to probe how nitrate supplementation or nitrite administration in this example would influence calcium handling in, in skeletal muscle tissue. And so the way we assessed fatigue in this model is that we isolated the fiber and we evoked contractions and we increased the contraction frequency every two minutes until the fiber reached an isometric tension that corresponded to 50% of that that was present on the first contraction. We control the PO2 in the extracellular uh, fluid surrounding the fibers precisely, so this was held constant at 2% oxygen throughout these experiments. And these experiments were completed in a controlled condition, so just ring a solution alone, as well as ring a solution plus 100 micromolar of, of sodium nitrite. And so what did we find with these experiments? So the first thing that we observed is when we incubated the fiber for one hour with 100 micromolar of, of uh, sodium nitrite, we observed a significant improvement in, in fatigue resistance. So it took longer for the, the muscle fiber to become fatigued after nitrite administration at 2% oxygen. And this improvement, interestingly, was around about 20%, which is consistent with the improvement in exercise capacity a human will present with when we ask them to cycle to exhaustion. So similar improvements in, in this model compared to, to what we observed in, in a human performing running or cycling exercise. With regard to the intramuscular calcium handling processes, we observed essentially a reduction in calcium accumulation during this fatigue-inducing contraction protocol. And specifically, what we observed, the, the nitrite responses on these figures are shown in the white circles, the control is shown in the black circles. So this is the peak of cytosolic calcium concentration during the contraction itself. There was no difference between nitrite and the control condition in the, the peak calcium concentration. When we look at basal calcium concentration, you can see clearly this is increasing throughout the contraction protocol in both the control and the nitrite condition. And what this rep represents is that this is reflecting that this, the potassium ATPase is becoming impaired. So it's not able to actively pump the calcium back into the sarcoplasm of reticulum. And this is a hallmark of skeletal muscle fatigue, which interferes in particular with, with skeletal muscle relaxation. But after 100 seconds into the fatigue-inducing contraction protocol, the basal calcium accumulation was attenuated in the sodium nitrite condition compared to the control condition. So it appears that one of the mechanisms by which nitrite administration, uh, as would be uh, manifest after nitrate supplementation, is that it allows <coughs> an improvement in skeletal muscle calcium handling. And this is one of the mechanisms that we now believe is responsible for potentially the ergogenic effects after nitrate supplementation. What we also wanted to do to try and highlight the importance of conducting experiments at a physiological PO2 is that we also performed some times of fatigue runs when we had 20% oxygen. So this was an ambient uh, uh, oxygenation status, if you like. And interestingly, what we observed when we performed these experiments is that in all of the fibers that we assessed, the actual time to fatigue was attained more rapidly after nitrite administration. So it appears that if you give nitrite after a hyperoxygenated environment, 
you're actually going to compromise skeletal muscle fatigue development. And one of the reasons that we believe this is the case is that you've got an increased production of, production of reactive oxygen species in these reactive, uh, in these more hyperoxygenated environments. And this will serve to mimic, mimic, um, uh, sorry, mimic it'll scavenge nitric oxide, and it will also lead to the production of more powerful oxidants like peroxynitrite, which will, which will in interfere with muscle contraction of processes. And so these observations really are important for these types of experiments, highlighting the importance of actually running these at a, a PO2, which actually is closer to that in human muscle uh, in vivo, because it really can affect the outcomes of your findings from, from these experiments. And so upon my return from uh, the US in Professor Hogan's lab, I wanted to try and replicate then some of these experiments as close as I could in, in human skeletal muscle. And so what we did, this was part of Stuart Coxedge, is um, uh, masters by research work. And, and Stuart is now a, a PhD student with me at Loughborough. And you can see how happy he is by that experience based on his profile <laughs> picture. And what we were interested in doing in these sets of experiments is basically trying to manipulate skeletal muscle oxygenation. And the way we did this was by ma manipulating the fraction of inspired gas that people were inhaling. So we have people inhaling normoxic air, shown in the gray uh, circles in this figure here. This was obviously 21% oxygen. We have people inhaling a hypoxic gas mixture, so 14.5% oxygen, shown in the black circles. And we have people inhaling a hyperoxic gas mixture. So this was 50% oxygen on, on this occasion. And what we have here on the y-axis is this is tissue oxygenation index, and this was derived using multiple channel ne near infrared spectroscopy. And so what you can see quite clearly is during the exercise responses, you can see this is the hyperoxia, this is the normoxia, and this is hypoxia. So we were able to achieve differences in skeletal muscle oxygenation in humans performing exercise. And of course, this had implications for, for exercise capacity, where this was improved with a hyperoxic gas inhalation and impaired with a hypoxic gas stimulation. But what we were then interested in is looking at is how would nitrate supplementation influence performance in these different settings? And what we hypothesized is that since the reduction of nitrite into nitric oxide is, is potentiated in acidosis and hypoxia, we, had, we hypothesized this would be greatest when individuals were breathing a hypoxic gas mixture, intermediate when they were breathing normoxia, and attenuated or at its lowest level when they were breathing a hyperoxic gas mixture. And so what did we find? So the, the results of the time for fatigue are on the screen in front of you. So this was a, a severe intensity cycling test to, to the limit of tolerance. So if you have a look at the center two bars, this was in normoxia. So nitrate supplementation improved exercise capacity with a, a moderate effect size of 0.61. In hyperoxia, it didn't improve exercise capacity, with only a very small effect size there, but the greatest effect was manifest in a hyperoxic uh, setting, where the effect size was quite large, being uh, 1.13. So this indicates that the efficacy of nitrate supplementation to improve exercise performance appears to be linked to the degree of skeletal muscle deoxygenation. And to, to, to support that argument a little bit further, when we looked at the hypoxic trial alone, and we measured the tissue oxygenation index at the point of exhaustion, and how this influenced the improvement in performance with nitrate supplementation, what we observed is that those individuals who became most deoxygenated presented with the biggest improvement in exercise capacity following nitrate supplementation. So it appears that nitrate supplementation is going to be most beneficial in settings where the muscle becomes more deoxygenated. And that's why a lot of people have become interested in now shifting nitrate supplementation into patient populations, particularly ones who are going to develop hypoxic skeletal muscle. So with that issue in mind, that nitrate supplementation might be more effective at improving exercise capacity in hypoxic settings, in terms of translating this into athlete performance, one of the most common settings that this might be useful for is, is altitude training. Because we know that a lot of endurance athletes will go away to altitude to try and maximize endurance training adaptations. But it's important to stress that this study conducted by Stuart and us and several others, most of them have been conducted at a level which would be equivalent to around about 2,800, 3,000 meters above sea level. Okay? But one of the things that we know about altitude training camps is that Elite athletes are not really going to go to altitude training camps that are above 2,400 meters. 
So we've become interested in asking the question, what does this actually mean for performance at altitude equivalents where athletes actually go for their training camps? And so these are some unpublished observations from George Robinson's uh, PhD. So I've obviously become a much better supervisor over the years. George looks a lot happier. Um, this was at the start of his PhD. He might not be so happy now, but he is approaching the end of this. So, so this is some work that uh, I'm leading at uh, Loughborough University with, with Lewis James and, and Sophie Taylor as well, which is, which is funded by UK Athletics and, and the English Institute of Sport. And this is George's first PhD study where We've recruited a group of endurance trained individuals, so their baseline VO2 peak is around about 60 mils per kg per minute. And we've had these individuals perform a high intensity intermittent running session that is similar to what endurance athletes will perform at altitude. So 90 seconds on at 110% of peak treadmill velocity, interspersed with 60 seconds of passive recovery, and they repeat this until they become exhausted. In this study, we've created three different FiO2 conditions. So we have 20.9% oxygen, so this is a sea level condition. We have 18.3% oxygen, so this is equivalent to 1,200 meters, which is what Sedona is in, in Arizona, in the US. And we have 15.8% oxygen, which is 2,400 meters, which is what the 10 in Kenya is. And the reason that we've selected these two altitude exposures specifically are these are two camps that UK Athletics have been using routinely for the last few years. And so what did we find with regard to, to exercise tolerance? So naturally the beetroot responses are in, in the purple bars. And while there were some small increments in, in performance, none of these attained statistical significance, even as we move this to de greater degrees of hypoxia. So the important thing to bear in mind here is that if you show in a lab-based study that nitric supplementation can improve exercise capacity at, at moderate to high altitude, it seems when you try and translate this to an altitude where athletes will actually go for their training camps, it might not necessarily translate into meaningful in performance improvements. But the other thing I'd like to raise as well with this study is that these individuals were fitter than what we've used in some of our previous studies. So they had 60 mils per kg per minute. In the previous study I showed you uh, Stewart's MS work, the VO2 peak there was around about 45 to 50 uh, mils per kg per minute. So one of the things that's becoming increasingly clear now in the nitrate field, and again, as I said at the start, supplements seem to work in certain circumstances, but they don't seem to work in all circumstances. And what's becoming increasingly apparent now with nitrate supplementation is it doesn't seem to work as well at boosting endurance performance in already well-trained endurance athletes. And perhaps the best example of this is these nice data published by Simone Pacelli back in, in 2015. And what they did in this study is they had individuals perform a three kilometer running time trial. And they, they recruited quite a large group of participants and they partitioned these out into different groups based on their baseline aerobic fitness. So they had a group with low aerobic fitness, with moderate aerobic fitness, and with a high aerobic fitness. And what you can see is an improvement in the three kilometer uh, running time trial performance in both the low and the moderate fitness group, but there was no enhancement in endurance performance in the high aerobic fitness group. And when they plotted the VO2 peak, which is what they based their aerobic <coughs> fitness groups on, against the improvement in their time to, time to complete this three kilometer running task, you saw that as the individual's VO2 peak increased, the magnitude of improvement <coughs> with nitrate became less and less. So again, this supports the notion that endurance-trained athletes are less responsive to nitrate supplementation. And so why might this be the case? And one of the reasons we believe this might be the case is due to the phenotype that well-trained endurance athletes present with. So we know that very well-trained endurance athletes have a higher percentage of type 1 slow twitch muscle. They have greater capillarization and increases in oxygenation during exercise. And they have greater oxidative metabolism and a reduction in glycolytic metabolism. Now all of these factors would be expected to interfere with this reduction of nitrite down into nitric oxide because of course we know this reaction is potentiated in acidosis and hypoxia. So endurance trained muscle is not conducive to facilitating this reaction. On the other hand, individuals who present with a more glycolytic phenotype would be expected to augment this reduction of <coughs> nitrite down into nitric oxide. And there's some very interesting animal data, at least at the moment, <coughs> showing that 
if you isolate fast twitch muscle, slow twitch muscle, fast twitch muscle presents with a greater force production after nitrate supplementation, slow twitch muscle doesn't. They've also shown that there's a preferential distribution of blood flow to fast twitch muscle fibers, but not to slow twitch muscle fibers. So we've become interested very recently in trying to look at addressing some of these issues in, in human models. And I want to present some, some data that was published earlier this year. This is a very nice review paper by Wickham and Lawrence Freaks, looking at the potential sex differences in, in male and female physiology and how this might influence the efficacy of nitrate to, to improve performance. And what I want to draw your attention to is this box highlighted in red, looking at skeletal muscle fiber type responses. And if you have a look at males, relative their feet to their female counterparts, they typically present with more type 2 glycolytic fibers, and they typically have lower skeletal muscle capillarization. Conversely, females seem to have a lower, a higher sort of concentration or a percentage of type 1 muscle fibers, and a greater skeletal muscle capillarization. So on this basis, you might expect that males would respond more positively to nitrate supplementation than females. And this is something that we've been interested in exploring. And so in George's latest PhD study, which is really close to finishing now, we've been collecting muscle biopsy samples from a range of different human participants. And we're interested in performing some uh, immune histochemistry to to resolve their percentage of type 1 slow twitch and type 2 fast twitch muscle fibers. So we can see, do those individuals who present with a more glycolytic phenotype observe a better sprint response after nitrate supplementation? And we're also doing some other markers such as mitochondrial respiration and content to, to lend some more insight into the phenotype of the individuals. And we haven't crunched through all the numbers yet, but just to show you some preliminary unpublished data, we've now finished the, the male group, and when we look at males who performed a 40 meter sprint. When we measure the instantaneous velocity at 10, 10 meters during the sprint, the males are presenting with a significant improvement in instantaneous velocity in the region of around about 1% after, after nitrate supplementation. We haven't quite finished the, all the female analysis yet, but it's looking like the females aren't responding as positively to nitrate supplementation. So these data offer some preliminary evidence to support the notion that Individuals who present with a more glycolytic phenotype might respond more positively to nitrate supplementation. But of course, these are very preliminary data, so I have to acknowledge that, that we need to analyze all the data before we can make uh, any firm conclusions in this respect. <coughs> so to summarize what, what I've covered in, in my session today with you, I've told you that nitrate supplementation can improve exercise economy and endurance performance in recreationally active individuals but not necessarily in endurance trained individuals. So the efficacy of nitrate to improve at least endurance performance seems to be linked to the baseline fitness of the individuals. The latest data is suggesting that some of the mechanisms that might underpin these improvements are linked to improvements in skeletal muscle calcium handling. But of course, these have largely been done in animal models and now work needs to be done in human skeletal muscle to try and see whether these mechanisms also hold true in human skeletal muscle. It seems to be that the ergogenic effects of nitrate supplementation are linked to the degree of skeletal muscle deoxygenation. So nitrate supplementation appears to be <coughs> ergogenic, particularly once you go about 3,000 meters in altitude terms, but when you bring it back down to more uh, ecologically valid altitudes where athletes might go to camp, it doesn't seem to be quite as effective. And that's why a lot of individuals have started to move nitrate now into people who have, for example, peripheral vascular disease, where they're really ischemic at the level of the skeletal muscle. A lot of Jason Allen's work has shown that nitrate is very effective in these individuals. And, and finally, nitrate supplementation appears to have the potential to enhance maximal exercise performance in individuals who present with a, a more glycolytic phenotype. And some preliminary evidence of ours which supports this notion is that nitrate seems to be more effective at boosting sprint performance in males compared to, to females. But of course, further research is needed to, to verify this uh, in, in further studies as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I'd like to thank Hannah and Richard again for the invitation. And I'm very happy to take any questions if we have time.
Yeah, there have been some trials done in COPD. I think there's been about three done. One showed that you could see improvements in performance in terms of six minute walk test if you judge performance in these patients, but the other two didn't show an effect. In terms of the clinical populations, it seems if the issue is, you can't say the disease is exclusively vasculature because there's usually comorbidities, but if the large problem of the disease is a vascular disease, nitrate supplementation has potential to be beneficial. So peripheral artery disease, heart failure, there's, there are some studies out there supporting that. If it's a respiratory disease, doesn't seem to work as well. Also metabolic diseases, there's no evidence out there showing in all the trials to date that nitrate supplementation can improve health outcomes in diabetic populations. So with regard to clinical population, it depends on what the disease is, it, it appears. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the challenge with the whole foods is you is the amount you would need to eat to get the equivalent amount as in a beetroot shot. So to, to, to have the equivalent of one beetroot shot now, which is about six, uh, six millimoles, you'd probably have to eat about 250 grams of, of lettuce. So the challenge with it is, is, is getting that volume of food into someone. That's, that's the challenge. If you could take that on board, then, then you would be able to achieve some, some benefits. And, and as I said, if you look at food sources versus the, the sodium nitrate option, when they fed people spinach and, and other vegetables at an equivalent nitrate um, dose as sodium nitrate, they've seen bigger improvements in plasma nitrite, blood pressure reductions, and also improvements in exercise economy. So certainly compared to the salt, food is better, but the challenge with the food option is being able to eat 250 grams of, of lettuce is quite challenging in, in a survey. Yeah, that, that's a good question. And I know people are actively investigating that at the moment. So the, the people who present with a better nitrate reducer, so there's obviously various <coughs> bacteria in the oral cavity, not all of which are good nitrate reducers. So individuals who have more nitrate uh, reducing species respond better, it appears, to nitrate supplementation. And I know there's a lot of groups now looking at how these change in different uh, disease populations, also with aging, for example. So, so that will become available, I'm sure, in the next couple of years, those data. Yeah. And in terms of the administration of, of the different forms in which nitrate is, is delivered, yes. is different than that Yeah, no, that, that's a fair point. There is there is a historical stigma that surrounds ingestion of nitrate, and yeah, there is that link to potential carcinogenic S nitrosamine formation. But particularly when you administer it in a vegetable form, you're ingesting other things like poly polyphenols, antioxidant vitamins, that drive the chemistry more towards NO production and less towards the nitrosamine formation. And to give you a few examples of that, human breast milk is high in nitrate and nitrite, so why would we conserve something that would, would potentially poison our children? You look at some of the people who have the highest intakes of nitrate in the diet, the Mediterraneans, the Japanese, they live longest. And you look at the recent position statements by the World Health Organization, and they say that there's now not enough firm evidence to suggest that that link is, is as credible as it once was. So further research is needed to, to try and fully rule that out, but the position on it has changed since since the 70s. I think there was one more. If we have time, I don't know. Yeah, so one of the things that I'm thinking is, is obviously in, that was a single fiber model that I used. So in a single fiber model, you control how much that muscle fiber contracts. In a human skeletal muscle, obviously what happens is as fibers start to become fatigued during exercise, you replace them with higher order fibers. So if you can improve calcium handling in fibers that are recruited earlier in an exercise task, it will delay the recruitment of, adi of additional less efficient muscle fibers. 
So I think that's one of the key mechanisms that we think might be responsible for how calcium might translate into improvements in performance. But we do really need to start to move this now into, into human skeletal muscle to look at that in, in more detail. Thank you. studies that I worked on during my PhD thesis, um, and I defended earlier this year. So um, from the start, so we, it's, it's well known that the, uh, that the older population is expanding, and uh, it's, uh, it's been estimated that uh, the older population is uh, expected to triple in size by the year 2050. Uh, and this means that uh, in the year 2050, it's expected that about 2 billion uh, people worldwide will be over the age of 60, uh, 60 years old. So throughout the lifespan, uh, it's well known that there is a decline in muscle mass, and you can see that depicted here on this graph here at the bottom, on the bottom third. And this graph here shows um, that muscle mass declines by approximately 50% between the ages of 20 and 80 years of age. And generally speaking, throughout healthy aging, body mass is maintained. So the decrease in muscle tissue is actually replaced uh, by fat tissue. If we uh, have a look uh, or, or take a visual uh, look at this change by using uh, commuted, uh, computed tomography scans uh, in a younger individual at 26 years of age and an older individual at 76 years of age, you can clearly see this displacement of, uh, of, of the muscle with the fat. So uh, the muscle here is depicted uh, as the gray, uh, sorry, as the gray area here, and then. In the older individual, you can see that the muscle has shrunk clearly. You can also see that the amount of fat surrounding, or on the outside of the leg, surrounding the muscle has thickened, and also that the fat tissue has infiltrated the muscle groups. So this, so along with the loss of muscle mass, you can also see that the, the muscle, the quality of the muscle declines. And one uh, particular change in muscle quality that is known to occur with the loss of muscle mass is the loss of muscle strength. And this is important because when we lose muscle strength, our functional capacity also declines. And this means that older individuals with lower muscle strength are at risk of falling and fracturing a bone and becoming hospitalized. So we need to figure out ways, uh, sorry, so uh, in combination with the loss of uh, functional capacity uh, combined with the uh, expansion of our elderly population, uh, it places a, big, a large burden on not only the individual itself or themselves, but also the, uh, the healthcare systems. So we need to figure out ways to maintain uh, muscle mass throughout the lifespan. And we know that the ingestion <coughs> of food and dietary protein in particular provides a strong anabolic stimulus for muscle tissue. And so if we apply stable isotope amino acid tracers, which is uh, a technique that Dr. Bird also uses, uh, what we can do is we can infuse this intravenously in, uh, in human subjects uh, throughout, say, a test day. And what we get is a measure of muscle protein synthesis here it's uh, fractional synthetic rate, or FSR. It's muscle protein synthesis, though. Um, and what we see in healthy, younger individuals is that when we feed 20 grams of casein protein, so, uh, so a milk-derived protein, we see a robust increase in protein synthesis rates for the, for the few hours that follow the ingestion of protein. If we then compare this uh, to healthy, older individuals who ingest, ingest the exact same amount of protein, so 20 grams of protein, we see that protein synthesis rates are elevated, but you can see that there is a, a lower anabolic response to protein ingestion. And so this blunted anabolic response has been termed anabolic resistance, and it's thought to be one of the major contributors, major contributors of why uh, muscle is lost later in the lifespan. 
And so uh, this forms one of the, one of the key targets of uh, interventions that should be aimed at increasing muscle mass. So in other words, we want to figure out ways in which we can elevate protein synthesis rates in the older population. So we know that uh, performing physical activity and resistance exercise in particular is one of the most potent anabolic stimuli for muscle. And it's been shown now in a few labs around the world, but also from data uh, coming out of the lab I'm currently working in, that even a single bout of exercise increases muscle protein synthesis rates. And this study here was conducted in the healthy older population. So this just demonstrates that when older individuals perform exercise, that we can elevate protein synthesis rates. Um, one, of the key, um, one of the key effects that exercise has is that it sensitizes the skeletal muscle tissue to the anabolic properties of dietary protein ingestion. And this concept is illustrated quite nicely here in the study by Dan Moore in 2008. And so with the gray bars here, we have a condition where um, uh, one of the legs was in a rested state. The subjects ingest a protein. And you can see that protein synthesis rates become elevated and peak at around three hours after the protein is ingested before returning back down to levels that are close to the baseline levels. So in the opposite leg, uh, which is the black bar here, the subjects performed a heavy bout of resistance exercise training. And what you can see is that the same subjects ingested the protein. And you can see that in the exercise leg, the protein synthesis rates had an even more robust increase uh, in comparison to the fed uh, only group at rest. But importantly, at this five hour time point, you can see that the protein synthesis rates remain elevated. And this study just illustrates the power of combining resistance exercise training with adequate protein nutrition. So I wanted to take these concepts and I studied this uh, in my PhD thesis and I looked at uh, the different characteristics of dietary protein intake uh, to maximize muscle protein synthesis and muscle mass in the older population. So I started with probably the most obvious place to start, which is how much protein should be ingested by the older population. And what I did for this first study was uh, I also utilized the uh, uh, infusion of stable isotope amino acid tracers. So we recruited healthy older males to come into the lab for a single day test. They came in in a rested and fasted state and we, uh, we set up an intravenous amino acid infusion which lasted throughout the entire test day. After a few hours of the infusion, we had all the subjects perform uh, uh, about an hour-long bout of resistance exercise training, which was primarily focused on the lower body exercises, so leg extension, which you can see here, and also leg press. But the subjects also performed some upper body exercises to get the, the whole body exercise, uh, um, to, to, uh, yeah, to get a whole body exercise stimulus in this case. Um, after the exercise, we had the subjects randomized to ingest one of four drinks. And in the case of this study, subjects ingested either zero grams of protein or a water placebo, 15 grams of protein, 30 grams, or 45 grams of protein. And this amount of protein, or these amounts rather, were selected because these are the amounts that are typically found within normal meals in the, in the, in the regular diet. So one uh, technique that we utilize quite often in our lab is something called intrinsically labeled uh, proteins, or in the case that we normally use, it's intrinsically labeled milk protein. And what this technique is, is uh, we take a similar isotope amino acid tracer, so it's labeled and we can detect it uh, using some mass spectrometry inst instrumentation. So we take some of these amino acids, we go to uh, one of our uh, collaborators at, a, at an agricultural university in the Netherlands, and we infuse it into lactating dairy cows for five days straight. And here you can see I actually participated in one of these uh, experiments early on in my PhD. So during the five-day experiment, during the infusion, we collect all of the milk that the, uh, that the cows produce, and we, uh, we um, isolate some of the proteins in the case of the study where I was looking at the different amounts of protein, we isolated milk protein concentrate. And when we have our human subjects come into our lab, we can provide this milk. And this milk uh, provides the subject with an intact protein source, a dietary protein, which includes the amino acid isotope label. So when we measure blood samples or muscle biopsy samples, and we measure the tissue samples, we can actually detect that isotope label back and then we can calculate how the dietary protein is becoming available 
and also how it's being even utilized by the muscle tissue, so how it's even getting into newly synthesized muscle tissue. So as I said, I utilized this technique for the study uh, that I just described to figure out how much protein is required. And using this method, uh, combined with the uh, infusion of the isotope amino acids, we could tell how much of the dietary derived amino acids were becoming available. And so what we see is that uh, this is, um, what we see rather is that when uh, the dietary protein is ingested, about 60 to 75% of the ingested protein is becoming available. And so what this means is if I uh, express it here in absolute terms, is that we see uh, a, a dose response effect, meaning that the more protein that we provided the subjects, the more protein that they ingested, the more of the dietary derived amino acids were becoming available in the circulation, which could be utilized by the muscle tissue. I was most interested into what was happening in the level of the muscle, so we collected muscle tissue biopsies, which you can see in the picture on the left there. Uh, we did this immediately after the exercise session, so before they got uh, the randomized drink, and we took another biopsy six hours later. So during that six hour time point, or that six hour uh, time frame, we could calculate protein synthesis rates during exercise recovery. What we see on the graph here is that uh, there's a, a slight dose response effect in the, in the smaller doses of protein, but as we approach 30 and 45 grams even, this one is significantly different from the, from the water ingestion, we can see that 30 to 45 grams of protein is required to induce near maximal rates of protein synthesis during exercise recovery in healthy older men. And this is actually quite a bit more than what has been, uh, what has been found to be the maximal amount to stimulate protein synthesis rates in the younger population, which tends to hover around 20 grams uh, per meal. So just from a practical standpoint, 30 to 45 grams of protein can be found in one to two medium-sized chicken breasts or also five to eight large eggs. So you can imagine that some older individuals just don't have the ability to ingest meals with such large amounts of protein. So that was the next question that I... Uh, <laughs> I don't know how long that was, uh, that was all for. Yeah, so, the, so this was the next question that I... Uh, yeah, so this is the next question that I wanted to address. Um, for a study to follow up on, on this amount of dietary protein. Um, so we know that the ingestion of dietary protein not only provides the amino acid building blocks, which can support protein synthesis in the muscle, but it also, support, or it also provides the anabolic, sig uh, the anabolic signaling molecules, which can, which can trigger uh, an upregulation of protein synthesis. And Nick discussed this before, Dr. Bird discussed this before, that the amino acid leucine actually has distinct anabolic properties where it can, if we provide it to, to muscle tissue, it can elevate protein synthesis rates. So we took this concept into, uh, into uh, the next study, and I looked at how leucine co-ingestion would affect the anabolic response when smaller protein doses uh, were ingested. So to answer this question, I used the exact same uh, study design where I infused the amino acid tracers throughout the entire test day. We had older subjects who performed exercise. And then in this study, I compared the 15 gram, the ingestion of the 15 grams of protein from the first studies with an additional arm that ingested uh, the exact same amount of protein, which was 15 grams, but with an added 1.5 grams of leucine. So this group right here was ingesting three grams of leucine total, which is uh, a number that Dr. Bird uh, dem demonstrated in his presentation as being what is kind of the amount of leucine that might be ideal in a, uh, contained in a meal. So the first thing we looked at was uh, how the leucine was becoming available. So this is not tracers, this is just total leucine uh, in the circulation. And what you can clearly see is that when we fed the, uh, the 15 grams of protein with added leucine, we see a rapid spike in the amount of leucine that was in the circulation. And this elevated leucine content lasted uh, up until about 90 minutes before returning back down to concentrations that were similar uh, to the 15 gram dose. So you can see that clearly feeding that additional free leucine was effective at elevating uh, leucine concentrations to, to quite a high extent. So again, we're more interested in what's happening in the level of the muscle. So when we assessed the, uh, the muscle protein synthesis rates, we could see that elevating leucine concentrations by, by having uh, participants ingest free leucine, <coughs> that significantly increased uh, 
muscle protein synthesis rates during recovery. And so this signifies that perhaps uh, in older individuals that can't ingest such, uh, such protein-dense meals or, or perhaps large uh, meals, that we may see alternative strategies being that they could ingest free leucine along with their meals to sort of maximize the potential for that meal to, uh, to promote muscle, muscle maintenance. So we can apply uh, greater protein amounts, such as the 30 to 45 grams that I demonstrated in the first study, or added leucine during the main meals, so breakfast, lunch, and dinner, to try and maximize the anabolic effect of these meals. Uh, what's expected theoretically is that, let's say if we start on the left side of the graph here, if you ingest a protein-dense meal at breakfast, you would see an elevation in protein synthesis rates and a, a slight decrease in protein breakdown rates within the muscle. And this would result in a positive net protein balance, which is necessary for our muscles to, to kind of accumulate proteins. Uh, after a few hours after ingesting the breakfast meal, uh, we see protein synthesis rates would return back down to baseline levels, protein breakdown rates would go up, and we would be in a negative net protein balance, so we would be undergoing perhaps some, some protein loss from the muscle. And this would uh, theoretically continue with ingestion of each of the main meals throughout the day, up until dinner, where we typically ingest most of our protein, and you would see a big, net, uh, big positive net protein balance before protein synthesis rates would come down and then stay down at baseline throughout the rest of the, uh, throughout the evening. So our lab, a few years ago, uh, before I started working there, so I think uh, nine years ago or so, uh, hypothesized that we could probably use this overnight sleeping period as a good opportunity to try and elevate protein synthesis rates in the older population, to compensate for the uh, lower anabolic response to the meals that were ingested earlier in the day. So another way to visualize this is we speculated that feeding dietary protein immediately before sleep would provide amino acid uh, um, precursors that could stimulate protein synthesis rates during sleep. So we've now done a few studies on this topic and what I was mainly interested in is how we could combine exercise with pre-sleep protein ingestion. And so the study I'm just about to show you was, was addressing this question here. And so what we did is we recruited healthy older males the same population as the previous studies. Um, they came in for a single night test, but after a full day of standardized nutrition that we provided all their meals at breakfast, lunch, dinner, and a snack. So when they came in, we fed them their last meal, uh, their, their dinner meal rather, um, and then we, had, we separated them into two groups, one that remained rested, so they just stayed in the cafeteria and they just relaxed and read the paper and things like that. Uh, and then the other group uh, went upstairs to our lab and performed, again, for an hour-long session of resistance exercise training. So we fed all the subjects 40 grams of casein protein immediately before going to sleep, and then we infused stable isotope amino acid tracers throughout overnight sleep so we could assess protein synthesis rates uh, throughout the night. And we stayed up, as researchers, we stayed up and we went into the rooms and collected blood samples and these sorts of things. So um, this was actually the first study I worked on uh, during my PhD, and it was quite a... Yeah, quite a, uh, an interesting study because I was up all night and then uh, sleeping during the day and things like that. Um, so one of the questions we had with this kind of overnight concept, so when we're feeding protein before people go to sleep, is how the gastrointestinal tissues are functioning. So are we able to digest and absorb the dietary protein? And so actually when we combine the intrinsically labeled milk with that isotope label, with the infusion of, uh, of different isotopes, we can actually assess how the dietary protein is becoming available. And this is exogenous rate of appearance, so it's the rate of appearance from the dietary protein. And what you can see uh, at time zero, we fed the protein, and you can see that the rate of appearance basically immediately goes up, and it tends to stay up for the duration of the overnight sleeping period. And this signifies that the gastrointestinal tissues are indeed functioning normally and we can feed that protein and it's becoming available and it's getting released into the circulation and is then available for, uh, for muscle protein synthesis. Um, when I uh, assessed how much of the dietary protein was becoming available uh, in, the, in the rested group versus the exercise group, we see that about 55 to 60% becomes available and that there is no, uh, there is no modulating effect of, ex of performing exercise. 
So uh, we also took muscle biopsies in this study. We took it before, uh, we took one before they went to sleep, and then we took another one at uh, seven and a half hours later when they woke up. So as I said, we were there running the study. Uh, subjects were in their private rooms and we would wake them up and then about half an hour later we would take a muscle biopsy. So uh, yeah, it was, it was quite nice for the subjects, I guess, to, to wake up to a muscle biopsy. <laughs> Anyways, when we measured muscle protein synthesis rates, we see that the effects of um, performing exercise and ingesting protein uh, um, carries over to the overnight, uh, overnight sleeping process. As you can see, there's quite a robust increase uh, in overnight muscle protein synthesis rates uh, when the two are combined in comparison to, uh, to just ingesting protein. So, the, so overall, the, the studies that we have, uh, that we've performed in our lab have suggested that perhaps older individuals can make use of ingesting a protein-dense meal late in the evening, sometime before they go to sleep, in order to compensate for a low anabolic response to these meals um, ingested earlier in the day. So all the data I just showed was about the short-term responses, so the few hours after uh, ingesting a meal, and now I just want to turn to uh, more of the long-term response, which perhaps is more relevant for our main outcome, which is that we want to increase muscle mass and strength itself and not just induce anabolic responses within the muscle. So the way we do that is we typically have subjects come into the lab and we, uh, we have them carry out um, a structured resistance exercise training program and then we can provide some form of protein supplementation while they're, um, while they're undergoing the supervised uh, resistance training. And so I applied some of the concepts from the, from the short-term work into this long-term study and I wanted to look at how post-exercise and pre-sleep protein supplementation might further increase the muscle mass and strength, strength that was gained um, over a 12-week uh, resistance training program. So I recruited uh, from the same population, a healthy uh, older male population. Uh, they came in to perform whole body resistance exercise training um, with each session, with each session again being a full body exercise session. Again, we focused on the leg press and leg extension that was performed on every single session. Um, there was three sessions per week, I should say. And then we had upper body exercises. So we had the chest press and lat pull down. This is a push and a pull exercise that we paired. And we had the shoulder press and horizontal row that we paired. And then we rotated these upper body exercises throughout the training pro program. Uh, we took a number of measurements uh, of muscle mass. So we took a, a CT scan from the upper thigh. We took a muscle biopsy from the upper thigh. We took a whole body DEXA scan to assess body composition changes. And we assessed changes in maximal strength. So um, the two groups that we uh, had in this study were uh, a protein group, which included 21 older individuals, and the beverage that uh, this group ingested contained 20 grams of whey protein, again, a milk-derived protein, uh, which, is, which is rapidly digested, uh, combined with one gram of free leucine. So this aligns with that, uh, the data on, on, on free leucine co-ingestion that, that I presented a few slides ago. In the placebo group, we had 20 subjects, and they ingested a beverage that was matched for energy to the protein group, but it contained absolutely no protein. So here's a, an, an overview of, uh, of um, uh, just the representation of what an average week of the study looked like. So as I said, the subjects performed resistance training uh, in the mornings on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and we made sure to progress the exercise training by assessing or estimating uh, strength on each Friday to make sure that the, that the, um, uh, that the exercise was adequate at, at inducing adaptation. After each exercise session, subjects uh, ingested their beverage. Um, so again, it was just what they were randomized to, and then they ingested that exact same beverage immediately before sleep. So the subjects would ingest 10, uh, 10, 10 supplements of either the protein or the placebo group um, throughout the 12 weeks of training. So we assessed dietary uh, intake before training and during the last week of training. And what we see in terms of how much protein these, uh, these older uh, guys were ingesting is that in the placebo group, we saw that protein intake was somewhere between 1.1 and 1.2, 1.7 here on average, or 1.17 rather on average. Uh, in the protein supplemented group, we saw significantly greater protein intake. So it, overall, they were ingesting just over 1.4 grams kilogram body weight per day. So our supplementation effectively increased uh, the dietary protein intake uh, as, we, as we hoped. Um, when we look at the quadriceps cross-sectional area, which was measured uh, using 
computed, computed tomography, uh, what we see is that the 12 weeks of training effectively increased the quadriceps cross-sectional area, but we did not see any additional benefit of the protein supplement. If you look at maximal strength, we see a similar story. So the uh, 12 weeks of training induced quite a big increase in maximal strength, but again, we see no, uh, no further effect of protein supplementation. So um, it's perhaps surprising based on the acute, uh, or the, the short-term findings that protein supplementation doesn't work. And it's perhaps because there is maybe a low effect of protein supplementation in more long-term studies. And so in order to increase uh, the power in order to detect low effects, um, uh, Naomi Cermak uh, collected data from similar studies across younger and older populations. So these are all training studies um, which contain a placebo group and which had a protein supplemented group. And what we see when we have all these subjects or all these, all these data from all these subjects uh, compiled is that there does seem to be uh, an effect of protein to further increase uh, muscle adaptation uh, during training. For the elderly population in particular, um, in, uh, it's, it's perhaps uh, possible that protein supplementation has a, uh, a greater effect in certain subpopulations. So if we look at pre-frail older individuals, um, they typically have a lower protein intake. So um, this was a study done by Michael Phelan in collaboration with our lab. Uh, the protein intake in these uh, older participants, this is both, both men and women, uh, the protein intake was about 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 grams, so it's less than what I, uh, what I found in, in my training study. And here they saw that uh, during uh, 24 weeks of training, they measured at 12 weeks and they measured again at 24 weeks, they did in fact see an added benefit of protein supplementation in this group. And so this may signify that in the older population, there are subpopulations that are more compromised that, are actually, that can actually utilize protein supplementation to promote muscle adaptation. So when we apply some of the uh, concepts and, and things that I uh, found um, during these studies, uh, it's, it's good to look at um, uh, on the practical side of how much protein is, is being ingested uh, during an average day in the older populations. And so this is also done, uh, this study rather was also done by Michael Thieland. And um, what it is is uh, two groups here that are community dwelling older individuals. So you see 65 to 70 years old and 75 to 97 years old uh, in the top groups. And there's a frail group here and then two institutionalized uh, older individual groups. So there are uh, two things that mainly stick out. One is that uh, at the breakfast meal, dietary protein intake hovers around 10 grams uh, uh, with each meal. So uh, based on my findings, it, it, it might be uh, a good option for uh, older individuals to um, fortify the breakfast meal with dietary protein um, in order to, to increase the anabolic response to breakfast. On the other hand, like I said, some subjects may not be able to tolerate such large doses of protein, so uh, perhaps loosening co-ingestion might be, might be a good uh, alternative for the breakfast meal. Uh, lunch and dinner, uh, they hover around 30 grams of protein in the community dwelling uh, adults. But then after the dinner meal, we see that there's only about four to five grams of protein that's ingested in the evening. So we can perhaps apply uh, the pre-sleep protein ingestion concept in the older adults in order to compensate for uh, the anabolic uh, resistance uh, to the earlier meals, or perhaps if they, uh, if they don't prefer to increase uh, protein intake at breakfast. So I'd just like to summarize by saying that uh, I found that 30 to 45 grams of protein is required to robustly stimulate protein uh, synthesis rates during post-exercise recovery in the older population. Uh, the co-ingestion of free leucine with smaller protein doses augments muscle protein synthesis rates during post-exercise recovery. It could be an effective strategy for these people who aren't able to ingest large doses. Um, Pre-sleep protein ingestion is something that we're working on. Uh, it seems to be effective at stimulating overnight muscle protein synthesis rates and could be an effective strategy to compensate for, uh, for protein intake, uh, which may not be uh, adequate from the, from the previous meals. And lastly, protein supplementation during prolonged resistance type exercise seems to have an added effect uh, overall on increasing muscle mass and strength. But it, uh, in terms of the older population, there's probably specific subpopulations that can benefit most from, from protein supplementation, such as the pre-frail population. 
So with that, I would just like to thank uh, my lab group back at the Strait University. And I would also like to just draw some attention to our, our new website that was released, I think, last month, uh, m3-research.ml. And I would like to thank you uh, for your attention. No, we don't have any measures of kidney function, um, but I would say regarding uh, high protein diets and, and kidney function, um, there's a statement from the World Health Organization that there's not really any conclusive data that the, uh, that the high protein intakes can actually uh, further affect kidney function. And uh, a colleague, uh, Stuart Phillips uh, from Canada, who I worked with in my bachelor's, he performed a, a meta-analysis looking at some of the effects of protein, uh, high protein diets on kidney function and found that, that there was actually no uh, no negative effects of a high protein diet on on kidney function. In age, in age. Uh, yeah, in yeah, age. yeah. I think I think it has to be. Uh, I think I think with uh, individuals that might have impaired function already, it could be an issue. But in a healthy population, it's no issue. Yeah, I think, well, to be completely honest, the reason that we selected casein for our overnight studies, um, uh, we, we have these uh, intrinsically labeled milk experiments with the cow and we did the milk bag, and the early studies, we separated the casein from the whey. We had a lot more casein because it's 80% of the milk. But it also makes logical sense to feed the casein prior to sleep because it is a slowly digestible protein. And it's, as you saw from the data I showed, it's, it's getting released the entire night. So it does fit well with the with the, uh, the overnight sleeping period. Um, I think um, it's not known if, if one is better than the other, but I would say that they're both good quality protein sources. So um, yeah, perhaps adjusting <coughs> weight before sleep is a good uh, is a good alternative. Um, I'm kind of uh, on Nick's side as well. That kind of during the day, the the um, the, like the intact, full, complete meal. Uh, with adequate protein content is probably the preferred choice, and supplementation may uh, may be required for certain people that can't uh, can't get these meals anymore. So that's what I would I would say about that. I think, I think when, when we're trying to translate the short-term to the long-term studies, there's a lot of other factors that are, we're kind of capturing in the long-term uh, study, such as habitual physical activity and the other meals that are throughout the day. So um, it's possible that the, the response in the long-term is uh, being modulated by these other factors, whereas in our acute setting, we've kind of stripped away all the other factors, we've done exercise, and then we provide the meal, and we measure over six hours. So it's possible that the, that the acute response, we're providing all the amino acids that are required to stimulate protein synthesis rates, but perhaps in a, in a, in a regular day in a long-term study, um, it's not as sensitive to, to or, or shall I say, there's other uh, stimuli available in which protein synthesis rates are already 
being stimulated. So we're able to detect it more on the, on the acute setting, whereas there's other factors uh, involved in the long term. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So I, my guess is that substrate requirement, there's, there's no way that a muscle can handle that consistently throughout the urgent care requirement. Yeah, that, that's, that's definitely the next question. Yeah. Morning sort of um, infusion. And so I guess we got to be a little more thoughtful about translating these morning sort of requirements to a, to a full day basis. Yeah. Not saying that's not true, right? We don't know. Um, things are being regulated from a meal by meal yeah basis. yeah we did we did i would just point out that we did see in the in the overnight work the pre-sleep work that we followed like that measurement was done after a whole day of dietary standardization we're still able to see some of the anabolic effects of 40 grams of casein ingestion for for example but the measurement period is, is quite long and it's in a in a recovery phase when we're sleeping as well so um, but that's the other about the background of, of my PhD work. Uh, so, well, we know that maintenance, hemodialysis people, uh, show several problems, uh, among which muscle atrophy, uh, insulin resistance, and uh, reduced muscle uh, TI3K, AKT signaling, that is the traditional ins insulin signaling for glucose uptake in skeletal muscles. And uh, also, the, uh, disruption to the linkage um, uh, that uh, the binds the cytoskeleton with the extracellular matrix may contribute actually to the development of insulin resistance in hemodialysis people uh, and also to reduce nut nutrient uptake in skeletal, in skeletal muscles, but this uh, uh, still remains to be investigated in uh, uh, hemodialysis people. So, uh, the uh, main aim of my study, of this study, uh, well, we actually investigated if uh, the structural, pr uh, structural proteins uh, of the extracellular matrix uh, and uh, the proteins that link the extracellular matrix to the cytoskeleton are reduced in hemodialysis patients compared to uh, controls that are not in hemodialysis but still insulin resistant individuals. And this is just the list of all the proteins of interest that uh, we investigated in the muscles of this uh, uh, sample. So uh, among which uh, the IPP complex, IAK, Pinch1, and Parvin, the uh, protein RAC1, that is one of the main regulators of, uh, of the cytoskeleton, the uh, focal adhesion kinase, FAK, and then the traditional proteins involved in the insulin signaling, AKT2, and also IP6K1, and then also dystrophin. So really briefly, uh, these uh, are the samples that we used uh, in uh, our experiments. Above, you can see the human and mouse models. The, uh, we can see that we used eight um, hemodialysis people and eight control. Both showed uh, similar insulin resistance levels, and uh, they were generated at the University of Illinois in the lab of Nicholas Burt, that is here with us uh, today. And uh, uh, biopsies were taken from the vastus lateralis of uh, the muscles of uh, these people uh, in a uh, fast state and then also postprandial state. And then uh, we uh, actually investigated uh, the proteins uh, linked to the extracellular matrix and cytoskeletal also, also in a mouse model in a RAC1, uh, muscle-specific RAC1 knockout uh, mice that were generated at the University of Copenhagen in the lab of uh, Dr. Luke Silo, uh, where I actually did all my experiments and uh, um, Wexterblot for these experiments. 
Um, and uh, we actually uh, investigated uh, our proteins of interest also in these models because uh, RAF1 is one of the main regulators of the cytoskeleton. So we wanted to deepen his role in the integrin signaling and uh, in the extracellular matrix uh, involved. So, uh, said that, let's see some results. Then well, we actually so investigated uh, these proteins in uh, the masters of uh, our human samples. And uh, what we found from uh, the Western blot analysis, well, over here, well, on the top, we, we, we uh, actually, the main findings here is that uh, we um, observed um, a significant reduction of HLK and Finch1 uh, in, uh, in both a fasted and a post-meal post state in uh, hemodialysis people compared uh, to the controls whereas Parvin didn't see really affected. And then uh, also the activity of uh, FAK uh, over here uh, was reduced only in a post-meal uh, state in hemodialysis people uh, control, uh, in hemodialysis people uh, um, compared with the controls, whereas there were not uh, really differences in RAC1 content in uh, both controls and hemodialysis people and so also the proteins involved in the uh, insulin signaling uh, actually were not altered, uh, uh, were not, uh, there were not a difference, uh, really the important differences in the content of this, uh, of IP6K1 and AKT2 in uh, the muscle of uh, controls versus hemodialysis people. And then uh, um, we also investigated the same proteins so in the uh, knockout uh, RAC1 uh, mouse muscles and here, uh, the, actually, the absence of RAC1 didn't uh, alter the expression, uh, the content of all the other uh, proteins involved in the integrin signaling that connect the extracellular matrix with the cytoskeleton. Uh, and from here, uh, from here uh, we can just see that there were not any differences in protein expression between uh, knockout mice and control mice. And then uh, we wanted also uh, to see if the, uh, since we found the, uh, a reduction uh, in the extracellular matrix proteins, uh, higher K and pH1 in hemodialysis people compared with the controls, we wanted to see if uh, these uh, <coughs> uh, extracellular matrix disruptions uh, could affect uh, insulin sensitivity in uh, uh, this uh, model and also uh, the uh, nutrient uptake um, and metabolisms in uh, human models, but uh, actually we didn't see any insulin uh, sensitivity, sensitivity levels differences between uh, the um, hemodialysis people compared with the controls. Uh, this graph just show briefly uh, some uh, uh, indexes like uh, the acute, uh, acute insulin response and uh, second phase insulin response after uh, uh, and, uh, two hours meal, and also the disposition index, as a, uh, they give a general idea actually of a beta cell function and insulin sensitivity in the indiv indiv individuals, and there are not really um, differences. And then when we investigated actually the uh, metabolism of phenylalanine in uh, our uh, um, human samples, well, we didn't see any differences in the uh, clear um, in the, um, in, uh, in the <laughs> disappearance rate and appearance rate, but uh, the metabolic clearance rate of phenylalanine was actually decreased in uh, hemodialysis people compared uh, with the controls. Um, so from uh, all these results uh, that we obtain, uh, the main conclusion <coughs> that uh, uh, we can deduce is that, uh, well, uh, in hemodialysis patients, uh, yes, uh, as we hypothesized, they display a reduction of extracellular matrix uh, proteins uh, in their muscles. Uh, so this is suggest uh, that uh, the extracellular matrix is disrupted uh, in these populations. And then, uh, the, actually, uh, the hemodialysis people and controls present a similar level of insulin resistance and uh, muscle protein content of RAC1 and AKT2, since uh, these two molecules were not, were not uh, decreased in hemodialysis people compared to the controls. And uh, RAC1 deletion, uh, deletion 
in, uh, well, uh, in uh, knockout models did not, did, did not alter at all the expression or the content of the other proteins of extracellular matrix. And uh, we observed so a decrease in the clearance rate of phenylalanine in hemodialysis people compared to, uh, to the controls. And um, it, it may be attributed to dysfunction in the extracellular matrix associated uh, integrin, uh, sorry, uh, ILK uh, pinch one complex, and uh, definitely are not influenced by ATP2 and ATP1. So, for the first time, we may suggest that the extracellular matrix dysfunction may contribute to a, 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 a reduced phenylalanine flux in these conditions without affecting the degree of insulin resistance. See, we didn't see any difference in insulin resistance between these two models. So, well, of course, uh, uh, we want to thank uh, the University of Illinois to have uh, to give us uh, the um, all the materials and the human samples and the University of Copenhagen to have uh, gave us materials and also facilities where I could uh, run my experiments. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks very much uh, to Richard and Hannah for giving me the opportunity to uh, share with you some of the data that I was doing during my time um, at Loughborough. I'm now at Coventry University. Um, I'm a postdoc with Professor Derek Renshaw, who's here. Um, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the work uh, that I was doing, um, mainly around uh, metabolic disease and using tissue engineered skeletal muscle um, as a platform for it. And I, to start, I really should disclose that. Um, part of working for uh, Professor Mark Lewis at the time, uh, we were also providing consultancy to a company wanting to grow lab-grown meat. Um, and they were probably, or are probably quite interested in putting fat within their, within their system so that they can make it taste marginally better than it sounds. Um, so uh, that's something, obviously, that I'm not really that interested in not pursuing, but um, maybe it's a point of discussion for future uh, nutrition research. Um, well, what I'm interested in mainly in is, is, is muscle disease and obesity um, and how that affects skeletal muscle. Um, and obviously there's a lot of work out there in the literature um, about the role of lipids and how they impact on, on insulin sensitivity, um, how they're stored and how they're utilized. So one of the um, interesting things about muscle uh, and lipid storage is that it's, it's stored in the form of intramyocellular lipids. Um, and I'm sure some of you in the room will have probably heard of uh, the term athlete's paradox, where um, both of these populations, so endurance trained um, athletes will have high levels of intramyocellular lipid, but they are also very highly um, or very insulin sensitive. And on the flip side, at the other end of the spectrum, there's the obese populations who also have this in high content of intramyocellular lipid, but obviously they're their insulin sensitivity is, is significantly dampened. Um, and obviously we can do uh, lots of human studies and lots of animal studies, um, but in order to sort of really delve into the potential mechanisms of that, um, a lot of people have used in vitro approaches, and one of the most common things you probably see within the literature is the use of, uh, of something called 2D cell culture, so which is basically growing your cells uh, in tissue culture plastic. Uh, and probably more recently, there's been a, a sort of turn in, in the use of in vitro research and actually more focusing on 3D cell culture models. So whether that be in the form of spheroids or organoids, or in our case where we're using tissue engineering, where we're implanting cells within a matrix and then using some form of engineering to suspend that, that mixture. And one of the ways that 
Um, we particularly do that is in the sort of three components if you, if you want to see it that way, where we've got our cells, so in this particular case it's CGC 12 myoblasts. We're seeding them within a matrix, which in our case is matrigel and type 1 rat collagen. And then the, the bit of engineering is we use a 3D printer. You can probably just see a bit of a, a diagram in, in the top, uh, top corner over there. To create some posts um, where we can seed the, the collagen between, between, the, uh, between those posts. And what that does is it creates um, sort of a passive tension. And the great thing about that passive tension is that it allows the cells to align uniaxially to that tension. Um, and what that then does is make our bit of tissue engineered muscle actually look like real muscle. Well, obviously it's all well and good looking at it from uh, how, well, how good it looks, but how, uh, how functional is it? Is it? Um, and one of the things that we can do is we can then test these just as though you would test any other cell culture system um, with the added benefit of the fact that we can then actually contract and stimulate these to get sort of a functional, uh, functional muscle response. So how well are these, uh, how well are these uh, constructs producing force? Um, and in terms of the fatty acid component, um, we're sort of using a mixture of, of fatty acids. This is a, a mixture used by uh, Professor Leanne Hudson at Oxford University. Uh, she, she kind of gave us the recipe to this, she, she uses this in her hepatocyte cell experiments um, and we're basically seeing what the effects of, of her mix would do on our tissue engineering muscle. Um, so unfortunately, the lights can, can get the light. Um, so just going back while we, while we get a bit more ambiance in here. Uh, um, we chose three different concentrations, so obviously zero, and then a physiological concentration of 200 micromoles, and then, um, and then a, a sort of a pathophysiological concentration of, of 800 micromoles. And what was quite nice is that as you increase the, the amount of, of lipid, uh, as shown by our Nile red stain in here, you might just be able to see the purple dots. Uh, you get an increase in the accumulation of uh, of lipids within our construct, um, and and if you take sort of increase the, the magnification, you can actually see that they co-localize with uh, some of the myosin heavy chains or the circles that we've sort of identified as myo tubes within our construct. So you can you can do uh, uh, some image analysis on this, and and just to to match up the, the what the images show, we can see an increase in in the number of lipid droplets that you get. Um, and also the average size of those lipid droplets also increases with the <coughs> amount of um, with the amount of uh, fat that you expose these uh, these constructs to. Um, we didn't see uh, a, a necessarily a change in the number of myotubes that were within those constructs, but the, the percentage coverage of those myotubes um, in, in terms of the whole construct area reduces, and, and we think that maybe just because the fat is infiltrating in there. Into the, into the construct, <coughs> causing to, to expand. And as I said, one of the, the, the cool things about this particular system is that you can actually uh, hook it up to a microforce transducer and measure the amount of force that they're able to generate. Um, and these are just absolute force uh, measurements. So uh, w when we stimulate them and give them a tectonic, so that's the maximal force contraction that these constructs are able to generate, um, we actually found uh, a reduction um, with the increase in in the amount of fat that's in there, and likewise the same for a twitch force. So that was just a one uh, a one pulse stimulation that there is a, a significant reduction in the amount of force they're able to generate at, at, at least the 200 micromolar concentration. So then we wanted to look at um, some of the molecular outputs of it. So uh, we looked at some of the gene expression, uh, things like uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase times four expression, and and that increased quite nicely with the increase in 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 lipids. We, we also looked at uh, perilipin 2 and 5, uh, which are uh, lipid droplet protein, proteins, so two of the increase in lipid droplets uh, that we see on our uh, uh, image analysis. It was quite nice to see that um, those, those particular markers, were, or at least perilipin 2, was increasing as well. Um, fortunately, there's no change in sort of the PPAR, uh, any of the PPAR isoforms. I think because they're uh, quite transiently expressed that we probably missed the window in terms of their, the increase in their expression, they're, they're normally increased uh, 
quite rapidly after exposure to fatty acids. So, and this was uh, sort of four days after exposure. Um, so, I also wanted to see what what sort of insulin sensitivity they had following this high level of insulin, uh, high level of uh, fat exposure. Sorry. Um, and what we can see is we do start to get a, a gradual reduction in the insulin sensitivity of these constructs, um, but we probably need to, to do a, a few more experimental, uh, experimental repeats to get any sort of significant uh, changes uh, in there. Um, so obviously to, to sum up, we, we sort of successfully used the tissue engineering uh, platform to look at various different uh, nutritional interventions, whether it be uh, leucine exposure, um, uh, as an example. Uh, but this was the first time we was used lipids, and, and it's quite nice to see that the lipids do infiltrate into that construct, um, uh, and that is uh, causing some sort of uh, functional change and also uh, an, an, a molecular change as well. And now taking it forward, uh, we obviously really want to delve into uh, the actual physiological responses of these of these constructs to that type of uh, those types of fatty acids, uh, and see if it changes the flexibility, uh, the metabolic flexibility in any way. Um, so I should acknowledge at the time at the time when I was at Loughborough, I was part of the uh, Leicester Biomedical Research Centre, um, and I obviously uh, was fortunate to obtain funding to uh, go and work in Professor Leanne Hobson's uh, lab which is uh, obviously where the, the lipid uh, recipe came from. Uh, so I'll thank you all to take any questions. significant. Um, one of the things that was, I suppose, intriguing about uh, the, the sigmoid data um, um, so um, so G GSK um, there was an approach in significance here but um, between between these two but um, it was like 0.09 um, yeah, unfortunately, we weren't able to get any statistically significant differences. I think one of the things that puzzled me slightly, maybe about the AS160 data, which is in the middle here, is this gradual rise in basal phosphorylation. Um, some of the stuff that I was trying to read around to try and get an answer for that was, was potentially due to AS160's role in this uh, translocation of CD36, which is a fatty acid transporter. Um, I'd probably need to read a little bit more on it to see if that if that is a real true link, but uh, that might be just the byproduct of, of that potential. So it's just the least of the link is AS160, AS160 plus any CD. I think because the so the white bars are just basal, uh, they're, they're unstimulated, uh, un non insulin stimulated constructs. So um, in theory, that increase in phosphorylation might be down to just the increase in, in fat and that's just a basal basal effect. Can hear me okay, yeah? Thanks a lot. And indeed, my presentation today is going to just look at how training intensity and the environmental conditions influence the hydration status of elite football players. Now, this was uh, an applied research study done in collaboration with my previous <coughs> institution, Liverpool John Moores, and Blackburn Rovers Football Club. So, all the data that I'll be presenting today was collected during the last championship football season. Now, I'm just going to start off my presentation with illustrating the effects. Uh, 
that dehydration has on sports performance. Now, as Dr. Uh, James has presented earlier on, a dehydration of 2 to 3% can, can decrease constant speed running. There's also evidence that the same level of dehydration can also reduce sprinting performance. Now, given that football is co a combination of both these type of physical activity, we, we would expect the same level of dehydration would negatively affect football performance. Now, indeed, in one of the few studies that actually <coughs> addressed this issue, it was shown that a 2% dehydration can imp impact football specific performance. Now, in this particular study, what the researcher did, uh, they have actually measured the amount of distance covered during the yo-yo recovery test uh, in an optimally hydrated group and then in, a, in two dehydrated group, which were achieved in two different methods. And basically, what they have found that is that when the participants were optimally hydrated, they have managed to cover a higher amount of distance during the performance test. Also, what was very interesting about this paper is that they also look at the rate of specific exertion, so how tired the participants felt, and they showed that although they have actually covered more distance when they were optimally dehydrated, they actually felt less tired, therefore suggesting that dehydration can also affect how tired participants actually felt in the study. Now, besides the total amount of uh, water that participants can lose, uh, electrolytes are also important for sport performance. They play a, a role in, wide, in a wide range of physiological processes, including muscle contractions, nerve signaling, regulating fast osmolarity, and volume, but probably the one that has received the most attention <coughs> predominantly in the co context of team-based sport is muscle cramps and their association with sodium loss. Now, we do not have a good understanding of what is actually driving muscle, uh, muscle cramps and what's causing them. However, throughout the literature, there are several papers which uh, cite an association between sodium loss and muscle cramps. And in this particular uh, paper, conducted by Stockholm and the colleagues in 2005, the researcher have looked at the correlation between crampers and non-crampers in an American football team. So basically, what the researchers have done, they have split uh, the participants into crampers, obviously American football players which tended to have a high number of cramps and non-crampers which tended to have a less number of cramps and they have measured the amount of sodium that these players lost during the morning session and evening session and then they collected the data together and did a comparison and have shown that the crampers have actually lost twice as much sodium throughout the entire day compared to non-crampers, therefore providing a bit of evidence into the association between sodium loss and muscle cramps. Now, so far I've kind of discussed about how consuming an optimal amount of fluids and of electrolytes might, in, might maximize performance in football. However, when we look at the current research and we are trying to develop kind of evidence-based hydration strategies in football, we are facing several difficulties. First of all, there is a, a very high variation between studies, between applied studies regarding the sweat rate, the fluid intake, the body mass loss, and the sodium loss of elite football players. Now this is not unexpected given the fact that this field-based data is collected during in different football teams which were com and in different training sessions and also in different environments which are all likely to affect the results and make it a bit more difficult to compare the results between these studies. And as a result of this, in order to kind of get a better understanding of how all these different factors influence the hydration state of, of elite football players, we decided to run our study. So basically what we have done in terms of data collection, we have measured uh, the body weight of the players before and after the training sessions. We had a, 20, a number of 25 football players. We have measured the amount of fluid that they drank during the training sessions. Uh, this was just ability on drinking, so we encouraged the players to drink as much as they felt it was necessary for them to be optimally, optimally hydrated. We also used sweat patches. We used three sweat patches per player in order to be able to collect sweat samples. And then uh, we have analyzed the sweat samples in order to be able to look at the sodium concentration of the sweat and the total amount of sodium that that was lost during the sessions. We did this during three different training sessions, during the low-intensity training session, completely in a cool environment at around 12 degrees. Uh, during the high-intensity training session, completely in the exact same environment. And then during the high-intensity training session, completely in a warm environment at around 24 degrees. What we also did, we tracked the distance covered by each player in order to be able to look at different training indices and to really compare the intensity of these three training sessions. And what we have found, we found that the two high intensity training sessions were significantly higher in terms of the total distance covered by the players, the distance covered the high intensity and the total number of high intensity efforts compared to the low intensity training session. But we found no difference between the two of them, which is exactly what we were hoping for in order to be able to really look at the at how both training intensity and environmental conditions affect the hydration status of the players. Moving into the results section, on this slide you can see the sweat rate 
presented as meters per hour and the total sweat loss across the three training sessions. Both of these were highest in a high intensity training session completed in a warm environment. However, we didn't find any significant difference between the two training sessions completed in the same environment, which tends to suggest that probably the environmental conditions are the main driver of sweat loss. Meanwhile, training intensity might just play a secondary role. So as mentioned earlier on, we look at the fluid intake, so how much liquids the players have actually drained during these training sessions. Again, this was, uh, the high, this was highest in, into the high intensity work condition, which tends to suggest that the players intuitively drank more as a response to the increase in sweat loss. However, when we look at body mass loss, again, this was seen in the high intensity warm condition. So even though the players have drained more in this session, they did not manage to fully compensate for the higher amount of sweat loss. We've also looked at the sweat sodium concentration and the sodium loss. Uh, on the left graph of, this, uh, of the slide, you can see the sweat sodium concentration was significantly higher in the high intensity training sessions compared to the low one, but there was no significant difference between the two of them, which uh, uh, in contrary to, to the last slide where the environmental conditions were the main driver in sweat loss, here we can see that the training intensity is actually the one that increases the sweat sodium concentration. Looking on the graph on the right side of the slide, we can see that still the total sodium loss was the highest in the high intensity warm condition, which is a combination of both the increased sweat loss but also the high sweat sodium concentration. What we did next after we managed to identify the effect of both training intensity and the environmental conditions, we wanted to see if there's any strong correlation between any specific training indices and sweat loss. What we have found, and it's similar to previous literature on the topic, we have found that the total distance traveled by the players and the number of high intensity efforts that they have completed throughout the training session were best associated with sweat loss. We then did the same analysis on sodium loss, and again we have found that the same two training indices, total distance covered, and the number of high intensity efforts completed were best correlated with sodium loss. So it looks like out of at least these four training indices, uh, for both uh, sodium loss and for total sweat loss, the total distance covered by the players and the number of high intensity efforts are best correlated, which provides uh, some indication about what training factors should we look at when we try to develop hydration strategies. Just to summarize, our study has shown that both training intensity and environmental conditions play an important role in the hydration status of elite football players, although they do act to different mechanisms and in different ways. And based on this and also on previous literature, we believe that sports science practitioners should work together with football players in order to develop context-specific hydration strategies in order to maximize football performance. Thank you very much. Okay, so in, in, if we look at the total amount of sodium that was lost throughout the session, this was higher, but indeed there was no difference between the concentration. I think it's a hard one to, uh, to, to really answer. If you look at the paper done by Rob Duffield et al., who was another paper done in applied football hydration, they have actually seen an increase uh, in sweat rate with, uh, with an increase in training intensity, but I believe we didn't really manage to reach a significant difference in terms of intensity. So although there were there was a difference between the low and the high intensity one. I think you need to see a slightly higher difference between the training sessions to really see an increase in, in sweat rate and sweat loss. Yeah, but the, the sweat rate to sweat sodium relationship is my yeah. question. So why was there a difference in sweat sodium concentration but no difference in sweat? Where did you collect the sweat from? Uh, so we collected from just from the forearm, upper back, and upper thigh. So three, three body locations. But if you tend to look at analyzing the data, they seem to be quite quite similar between the three samples as well. So we didn't find significant very very significant difference between the three of them. And so but is that raw data? Have you collected the whole body? Sweat? No, so basically what we did with an average of the three of the three of the three samples in order to get a total sweat sodium concentration. That might be one of the reasons. equation that you can correct that as well. What it would be without the sweat patch on. So I suggest you look at that and see if there's a relationship between the sweat 
Um, hi, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about my um, pilot study. This is part of my master's uh, dissertation project at the University of Westminster. Um, so it's a pilot study investigating the effects of sodium bicarbonate supplementation on gastrointestinal symptoms and markers of intestinal damage in healthy, well-trained athletes. Uh, to our knowledge, this is the first study to investigate intestinal damage in sodium bicarbonate supplementation. So sodium bicarbonate is an established effective ergogenic aid. Uh, the use prevalence appears to be low and potentially the risk of adverse side effects leads to avoidance. Um, gastrointestinal side effects, um, sorry, gastrointestinal symptoms, which I'll refer to as GIST throughout for, um, you know, to be succinct, uh, are experienced by some athletes, although not all. Um, the uh, response is highly individual and it appears to be dose dependent. The um, bulk of the literature into sodium bicarbonate supplementation seems to focus on um, the degrees of alkalosis achieved and also performance outcomes and the ingestion protocol used is inconsistent. Uh, but there is a wide um, variety or there's a, there's a broad body of research into exercise induced gastrointestinal symptoms, uh, which is uh, complex, uh, many factors sort of uh, uh, influencing the, the gastrointestinal symptoms. This is often uh, observed alongside gut damage, although it's not universal. Uh, there are several markers of gut damage used in this uh, research. Uh, one is intestinal fatty acid binding protein, which is an acute uh, efficient sort of surrogate marker of gut damage. And it's released into the circulation following um, ischemic stress and it has a very uh, short 11 minute half life, so it's a very sort of acute measure. So, my research aim was to evaluate the effects of sodium bicarbonate supplementation on uh, gastrointestinal symptoms and intestinal fatty acid binding protein concentration as a marker of small intestinal damage. So this was a uh, double-blind crossover um, design. We had uh, nine participants recruited initially, but one dropped out. Uh, so eight participants' uh, data presented in this uh, pilot study. So they would come to the labs fasted, and uh, the initial visit was a VO2 max test and familiarization, and then they would return for two experimental trials. Uh, again, fasted, where they would receive one of two beverages, either a standard dose of sodium bicarbonate or a taste-matched placebo solution. Uh, on arrival, their hydration status would be measured and then we would take three blood samples, um, one at uh, pre-ingestion, one pre-exercise and one post-exercise. The participants would uh, consume the beverage immediately after the blood sample and then sit rested for 60 minutes. Then one more blood sample would be taken and then they would perform a 20 minute treadmill run at 80% VO2 max. This is an exercise protocol which we know induces gut damage so we use this as a positive control. Um, one more blood sample would be taken immediately, uh, the exercise was finished. And then gastrointestinal symptoms were measured uh, every 10 minutes throughout the trial, uh, we asked uh, about 17 symptoms on a 10-point uh, scale, uh, and then blood was analysed for pH, blood bicarbonate and lactate uh, throughout the, the trial at the three time points, and then the uh, levels of plasma, I plus P, were analysed at a later date. 
we had an uh, important exclusion of our criteria for this uh, trial, which was uh, anyone with an existing GI disorder, use of any GI medication, or uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen were excluded, as we know that this, uh, the, uh, the NSAIDs uh, cause gut damage. Um, so we found a median increase in uh, gastrointestinal symptoms across the eight participants. Uh, six experienced more um, <coughs> symptoms, one experienced uh, less, and one experienced the same. Uh, this was not statistically significant. Um, we also then looked at just uh, severe symptoms, which is symptoms rated uh, four or more, and the results were also not statistically significant. But you can see from this figure, we have a high degree of individual variability. Um, so one of the participants here, number six, experienced 316 total symptoms versus 17 in the placebo condition. Uh, and then this figure shows the uh, results for the plasma IFAP concentration. Um, we found no difference at uh, baseline between the two conditions. Uh, we found a significant difference, uh, an increase in uh, plasma IFAP concentration in the um, sodium bicarbonate condition pre-exercise uh, compared to placebo. And then we also found a significant increase uh, in the absolute plasma IFAP concentration from pre-ingestion to pre-exercise in the sodium bicarbonate uh, arm. Uh, the percentage increase was 87% uh, between uh, placebo and sodium bicarbonate and 88% uh, from pre-ingestion to pre-exercise. We actually didn't see any um, additive effect of the exercise protocol, which is not what we expected, and we can't explain that uh, at this stage. Um, and then the figure is showing uh, individual responses uh, to the plasma IFAP. Again, a degree of individual variability, um, not to the same extent as the uh, gastrointestinal symptoms but uh, one particular participant, a different one to the uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, has a particularly high baseline concentration. And in fact, if you look at the um, pre-ingestion level for the top participant, his baseline is uh, very similar to the levels that the other participants uh, achieved uh, in their sodium bicarbonate supplementation um, after 60 minutes. So whilst there's no um, statistical significance in the uh, difference in the gastro symptom, gastrointestinal symptoms uh, experienced by the participants, there is uh, practical significance for those who do experience it. Um, of the nine participants that we originally recruited to the trial, um, the one that's now excluded from the data actually dropped out because he was unable to complete the exercise protocol due to gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, so the large doses of sodium bicarbonate uh, ingested to uh, achieve some kind of ergogenic benefit um, increase the osmotic load in the gut and um, this can cause gastric uh, dumping and um, symptoms such as uh, cramping and uh, stomach ache. Um, and then the, um, there's a, a, an increase in the production of carbon dioxide in the gut as the sodium bicarbonate disassociates to sodium and bicarbonate. So this increase in carbon dioxide um, reduces the already low oxygen levels at the villi tip in the intestine. And we propose that this causes ischemic stress. Um, sodium bi uh, bicarbonate is also um, transported against an electrochemical gradient actively, and uh, this transporter is saturable at high concentrations, um, and again, the high doses required to um, see performance outcomes um, potentially mean that this gradient is saturated, and um, this would potentially comp compromise the intestinal barrier, hence the, the increase in the IFAP that we saw. 
Um, so in summary, we would say that the sodium bicarbonate increases markers of intestinal epithelial damage, but not gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, but obviously a personalized approach um, would be taken to supplementation of sodium bicarbonate anyway in terms of looking at um, time to peak, um, you know, personalizing the uh, approach rather than taking a generic standardized approach, and that this should consider gastrointestinal symptoms, how extreme they are for the individual, and what the likelihood is that that will actually have an impact on performance. Um, also, uh, this is not a mechanistic study. Um, we use I5P, which is only a surrogate marker, and further research should look to uh, use a more robust direct marker of gastrointestinal permeability. Um, this is typically used in a sugar probe, which is ingested, and then the excretion ratio of lactulose in ram nose is measured. Um, other systemic uh, responses can be looked at. Um, there are novel ingestion protocols at the moment, um, emerging research into uh, gastro-resistant capsules uh, to deliver sodium bicarbonate. These have been shown to sort of mitigate or reduce gastrointestinal symptoms, but uh, we don't know whether that also reduces gut damage. Um, and then chronic and serial loading protocol are also being uh, investigated, again, to try and mitigate uh, gut uh, symptoms but uh, the sort of continuous ingestion of sodium bicarbonate potentially has a long-term health risk if we are seeing damage in response to supplementation. Um, that's it. Yeah, good afternoon everyone, uh, my name is Tom Gurney and I'm a PhD researcher at Kingston University. Uh, I'm currently interested in the micronutrient uh, capabilities of algae and its essential effects on uh, the aerogenic gain capabilities. Uh, so there's been quite a lot of studies uh, currently done uh, on spirulina and chlorella with regards to their physical interactions. Um, and what I'm trying to do is um, really bridge that gap between uh, that, those potential positive findings, whether there could be any potential positive findings to any aerogenic aid capabilities. Um, the two main uh, algae which I'm currently researching is spirulina and chlorella. Uh, they're very, very similar, but they do differ uh, and they have some key different characteristics. So spirulina is a light green algae. Uh, it's a multi-cell algae, um, meaning that it doesn't have a, um, a cellulose wall, which, which means it's highly digestible. Uh, spirulina is also 60 to 70 percent of its dry weight is protein. It's rich in all the essential amino acids. It's exceptionally high in minerals, vitamins, um, and iron as well. 
Um, whereas perilla is a dark blue um, green algae. Um, it's also exceptionally rich in protein, um, minerals and vitamins. Uh, around 50% of its dry weight is protein. Um, and chlorella is also exceptionally high in omega-3 fatty acids as well. So a lot of researchers have looked at uh, chlorella's capability of cardiovascular risk factors. Um, so both the algae grow and thrive naturally in warm lakes, but are also commercially produced um, in large ponds. Uh, the main producers are Hawaii, Mexico, um, and Asia. And anecdotally, around 2,000 years ago, uh, Chinese uh, folk were consuming spirulina as a whole food source. Um, and more recently, it's been reported that Indian track and field athletes, as well as Cuban athletes, have been taking spirulina and or chlorella uh, before um, competition. Both algae have actually been classified as a superfood by the World Health um, Organization. Um, and consequently, uh, the World Health Organization has suggested to NASA that they should be giving uh, astronauts uh, spirulina when they go up on some space missions. Um, so, because of this, um, highly nutritional content has now started to become widely commercialised. Uh, we've started seeing spirulina um, in innocent smoothies. I'm sure if you go to a local health food store, um, you can buy it in capsule form or powdered form. Um, and because of this growing trend, um, by 2023 it's expected to reach uh, around a global um, market value of 44.6 billion US dollars. Um, I should say as well that um, these algae can be used in other different um, uh, areas, um, so the pigment in, from chlorophyll um, can also be used uh, for dyes and stuff um, in food um, as well as um, clothing. Um, so with regards to spirulina and the clinical trials, because spirulina is exceptionally high in iron, uh, there's been significant improvements in haemoglobin levels uh, in anemic individuals and also in elderly uh, populations. Um, spirulina, interestingly, has actually been reported to lower LDL cholesterol and triglycerides and also control Russian blood sugar in type 2 diabetics. Um, the main mechanism proposed behind this was that spirulina were, was actually to uh, significantly reduce a HbA1c, which is a, a biomarker for high blood sugar in diabetics. Um, and Perrick actually suggested that because uh, spirulina is high in linoleic acid, uh, this may uh, help, help uh, control our cholesterol and absorption of fats. Um, interestingly as well, spirulina has been shown to significantly <coughs> Uh, lower blood pressure. Um, the main mechanism behind this as well that spirulina is exceptionally high um, in arginine. Um, we know that arginine um, can potentially be uh, is broken down into nitric oxide, which can then start causing our vasodilatory properties. Um, so these um, clinical trials have sort of grabbed my attention and thinking, well, if we can uh, significant, if, if there's a high amount of arginine, can we uh, start seeing any differences in oxygen kinetics? Uh, and the same for hemoglobin counts as well, uh, so it increases our, our red blood cell count. Uh, with regards to chlorella in the clinical trials, uh, there's been a significant uh, reduction in atrial stiffness after the supplementation of three grams a day for four weeks. Uh, again, this was associated with chlorella having a high amount of our arginine, um, and also has a potassium, a large potassium content, which may help with the sodium excretion. Um, and therefore uh, reduce the muscle contractility uh, within the smooth muscle. Um, Chlorella has also been shown to um, modulate the insulin signaling pathway and prevent insulin resistance in mice. Um, and Chlorella also in the cardiovascular risk factors, there was a meta-analysis done in 2017 uh, whereby it was uh, concluded uh, that Chlorella can significantly improve our fast blood glucose uh, reduce our cholesterol, blood pressure, and also potentially reduce our triglycerides as well. Um, now, with regards to the ergogenic A capabilities of these algae, spirulina has actually been shown to significantly increase our time to fatigue in, in running, and also uh, significantly decrease our uh, MDA concentration levels in runners. So MDA is a, is, a, is a marker for oxidative stress. Uh, Conversely, though, Franco in 2010 actually supplemented spirulina to 18 highly trained cyclists, uh, these guys and girls were cycling at around 500 kilometres a week, so at the peak of their high season, and found no significant difference in oxidative stress biomarkers or muscle damage. So perhaps suggesting that spirulina may not be quite as effective for elite athletes. Now, because of the high um, protein content, St. Luke Chinoy supplemented 2 grams a day uh, alongside an 8 week training pro programme, and found it to be a significant improvement. Um, with peak force and average force after the supplementation of spirulina in comparison to the placebo group. Um, in 2010, Calafty also uh, supplemented 
six round of screening this time across a four week period and found this to be a significant increase in time to exhaustion. Uh, participants were running at 70 to 75% of their VO2 max for two hours uh, and then were asked to do that uh, time to exhaustion time trial, hence why it probably only lasted around two to three minutes. Um, there was also a significant um, increase in GSH, so glutathione, um, which we know is a, a free vegetable uh, scavenger, uh, so potentially protecting ourselves from oxidative stress when we exercise. Um, this was a study completed a couple months ago by myself. Um, a lot of the research had looked at lower body exercise bouts, um, and I wanted to look at upper body exercise. Uh, so I had uh, a total of 12 participants come in uh, and do, I did a shorter supplementation period as well, it was a one week period. Um, participants were taking six rounds a day in a double blind randomized crossover design. There was asked to come in, uh, do a 30 minute uh, sub-maximal exercise bout of 55% of their VO2 max, uh, and then were asked to do um, a VO2 max test. Uh, participants were also measured, uh, we also measured their hemoglobin levels um, across each condition after supplementation. Um, and I found this to be a significant reduction in total oxygen consumption. Uh, and also in the post hoc analysis, I found there to be a uh, significant difference in these time points here, so from about a 10 minute mark. Interestingly to note as well, in heart rate over the, the sub maximum exercise test, uh, we sort of saw a leveling off in the spirulina uh, group, uh, whereas after the placebo, we started seeing a significant increase in heart rate over time. Um, I found significant increases in hemoglobin despite uh, the athletes being uh, within the normal ranges of hemoglobin. <coughs> Um, and this increase uh, also argumented potentially the, the significant increase of in maximum oxygen consumption uh, as well after the exercise bout. So there's about an 8% increase in maximum oxygen consumption there. Uh, so with regards to the ergogenic gain capabilities of chlorella, uh, there's only really been a handful of studies um, in human participants. Uh, one of them has looked at, uh, these are the same authors that found a uh, significant reduction in atrial stiffness and found there to be significant improvement in peak oxygen uptake as well after six grams of supplementation for four weeks. So again, quite a long time of uh, supplementation. Uh, these authors, again, attributed their findings to the increased circulating in our arginine and therefore potential increase in release of nitric oxide within the blood. Um, this study was actually later developed a few years later whereby the nutritional status was measured um, from 34 uh, males prior to the supplementation of Corella. And they actually found that these participants were actually deficient uh, in iron, vitamin B2, D, K, and niacin. Um, and they found that actually after the supplementation of Corella, uh, there was a 20% increased sufficiency rate of these uh, vitamins and minerals. Uh, so these authors actually mainly attributed their findings uh, to that significant increase in the nut nutritional status of their participants. Um, a study done by Hori et al in 2017 looked at uh, rat swimming time uh, and supplemented chlorella alongside uh, just a HIIT uh, or high intensity exercise training program and as well as supplementing it alongside chlorella. Um, the author, interestingly, just from supplementing chlorella found there to be a significant increase in PGC1A in the gastrocnemius and also an increase in uh, MCT1 as well. Uh, MCT1 is a monocarboxylate transporter which sits across the bio lipid bilayer and facilitates the lactate removal. So this really sort of grabbed my attention and thought, if we can facilitate some lactate removal out from our working muscles, uh, will this work in um, human participants? So currently, uh, I'm coming towards the end of my data collection for the, uh, for these two studies where I've looked at supplementing spirulina and chlorella <coughs> alongside a placebo uh, uh, for six grams a day for three week periods. Uh, I've been measuring um, submaximal um, oxygen kinetics. I've been looking at lactate flux during the submaximal exercise bouts. Uh, I've also been comparing sprint uh, bouts, so uh, time trials um, and our uh, wing gate tests as well. So just a brief overview of the potential for algae's potential ergogenic air capabilities. Uh, so spirulina has been shown to significantly increase, increase hemoglobin counts. Uh, I've shown that there can be a reduced oxygen cost to uh, arm crank accelerometry. Uh, and this can also help uh, with our oxidative stress, uh, increase VO2 max scores as well, and increase our time to fatigue and running. Uh, and because of its uh, protein content, we have seen some aid uh, in muscular training adaptations. Uh, and chlorella, we've, we've seen improved nature of stiffness, increase in peak muscle op uh, oxygen uptake, uh, and a potential increase in lactic clearance in rats, uh, and also some anaphylaxis capabilities. Thank you very much. 
Oh, sorry, just a quick summary. Um, typical dosage as well is around three to seven grams a day, uh, around three to six weeks, although I have shown there to be a significant improvement after a one-week supplementation. Uh, at the moment as well, there's not really uh, a known optimal dosage, uh, and the same for an optimal sport, um, and there are no known side effects currently at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you everyone for holding on. Uh, I feel like the pressure's on now to make it worth your while. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about breakfast and mainly the, the role of breakfast exercise interactions on metabolic health and energy balance. And um, there's a load of avenues you could explore. Um, Lewis James has done some great work in terms of exercise performance and the role of breakfast there. So I'd encourage you to go and have a look at that work. I won't be discussing much of that today. I'll be focusing on, on metabolic health. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the funders of our work and uh, the data I'll be presenting today I've highlighted uh, in pink there um, and of note of course the Physiological Society for supporting this meeting as well. Um, I also think when I'm talking about these kinds of areas I should um, highlight some relevant personal biases as well. Um, I do love breakfast and I love exercise as well. Um, so the main things I'll aim to cover are firstly a bit of a general overview as to the the health benefits of regular exercise, because the idea is by optimally timing breakfast in and around our exercise sessions, we might be able to gain further benefits from exercise. I'll then dis discuss some of the acute responses to exercise in the fasted versus the fed state to set the scene, and then probably more importantly, finish with those chronic adaptations to performing exercise before compared to after breakfast. So just to set the scene, one of the the slides that I include in most of my presentations is this one, um, and it highlights the, the role of carbohydrate and fat stores in the body. And I think this is crucial to understanding both energy balance, but also metabolic health. So if we start with our fat stores, we store most of our fat in adipose tissue. So down at the bottom there, about 12 kilos of fat, even in an athlete with a, a relatively low percentage body fat, they could easily store 12 kilos of fat in adipose tissue. They'll have a small amount of fat circulating in their blood, and then they'll have an intramuscular triglyceride store as well. And if we compare that to our carbohydrate stores, we, more, we store most of our carbohydrate in muscle as glycogen, and the amount we store there will, will vary depending on our training status and also our dietary carbohydrate intake. We'll have a small amount of carbohydrate circulating in our blood, and I mustn't forget the important store of carbohydrate in the liver. So Claude Bernard wouldn't forgive me if I didn't mention that, He's uh, one of my heroes for having uh, or being thought of as of discovering glycogen in the liver. He's probably a hero in, in other ways as well, in that the way he funded his research was quite remarkable. So I feel like I spend most of my time unsuccessfully applying for funding. He had a bit of a bright idea. He married a lady from a rich family who funded his research. That is until she came home one day to find he'd performed vivisection on the family dog. So she then divorced him and spent the rest of her life campaigning against the dissection. So quite a, a remarkable story. Um, but if we add up those energy stores, um, we can quantify them and, co and compare those carbohydrates to our fat stores. So on the right hand side here, the black bars represent what is hypothesized to be the lower limit of these stores. And I'm presenting liver glycogen, muscle glycogen, then, then the adipose triglyceride as the fat stores there. So focusing first on liver and muscle glycogen, we can see we can deplete them to very low levels and then the maximum storage capacity isn't very high. So in muscle we can store a bit more than liver, but the ma maximum amount there is less than 3,000 <coughs> kilocalories of energy. And that isn't um, as much as the lower limit of our adipose tissue stores. I'm gonna have to change the y-axis now. The lower limit after months and months of starvation 
is still around uh, 24,000 kilocalories for our, our fat stores. And the total fat storage capacity is at least theoretically limitless. Um, there are some people with severe obesity who could have uh, 730,000 kilocalories of, of energy stored in fat. So clearly our ability to store energy as fat greatly exceeds our ability to store energy as carbohydrate. And that has a number of potential implications. One of those is potentially involved in energy balance. So it's been hypothesized since at least the 1980s that maybe because we can't store carbohydrate as well as we can store fat, maybe that's a more tightly regulated store. And so if we disrupt that store, it might affect our energy balance behaviors to try and regulate it more so than if we disrupt our fat stores. The other thing is that because we can't store um, as much energy as glycogen, then if we overconsume carbohydrate day in, day out, and we don't, we've exceeded our capacity to oxidize and store it, then eventually we'll convert it into lipid via de novo lipogenesis and store it as fat. So ultimately, if we overconsume any macronutrient in the long term, we'll end up storing it as fat. Now, why do we care about obesity and, and these metabolic aspects of health? Well, it all relates to insulin resistance, cardiovascular disease, and, and type 2 diabetes. And um, it's thought that either hyperinsulinemia and or insulin resistance are the key drivers of both cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. They may display a reciprocal relationship. So if we induce hyperinsulinemia, that can induce insulin resistance. And, and when we become insulin resistant, we require more insulin for the same effects on glucose control, so we develop hyperinsulinemia as well. So we seem to get an ambitious cycle that leads to metabolic diseases. So what we're trying to do with exercise and nutrition is to either reduce the insulin response to a given meal and or improve insulin sensitivity to hopefully reduce cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. And it's well known that exercise improves insulin sensitivity and reduces postprandial insulinemia. It does this via affecting multiple organs throughout the body. I'll be focusing mainly on skeletal muscle because we think that's a, a major site of, of regulation here. So if we think about someone who, who perhaps doesn't do any, much endurance training, they're relatively sedentary, this is what their muscle might look like. Um, it's relatively depleted in, in some aspects. When they eat a meal, they're going to get, at least containing carbohydrate, they're going to get a glucose response and, a, and an insulin response. And in order to clear that glucose out of the circulation, um, the insulin is going to bind to a receptor on the cell membrane and induce a, a cascade of signaling events that ultimately leads to the translocation of this important transport protein. So GLUT4 will translocate to the cell membrane and allow glucose to enter the muscle cell and clear it from the blood. The good thing about exercises is, is we can activate a separate pathway, the AMPK pathway, um, that also translocates GLUT4 to the cell membrane. AMPK can also stimulate the production of new mitochondria that, that is another key um, endurance training adaptation. Things that stimulate AMPK um, activity are thought to include both fatty acid availability and also glycogen availability. So glycogen um, inhibits AMPK activity, whereas if you increase fatty acid availability, that can increase AMPK. So if we then look at um, an endurance trained muscle, we see a number of changes here. One of those is we have a greater pool of GLUT4 to be able to recruit from. We have um, more lipid droplets, as we heard earlier on, there's this intriguing athlete paradox where, whereby they're more insulin sensitive, but they actually have more lipids stored within their, their muscle. We also have more mitochondria and more glycogen as well. The other interesting aspect that will become clear as to why I'm bringing it up later on is that the phospholipid membrane around the, the muscle cell can also change in its composition with exercise. So using single leg models, if you, if you exercise train, then you tend to have fewer saturated fats in that phospholipid membrane. And that might also be involved in insulin sensitivity because it's thought that saturated fatty acids produce a more rigid membrane, which might make it more difficult for GLUT4 to perform that action. So if we have fewer saturated fatty acids in that membrane, it could lead to improved insulin sensitivity. So that's the general background, and it seems that carbohydrates are a limited 
energy store, and that has potential implications for metabolic health and energy balance. Insulin resistance and, and hyperinsulinemia are associated with metabolic disease, but fortunately regular exercise has the potential to improve both of these aspects, and in a large part due to adaptation within skeletal muscle. So that leads us on to understand what happens with the acute responses to exercise. <coughs> so this is a study conducted by uh, my, well, my former PhD student who's recently graduated, Rob Edinburgh. And uh, we got a group of young, healthy men into the lab on three different occasions. One was a resting control trial. A second trial, they consumed breakfast but remained at rest. And then on the third trial, they consumed breakfast and they performed a bout of exercise two hours later. We've heard about some amino acid traces earlier on. We tend to use glucose traces. So we had a prime constant infusion of a, a labeled glucose so we can understand what's going on with endogenous glucose production or the liver's um, production of glucose. And after the exercise, um, the participants drank this glucose uh, drink that also contained a different labeled glucose so we can trace the exogenous appearance of glucose into the circulation as well. Uh, we took Douglas bags throughout to uh, measure whole body substrate oxidation, regular blood samples, and muscle biopsies to understand uh, some of the insulin signaling. We were also interested in energy balance. So um, during the lab, at the end of the trial day, the participants were provided with a lunch that the researchers measured as to how much was consumed. And then for the remainder of the 24 hours when they left the lab, we provided them with food packages more than they would be expected to consume, that they brought back the next day any leftovers. And they also wore an, an active heart that measures accelerometry and heart rate um, to determine free living energy expenditure. So this is what it looks like in practice. We've got our happy participant. I promise they are happy underneath that black box. Um, we've got the prime constant infusion. Um, they drink the uh, carbon-13 glucose, blood sampling from a heated hand vein, and uh, the muscle biopsy there. So what we found in terms of the metabolic responses to, to exercise are that, are that breakfast does impact on the metabolic responses during that exercise bout. So starting on the left-hand side, we've got the breakfast rest condition. So if you like our control condition, uh, where we're mainly oxidizing a mixture of fat, blood glucose, which includes hepatic glucose, but also um, the glucose from the breakfast and uh, some protein oxidation as well. If we do some exercise, we're going to increase uh, fat oxidation slightly um, and increase uh, our total energy expenditure quite drastically. But the key comparison here is the breakfast exercise and the fasted exercise bout. We can see that if you omit breakfast prior to that exercise bout, we get a substantial increase in the contribution of fat to energy expenditure. We get a decrease in carbohydrate oxidation, and those things are, are relatively well known. I think what's quite interesting is that the contribution of carbohydrate is decreased from both muscle glycogen use and also blood glucose oxidation as well. So clearly breakfast uh, timing in and around exercise has a pretty profound effect on the metabolic responses. It also seems to impact upon energy balance. Um, primarily, this is, bearing in mind, this is the omission of breakfast rather than changing <coughs> timing. So on the left-hand side, we've got um, energy intake. This is 24-hour energy intake. Bearing in mind the black there is the prescribed energy intake. Then at lunch, they were allowed to, to choose how much they ate, and the same with the free living condition. So um, focusing again on the breakfast exercise and the fasted exercise condition, the participants displayed some compensation with their energy intake at lunch for having omitted breakfast. So they're consuming slightly more at lunch on this trial, but it's not enough to fully offset having this breakfast. And then that persists over the remainder of the day, so they still haven't caught up with that breakfast exercise trial, so their total 24-hour energy intake is, is still slightly less. And that's consistent with quite a few other studies. If you omit breakfast, it seems to result in a lower 24-hour uh, energy intake. If you look at energy expenditure, We've got the prescribed energy expenditure within the lab, and then free living energy expenditure, showing no compensatory differences there. And therefore, the most negative energy balance under these conditions was in the fasted exercise trial. I don't know how the Daily Mail then came up with that headline, but um, it seems to see it seems to be that they'll they'll write what they want to write. If 
we look at substrate balances, thinking back to that, um, that slide I first started with, um, we've got, again, the same order of trials, breakfast rest in a big positive energy balance, um, then a less positive energy balance in the breakfast exercise trial, and the least positive energy balance in the fasted exercise trial. But what's interesting, I think, is that this difference in, in energy balance between these two conditions is almost entirely driven by a difference in fat balance. So in the fasted exercise condition, we're now in a negative fat balance, whereas the carbohydrate balance there is actually remarkably similar. So that's at least consistent with this idea that maybe carbohydrate stores are, are regulated more so than, than fat stores. It's not complete confirmation, but it's at least consistent with that. And other data might, might support that as well. So this is a study from Mark Hopkins in Leeds, and um, they got a group of women to do a single bout of exercise, and they looked at whether though, what were the predictors of people who were going to compensate with energy intake after exercise. So essentially each one of these bars is a single individual, and the people on the left-hand side here are people who ate less after their exercise trial compared to a resting control trial. And people on the right over here are people who ate more following their exercise trial compared to a control trial. So the people on the right there would be called compensators and the people on the left wouldn't be. And they looked at the predictors of this and one of the, the strongest predictors was carbohydrate oxidation during exercise predicted subsequent energy intake. So people who were burning through those carbohydrate stores were more likely to compensate with a, a higher energy intake. So based on our data, we were interested in exploring this a little bit further. This is just telling us about whole body carbohydrate oxidation. It doesn't tell us about whether a specific carbohydrate store is, is regulating that. Um, some animal data that, that we came across as well seemed to support this idea of a, a glycogen regulator of energy balance as well. Um, here what they did is they took a, a group of control mice, so they're wild type mice, they're the white bars, and um, they've got a group of um, mice who had hepatic protein targeted to glycogen um, overexpressed. So all you need to know about that is that the, the mice in the black bars there have double the liver glycogen content over, uh, under both fasted and fed conditions. And what you can see is the mice that have more glycogen choose to eat less food compared to the wild type mice. And if you hepatically vagotomize them, so essentially you cut the nerve that links the liver to the brain, then you abolish that response. You see a similar thing with energy expenditure in the opposite direction. So the mice who have the higher liver glycogen content <coughs> show a higher energy expenditure. And if you vagotomize them, you abolish that response. So it's thought that perhaps liver glycogen content is signaling to the brain to influence energy balance behaviours, at least in rodents. So given that we had the stable isotope traces employed in the last study and some measures of energy balance, we explored some of the, the relationships there. And it seemed that the rate of glu the plasma glucose disappearance rate during the fasted exercise trial, which would essentially represent hepatic glycogen use, that positively correlated with energy intake compensation, so the difference in energy intake between their exercise trial and their rest trial. We tried to normalize this to, to resting metabolic rate there to get to normalize for body size. It actually persists whether you present it in absolute units or, or normalized as well. So again, this is consistent with this idea that maybe our liver glycogen stores are, um, are signaling to our brain and, and altering energy balance behavior. So we were then looking to explore the longer term effects of, of exercise training. Um, our own studies were, were in lean individuals, those first ones, um, and most of the other studies in the literature were also on, on people who are lean. So there's a number of studies here um, showing some potentially beneficial effects of performing exercise training in a, a fasted state. Not only were they in lean individuals, but they were also employing quite a... Um, a challenging study design where it was 90 minutes of exercise five days a week with carbohydrate ingestion before and during exercise and if we're looking to translate these kinds of ideas to improve metabolic health then we probably need to move towards more realistic designs so perhaps three days a week of training and not consuming carbohydrates before and during exercise just looking at breakfast prior to exercise so we collaborated with Gareth Wallace at, at Birmingham to um, do a study in men classified as overweight and obese. 
And we looked at the acute and chronic responses to exercise performed before versus after breakfast. So bear in mind, this is slightly different to that last study I showed you. This isn't the omission of breakfast. They are prescribed the breakfast, but they either have it before their exercise session or they have it afterwards. And the first thing we, we looked at was intramuscular triglyceride utilization. So if this number is negative, then it suggests they're utilizing their intramuscular lipid stores in a net sense. And if it's positive, they're, they're not. And if they have their breakfast before exercise, there was no net utilization of intramuscular lipids in either their type 1 fibers or their type 2 muscle fibers. Whereas if they perform their exercise after breakfast, there was net utilization of intramuscular lipids. If you look at the glycogen concentrations, these are presented before and after the exercise bout. We see no differences between the con two conditions there. So um, when the breakfast is consumed before exercise, they might start with higher glycogen before the exercise, but they utilize it more quickly. And so by the end of the trial, they end up with similar muscle glycogen concentrations. If you look at adipose tissue responses to people who are overweight and obese, um, then we see a, a drastic difference there if we uh, eat breakfast prior to exercise as well. And you might be thinking, well, I focus mainly on muscle, but adipose tissue is also an important uh, regulator of metabolic health. It's known from, from some rodent studies. If you do exercise training and you take the adipose tissue from exercise trained mice and you transplant it onto control mice, it improves the health of those control mice. So our adipose tissue is clearly talking to other organs. Um, to improve whole body metabolic health. And what we see is that if we consume breakfast before a single bout of exercise, then we attenuate a lot of the gene expression responses to exercise in adipose tissue. And the bold ones there are the ones that show a, a feeding, a differential response to feeding prior to exercise. So they're mainly involved in lipid turnover, um, glucose transport, and, and insulin signaling. So we don't know what would happen with the long term in terms of adipose tissue, but this suggests that maybe breakfast before exercise would blunt adipose tissue adaptation to exercise. So there are the acute responses, and uh, Gareth Wallace and I wrote this review um, a year or so ago um, to try and understand the status of the literature back then. And it became clear that we were accumulating quite a lot of evidence for the acute responses to fasting, feeding, and exercise. But there was very little known about the chronic adaptation to this form of, of exercise. So I'll just finish by um, going on to the chronic training study to try and unpick that question. Before I do, just to, to summarise that last section, clearly breakfast before a single bout of exercise suppresses whole body and intramuscular lipid utilisation. Breakfast before this single bout of exercise even suppresses adipose tissue gene expression, so it's not just our muscle that it's affecting. But whilst we know quite a lot now about the short-term responses to this exercise, we know very little about the longer-term responses, and especially in people who are, who are overweight and obese who could potentially benefit the most. So that led us to design this study, which is the final one I'll, I'll discuss today, uh, where we recruited 30 men classified as overweight and obese. Um, we're really keen to do a study in women next, but we thought for the very first study to keep a homogeneous group, we'd, we'd recruit men first of all and see if there's anything going on there. Um, we randomised them to three groups. So our first group is our control group. They don't do any exercise training. They have this tasty breakfast of 1.3 grams per kilo body mass of maltodextrin. And the reason we gave it in that form, as, as Lewis mentioned in, in one of the first talks of the day, that we wanted to blind the study. Okay, so they have a a liquid breakfast to drink, and then later on they have a calorie-free uh, placebo. We've then got the first exercise group, our breakfast exercise group. They have this maltodextrin drink as well. Two hours later they perform a fully supervised exercise training session, and then they have their calorie-free placebo after exercise. And then we've got our fasted exercise group who have the calorie-free placebo before exercise and the maltodextrin afterwards. So remember that the groups are matched for the exercise they do, and they're matched also for the prescribed carbohydrate intake. The only difference is the timing in which they have that carbohydrate before or after <coughs> exercise. Before and after the intervention, uh, we took some muscle biopsies in the fasted states, and they, they were taken at least 24 hours after the last training session to try and 
uh, mitigate the effects of the, the last exercise bout and understand cr true chronic adaptation. And because uh, all glucose tolerance tests were our, our primary outcome measure, they were done at least 48 hours after the last training session to ensure it was a chronic adaptive response. When we were designing the study, I thought it would be pretty cool to try and understand the substrate utilisation throughout that six-week uh, training period. And uh, Rob was clearly pretty naive at the time because he said, yes, I, I can do that. And uh, he did it using the Douglas Bag method. And so that means that over the full six weeks, every 10 minutes of every single training session, Rob was taking a Douglas Bag and measuring it, which equated to 1,850 Douglas Bags over the six weeks. So if you need someone to analyse a bag for you, get in touch with Rob. But all that effort did, did culminate in some pretty cool data. So each of these data points is a, a training session. So um, we increased the duration, as you can see, 30-minute sessions in the first week, building up to 50-minute sessions, and also the intensity too, but matched between the two groups over that six-week period. And you can see that at the start, they've got about double the amount of fat oxidised per session compared to the... Um, sorry, the, the group who exercised before they drank their carbohydrate drink had double the amount of fat oxidation com compared to those who had their, their drink before exercise. And that difference persists all the way throughout the full six weeks. Okay? So those lines are pretty much parallel. If we look at total <coughs> energy expenditure, as we might expect, we've prescribed that exercise intensity to be the same between the two groups. There's no difference uh, between those two groups. So, there's a, a clear shift in substrate oxidation that persists throughout the full six weeks, um, and total energy expenditure is matched. Our primary outcome was um, glucose and insulin responses to um, an oral glucose tolerance test. We saw no difference in the glucose response, but we did see a reduction in the insulin response to the oral glucose tolerance test in the group who performed exercise before they ingested that carbohydrate drink. So all of the figures from now on will go control group on the left, um, <coughs> breakfast exercise or carbohydrate exercise in the middle and then exercise carbohydrate in terms of the order they have those. So it's reducing the insulin response to an oral glucose tolerance test. That suggests that they're becoming more insulin sensitive. And remarkably, it seems that consuming that carbohydrate bolus before every exercise session seems to completely obliterate that improvement in insulin sensitivity. That's all the more remarkable, given that we saw no differences between the breakfast exercise timing groups in terms of their body composition. So we can see their body mass changes on the left, but probably more importantly, their waist-to-hip ratio. So exercise seems to improve their body composition, but no difference as to whether you have breakfast before or after exercise. And we saw no differences between those breakfast exercise groups in terms of their VO2 max or this marker of mitochondrial content either. So it seems that this improvement in insulin sensitivity was independent from changes in body composition and also independent in, of changes in, in oxidative capacity, which I think is pretty interesting. So what was driving this difference in insulin sensitivity? Well, I think it was probably due, due to some other adaptations within skeletal muscle. So only the group who, who performed exercise in the fasted state showed these robust increases in AMPK content and also GLUT4 content. Maybe that's driving the improvement in insulin sensitivity. We were left with a small bit of muscle left over and I didn't want it go, to go to waste. So um, we got the samples analysed for the, the phospholipid composition of the, that muscle. And um, because it were, this was an exploratory outcome, um, we haven't got quite as many data points, so just, just have that as a caveat in the back of your mind. And this is something I'd like to explore further in the future. But we did at least see that those who reduced the proportion of saturated fats within those phospholipids seem to improve their insulin sensitivity the most in response to that exercise training. So that's consistent with that idea that maybe more unsaturated fatty acids in the phospholipids make for a, a more insulin sensitive muscle. So I won't hold you up from the pub any longer. Um, in terms of take home messages, it's, um, I'd argue that exercise training studies should probably account for nutrient exercise timing because this clearly is important as, as an outcome measure. So it might account for some of the variability that we sometimes see in exercise training studies. But those people who are perhaps performing it in a fasted state are showing greater improvements than those performing it in a fed state. If we're looking to optimize 
the metabolic health benefits of exercise, then performing at least some sessions bef before rather than after breakfast may be desirable. Um, but we do need to increase the generalizability of these findings. Um, we need to translate them over longer time frames and also in, in other populations, of course, as, too, as well. I should also note that this, seat, this is an exciting area. I'm still excited about it, but it's also perhaps not new. If we think back to one of the, the forefathers of physiology, of exercise physiology, A.B. Hill, one of the few Nobel Prize winners in exercise physiology, if you look back to one of his papers, he was actually also a, a subject in, in a lot of his studies, and he was also a keen runner. You can see there um, our most usual subject, H, um, it, his general training owing to a daily slow run of about one mile before breakfast. So maybe A.B. Hill knew something that we're only really discovering the mechanisms of behind now. And that just leaves me to thank uh, everyone who, who does the work in the lab and collaborators around the UK and uh, Europe. And thank you for your attention. basal protein content, yes, yeah, yeah. And did you look at the beta isoform as well? Uh, we didn't, unfortunately, no. Um, right, what you said inhibits Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm just, I'm wondering whether you're actually not looking at an improvement in insulin sensitivity per se, because AMPK, if you've got an increase in AMPK, then you're going to have that, if you're not in that knock-on effect, yeah, that's true. going to inhibit uh, AKT, so you, yeah. you're not looking at insulin sensitivity. And I think that's a problem with the way we measure insulin sensitivity. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's a question there, but I think. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't understand that part. I would have thought the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Ye
So what the, the data aren't there, but it's a reasonable assumption that um, the major driver here isn't anything to do with circadian rhythms. It's most likely due to just the fasting, or specifically the carbohydrate restriction period. Um, so as long as you've got about an eight-hour window, so you could theoretically have a carbohydrate-rich breakfast, skip lunch, or have perhaps a low-carbohydrate lunch, and then do some exercise before an evening meal. That should <laughs> elicit a very similar response.